It's my duty to please the booty. And Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Sha, ah, switch the call. Please, please, please never do that. Yep. So. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 490 of Spitting Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What is up, gang? Only a few more weeks left in the season. Lots of drama to come. We don't know who's playing who yet, but of course, we check in with the boys first. Let's go to the wit dog first, Ryan Whitney, the handsome one. Donald the Milton family man. What's oh, shaking the you, cu- Easter Bunny? Just the cutest little Instagram post there with the, with the boys playing hockey. I think it made its way to Twitter, man. This is, uh, you're killing us with cuteness on Easter. Well, you know, thank God that they didn't get my my looks, right? I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that they get maybe my height or my athletic ability. That remains to be seen. But the looks, I'm glad. I'm glad that skipped a couple boys in our family right I now. Think- we'll see the third. We'll see the third. I, would I, I say, mean, uh, I'm just like, oh, if we have a girl and the girl uh, looks like me and the boys oh, look like no. her, like that no. poor little girl. No, no. But, yeah, but um, we actually started uh, a nice little family tradition in terms of Easter morning. Uh, many people go to church. We go to the church of hockey now. We rent some ice. And, and so my wife, it's interesting. So she has uncles that are like her age. Her mom's the oldest of 10. So her younger brothers are, are, you know, my and Bree's age, basically. So it's her uncle, but basically a cousin, kind of long story, unnecessary. But all their kids are, you know, our kids' age. And a lot of them play hockey. It was a, it's a football family. Uh, Bree's cousin, X, he plays football at Harvard. He's a stud. Everyone's always played football. His dad played at Northeastern. And then the wit dog comes into the family, and all of a sudden, these, these are the rink rats everywhere. So it's been pretty cool to see all these kids love hockey and fall in love with it. So we started Rent and Ice last year, buzz around for two hours Easter morning. We did it again this year. And Wyatt, I mean, this kid, I've told, I've talked to you guys about him. He's Squanto, Squanto Rainwater. He's out of his mind. I've mentioned many times that he's beating up Ryder. He's three, Ryder's six. Like, I'm I'm snapping and Ryder, buddy, you can't let this kid beat you up. He's three years old, but he's got that fire in him. And, and he also didn't get that from me because I was the kid that was running away from fights. No, 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 Joe Pavelski, Tim Jackman, no. But it's, why like, it's like right Jordan Tutu defense. knocked up your old lady. <laughs> <laughs> just running around steamrolling guys, just chucking well, knuckles. It was funny. There was, it was, Jordan Tutu, there was a picture of the uh, four cousins all together on the ice. I think they're ranging probably from um, nine to five or ten to six. And uh, and Keith texted me and, they're, you know, they're darker. That's that's my wife. They're darker. And so Keith sent me the picture. He goes, this looks like the noon of it. Like, it looks like Tutu's team growing up, all these four kids. So it was a blast. But yeah, Ryder was in the mix with his cousin. And all of a sudden, I tweeted out the video randomly. Why it just, he's pushing one leg. He's got the left foot pushing. He's right into the scrum. And he threw his gloves down hard and heavy. Just coming in right hot. Coming in hot on Easter Sunday for a brawl. I asked him after. What were you doing? Why he said I had to help Ryder. So I love that. You know, as a Fuck dad, right. yeah. it's all about all I tell him is if he's in a fight, you're in a fight. If he's in a fight, you're in a fight. I just drill him with that. So it was great to see. Then we had an awesome day. The Easter egg hunt was a gong show. You know, I, I probably loaded up 150 Easter eggs. I was getting two pieces of candy in each one. It was an excellent holiday. And what a sports day. I mean, we're going to get oh. into the NCAA hockey. I finally won a couple college basketball bets. So I'm heating Ooh. up there. It was just a great weekend, guys. And and Biz, I heard oh, RA was in Chicago. Biz, I heard you were down with Keith in Florida. Oh yeah. It was just uh it was a lot of action around the Chicklets world. And so I was very excited to get together with you boys today and, and kind of mix it up or chop it up, as they say, um, right, Biz? I was gonna say earlier when you were talking about your kids' cuteness, I would say Ryder I didn't ha- I didn't talk about their cuteness. Well, how how you did. What do you mean? You said that they're both good I'm, looking. I'm not like, oh, my kids are cute. Like, oh, my kids oh. are so cute. I'm like, they look like my wife, thank God. Oh, I think you that, called them cute. So okay, that, I yeah. think that that's kind of what you were alluding he, to, that they got applied, her He looks. applied it, Biz. He definitely yeah. implied Jesus. it. Jesus, but, but, he, but he gave Bree the credit, so. Yeah. <laughs> I took the lawyer. I, I was going to well, say. Well, it's that, like if peop, the people who are like, my kids are so cute, like, shut up. So I guess, yes, I did imply <laughs> Actually, it, but I didn't say it in a way which so, was really, so really, really So desperately didn't want to be that guy that you had to call me out in my tracks there. 
<laughs> just coming in over the AP, uh, Wyatt was just canceled for uh, dropping his gloves and starting a fight uh, yeah, one day. Yeah, yeah uh, he's done. Nowadays. Jesus. I was going to oh, say I was canceled Ryder. for calling him Squanto Rainwater. <laughs> That's uh, right. <laughs> Cancel, cancel shit. Oh my God, here we go. <laughs> I was going to say, Ryder kind of has that cuteness of the kid from Sixth Sense, though. Like that child actor cuteness. I think you've mentioned oh. that before. And does now he look like him? In, in the Oscars. Well, oh, yeah, he does. Haley Joel Osment. Well, well, I'll tell you, many people say, oh, your kids are cute. It's like, yeah, a very cute kid can grow into be like an ugly adult. So it's like, yeah, they're cute now, but you know, you, you've seen some ugly ass kids grow, turn into Well, yeah, sus. the Sixth Sense guy. Ryan Malone was, <laughs> I'll tell, I told Bugsy, I said, you were ugly as shit. I saw a picture of you as 10 and look at him now. He's gorgeous. So you take them as they come. Yeah. But thank you, Biz. <laughs> yeah, tire pump. <laughs> big, big old tire pump. <laughs> How well, was Florida? Flor oh, boys, do I have a story for you. Uh, Florida was awesome, by the way. So I went to Florida to film episode two of Yandling Business. Uh, we actually got Matthew Kachuk, <laughs> and we, I'm not going to say what we did, but we had a blast. He's, su he's such a great guy and a great ambassador. The fact that they had games like sandwiched in between days, and he still came out and did it, it just speaks volumes to he him trying to grow the game and, and, and have a blast with us and be great for content. You guys know we love the content. So I uh, got to hang out with Yans and, and his crew down there. He's got the one realtor buddy, uh, Jason Beauty. So um, on Friday after we filmed this, we ended up going to this tapas place. It was awesome. Uh, as soon as you walk in, guy, long, curly hair, he's just jamming out on the guitar. So they had live music the entire night. And then he had like a sidekick lady who's like playing the maracas, just like a, a beautiful woman. So the whole time we're, we're just getting all this tapas to the table. The food's incredible. The music was banging all night. Like I was legit dancing in my seat. We were, we were laughing our dicks off. And um, finally, at one point after having so much fun, I'm like, I'm like, the people here must love this guy, the staff. Like they get these tunes all the time. And he's like, oh yeah, you mean he hate his guts. And, and like, you know, yeah, it's just like saying that stops you dead in his track. So we had a laugh about it and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. So we call over one of the servers and we're like, Hey, like, uh, you guys must love this guy. Right. And, and he's like, uh. and I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, Oh, you know, same songs over and over every night. Like, uh, so I, I'm like, fuck, like Yans was bang on about calling her, uh, you know, calling me, calling me at my comment out. So I'm like, fuck, I'm not giving up this easy. We call over another server. Like, hey, uh, you guys must love this guy. Hey, jamming every night with these awesome tunes. And she's like, no, no, it's brutal. Same. We, go, we basically go through the whole staff and they all hate this guy's guts. Although it was one of the fucking best dinners of jamming out I'd ever had. So I was supposed to have a girl come meet me for the dinner, but it got Chaka. bumped up. What's that? I said, Chaka. Well, okay, so I'd been talking with this girl, guys, for about six months, just kind of back and forth. Beautiful girl. I'll actually send you guys the Instagram so you can get a look. So didn't end up coming to dinner, but I was going to meet up with her later on. So we, you know, the dinner ends. We go to the speakeasy next door. Sure enough, this entire tapas experience, they had a cameraman there. So they're selling us the pictures of us enjoying our dinner. So finally, I'm like, hey, boys, I'm going to go meet up with that girl. And she sends me the location, Tin Roof. Now, I like going on these dates to quieter spots. I'm a little bit older. I feel like Tin Roof's a spot where like it's like do you hang out at the Tin Roof. G is that a place that you go? I love the Tin Roof. I believe we actually did a meet and greet at the Tin Roof in Fort Lauderdale. Biz, they're great on. bars, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's just a younger not the, crew. It's yeah, I want to go chat be. chat with a girl. Like she's so you want to you want to go just you know have a nice little conversation, That's learn it. her, get to know what she's all about. Yeah, like, you're not doing that. Put at her the on the. And I know. Just put I know. Her on the work bench. I know you're going to chirp me for this, but I actually enjoy the dialogue. Like that's. I know that you to do. Me I is, know you do. That, that to me is the turn. That's why so, I already read the Playboys too. It's all about the articles. Hey, yeah. <laughs> only. Hey, they did interview Jimmy Carter when he was a sitting president. I will say that. I would. I don't know how many people listening, but if if it's like a if it's a bimbo, it's just like it's an instant turnoff for me. Like I don't care how hot the looks. I'd rather a good conversation to get it going, and then if it proceeds from there, it pro proceeds from there. So I get the pin drop. I'm like, okay, I'll head over to the tin roof, and you know maybe we could bounce over to a different spot, or maybe even go out on the patio or whatever they got. So uh, I'm texting with her the whole time, like, hey, ten minutes away, see you soon. Okay, all good. So I um, I get inside. And I'm, I, I go take a piss quick and then I go look around for her and she's at the bar. So I walk up and as I walk up, I know she's like holding hands with a guy. So I'm like, oh, okay. Like, you know, maybe she 
It was, it was RA? <laughs> no. 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 She's too, young, too old for me. So I'm, I'm like, oh, I, I kind of cut them up. I was like, hey, how you doing? And I kind of see them. And it was like a very awkward exchange, obviously, because he's hand in hand with this other person. And I'm like, oh, like, am I disrupting something? And they kind of have like a, a, a whisper in each other's ear. And then he walks away. And then she's like, hey, how you doing? And like, it was like, oh, okay. I was like, I'm going to grab a water here. It's a little loud in here. Do you mind if we go outside? And obviously, because I don't drink, I always bring those cones with me. And I had a little bit of weed. So I was going to go roll one, have a conversation, a little quieter. So get my water. We walk over the table and I go, hey, like, just so you know, like, you don't owe me fuck all. Like, if, if, if that's your guy, like, no hard feelings. Like, I'll smoke this. We can have a quick conversation and then I'll fuck off. Like, I don't give a shit, right? So she's like, no, 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 it's all good. Like, so the guy walks over. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm such and such. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? I'm like, hey, not to be disrespectful here, but like, I don't know what's going on. Like, sh she shot me a text to come over here. Like, we'd been chatting for a little bit. Like, are you guys dating? And he's like, yeah, that's my girlfriend. So I'm like, oh, oh I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I said, I'm just going to kind of keep scooping this weed up into this cone. I'm going to light it up if you guys want some. And, <laughs> You know, I could, I could fuck off. So once again, there's a little bit of awkward conversation and all of a sudden they're kind of in back and forward in each other's ears a little bit. And then he walks off and I'm like, what, the, what's going on? Is this your boyfriend? And she's like, no. And I go, well, obviously that's an issue. If one person's saying it's my girlfriend <laughs> and the other was saying, no, it's not my boyfriend. Like what's up here? So I said, oh, this is fucking bizarre. Anyway, like, uh, trying to kind of, I'm like, are you sure? But trying to then move on and like just have a normal conversation if you can after that. I don't know how you come back from this. So start asking her. This hey, is what? so Florida. This is so Florida. So I'm like, what do you do? She's like, oh, I'm a, a, a psychologist. Like I work with people. I'm thinking, <laughs> oh my God, this is where our society's at. If this fucking person's help. So I finally sparked the joint. She takes a couple puffs. Uh, the Sean Paul song comes on. I thought Sean Paul was Canadian. So in the midst of the conversation, I'm like, oh, Sean Paul dossier. I'm like, do you know this guy was Canadian? I thought he was Canadian. Apparently he's Jamaican now. And she's like, no, he's not. And I look over to the table next to me and I'm like, hey, isn't Sean Paul Canadian? And they all agreed with me. So I thought I was right. And next thing you know, this guy's back over here. They're locked in hands and she's walking out the door. So what the hell? <laughs> Fucking so cut in, nasty. I thought so, you were gonna say you were her hall pass at the beginning of this. I thought, That's I, buddy. I, I don't know what her motive is. I thought this might have been like a. I'm thumping, and and this guy's in the corner of the room. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This, this could have went anywhere <laughs> at this point. And keep in mind, a lot of people are like, "Oh, why wouldn't you just have left?" I'm like, "Uh, because I'm on a podcast, so I'm ingesting every fucking second of this, being like, this is a goosebumps, choose your own ending right now." <laughs> so I am sitting there and I kind of just finish my J and I'm just, my wheels are spinning and I finish it. Uh, I kind of have a chuckle with the people next to me at the next table. Cause I think they were kind of wondering what the fuck was going on along with like, Oh, maybe Sean Paul's not Canadian. Uh, that's still up for de debate by the way. So I finish my water. I order my Uber. I walk outside. And once again, no hard feelings here. Well, the two start walking by me. They hadn't left. They must have went the other way. I don't know if they finished off another drink in the bar. And I'm just like, hey, great to meet you both. And then boom, in my Uber, gone home. So never, never heard from her in terms of what happened. No, nothing. So I'll, I'll, I'll read you what I wrote her. <laughs> and I got to send you who this is. Like, Shit. Good looking girl. So Keith sent me. <laughs> I mean, this one of the funniest pictures of you <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> that, that was, I mean, I mean, that was the next <laughs> night. I, I needed a rebound. I needed a rebound, Woody. I, I, I got a picture from Yans. Boys, Biz is making out Sucking with what face. looks like a beautiful Sucking young woman face. with a straight up, oh yeah, like pornographic ass. Oh, her ar arse was a joke. On. He's on the main Nicole. street. And then, and then the next, the next thing I get from Yance is a video of Biz showing the text he just gets from Rafford and says, you're an amazing kisser. Oh, you think I'm not? You think I'm not? You think the nose gets in the way of my tonsil that hockey? Are you grab, fucking crazy? Look like, how oh, flat this thing is. full grab there. Oh, oh, buddy. Her arse was a <laughs> I, joke. I was like, oh, I can't tweet out this picture, but I want to tweet out this picture, but I can't. I love her. So what did she respond when you ended up asking her what the hell just happened? 
No, I didn't send her that. I go, oh, this oh, is oh. so this is uh right after it happens and I'm in the Uber and my wheels are spinning. I'm like, I cannot wait to tell this story on the podcast. Like it's almost like you guys had planned this so I could come on and tell it. I go, no hard feelings, but I'm telling the story on the podcast. Amazing stuff. Smiley face. No response. If I planned upon you would have got laid, so dude, my my guess would be that. You were her hall pass, and then he couldn't handle it once you once that's you your, got there. So that's your theory. So I was I, I obviously told the story to Jeff right away. Like I went back to the hotel, and he was my first call, and and he was just perplexed, and he, he's like, "What what was her motive?" I've I've heard five different motives. Your hall pass motive was a new one to me. I'd never even considered that. I don't know, boys. That's that's all I got for the start of the pod. Other than uh, that's a DM it. I got for someone. <laughs> <laughs> and it was about the Ovi twig. Now, so I just sent that profile over. But hey, listen, I don't also want to be judged for the public makeout at this. It was like a dive bar called it FLs. It was a fuck, dude. Yeah. No, it's not no, much I mean, worse, well, so better. Well, I mean, all right. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm being self-aware right now. I shouldn't be sucking face in public. I, I was in Florida. Why? So I wanted to go full dirtbag mode, all right? You know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, Biz, I probably would have stuck around too. If I was a single man, I probably would have stuck around. I just too, sent so, you the dude. profile, Wit. She's, she's and, gorgeous. And, yeah, she's, she's a gorgeous. rocket. So I'm like, ah, uh, I'm, I'm, I was her cuck for the night. <laughs> Maybe that's probably what it was, man. I mean, if her boyfriend was dead, they were holding hands that, that close. So it was probably a cuck thing. I mean, anyway. I mean, he'll be on fucking Reddit. Ask me anything, Biz. Cuck. I got cucked by Biz. Uh, so here was the Ovi uh, DM I got because we talked about his twigs. Now I don't know how reliable this DM is, but it goes, hey. Hey, heard you guys talking about OV stick change on the pod today. So at the start of the year, CCM decided that nobody except Sid will use the old graphics on sticks. So Clayton Keller, uh, OV, Tage Thompson, Tarasenko, McKinnon, all those guys had to switch to a new graphic, which is bizarre. McKinnon switched to Bauer altogether. OV used at least one new stick every game for like the first six to 12 games. Then he was then has been back and forth with his CCMs. The company Pro ProStockHockeySticks.com. He probably works for this website. That's why he's sending me this. Has made sticks for him, and many other players in the past made sticks for Little Ovi, which is that's kind of bizarre. They came in and built him an exact replica of a CCM stick and just blacked out the graphics, and he scored with it and went on this run since he switched. So I, I, this is like I, some of you guys, they call it like stick porn. I, you could have gave me a fucking shovel. It wouldn't have mattered. But the slightest difference with some of these guys makes the biggest difference. Where I don't know if you were a stick whore and you were, oh, I don't know if the lie is different. Uh, the, the, the kick point's different. I, I, I never knew about lie. Kick point a little bit. I, I, my best year, I always had synergies from, from 18 till I was done playing. Besides the year that in the AHL you had to use CCM. But one game in the middle of that season, I was hounded to use a warrior, use a warrior by the rep. And I used a warrior and Sid gave me, dude, the biggest tap in empty netter. The goalie was in the corner and I put it through the crease and missed it. And I remember, I just remember being like, why did I even use this stick this game? And I, I, I like, I got rid of, like, maybe it was mental. Maybe it was. Do you think stinking. that was the end? The beginning of the end? Mm, the early beginning. But then I went back to the stick and had a good end of the year. So not really, but okay. sort of. But I, I, I just, I remember on the bench, I was just, why did you use the stick this game? I just kept asking myself over and over and over. So the kick points are legit. The lies some guys may have an issue with, but they can make the exact curve. It, it's all about like you mentally being comfortable with what you're holding. Half the time, it's it's um it's it's like being messed up in your own brain, overthinking it. it. It's like cold tubs. Like cold tubs, I think really really help me. No, but I, some think I think those are science mental. backed. Those are science backed. I know, but people still say like I think it's mental. And there's an argument. There's an argument. You think the cold tub here. crowds are frauds? No, I don't, because I'm part of the crowd. I feel way better, but I do wonder if it's mental or if it's actually science where I'm getting some more of a, what's the stuff that comes out of your body? Serotonin. Inflammation. Serotonin. No, no. Um, oh, I meant out of your oh, brain. Like, um, I thought that's what you meant. It's brain, too. Poop? It's not serotonin. Not adrenaline. Uh, no, no. P? Come on, business. Um, dopamine. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that, dopamine. so that was out, it comes out of your brain. 
I think dopamine comes out of your brain, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of dope me going on right now. What up, guys? Whit here. It's time to talk about New Amsterdam Zone, Pink Whitney, the pink lemonade-flavored vodka, the number one selling flavored vodka in the United States, and that's all thanks to you. And spring has sprung. I'm recording this on April's Fool's Day, April 1st, and with good, nice weather coming into the mix, that's where you want to have some outdoor drinks. Nothing's better than a Pink Whitney on the rocks. That's how I like it. Sitting outside on a beautiful spring day. Maybe you're watching the Frozen Four. Maybe you're watching the Basketball Final Four, NHL playoffs. All, all the best time of year in sports is right now. And Pink Whitney can help you enjoy the game, enjoy your favorite team. I know the Barstool boys at the Final Four in, in Phoenix are going to be crushing some Pink Whitney down there. We're going to have a nice little Pink Whitney meet and greet and get together at the Frozen Four in Minneapolis. Where we'll be ripping some shots before hopefully BU takes the entire thing down. But the biggest thing is to go to your local liquor store and maybe grab the new big bottle. I talk about the big bottle a lot, but it lasts a little bit longer. It's a house. You can't buy too many of them. They're hard to carry. They're that big. But... Go get involved with that. Go to your local bar, do a shot, get a get a mixed drink. It doesn't matter. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your love for Pink Whitney. So go on down and purchase one now and enjoy this beautiful time of year all across North America with your favorite flavored vodka, New Amsterdam's own Pink Whitney. Biz, I was in Chicago this weekend. Um, yeah, what were you doing there, R.A.? I was not little... getting uh, stood up on dates or having boyfriends intertwined. No, no, no dates yet. Not not in the dating phase yet. No, um, the the movie I was in, the late game, they were doing some promotional stuff out in Chicago. So we went to the Wolves game uh, Friday night. Uh, I had the honor of uh, dropping the, the ceremonial first puck. I know Wit had a uh, chirp me about the photo that they just chose to display. Wit, I do, I I assure you, I did hold the puck up before I dropped it, and when I. No, I know, puck. but why would you ever look down? It's just look at the camera and drop the puck. Well, it was yeah, your first time. Over, like you're yeah, picking first up time, the puck. and I guess I got into first the whole. Timer. I got into the whole dropping the, the puck for the face-off aspect. It was ceremonial, so that was really cool to do, and I, I got to do a lineup reading as well, uh, which was cool. They actually won the game, and uh, what's his name? Keith Kincaid was the goalie. You know, I think we followed each other on Twitter the last few years, and, you know, he had a little bit of a familiarity, and he happened to be standing right there, so I kind of gave him a little kick to his pads when I get, when I gave the read. Uh, and then I went back in the coach's room, at, at, you know, shooting the shoot with the coaches and they're like, Oh, money on the, they, they want, they want you to put money on the board. I was like, I was like, okay, I, I like obviously he'd never done it before. I'm like, well, what, you know, what's the usual? Someone's like, I don't, like, know, I don't 20, have 50. any. My ex wife's got it. <laughs> You're like, I'm going through a divorce. Here, yeah, buddy. My, uh, wife's got, <laughs> my ex wife's got a thousand on the board. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> me. Yeah. Me getting blacked out by the second period. No. So, uh, <laughs> I fucking, I just walked up and, you know, someone said 20, 50, whatever. And I, I goes, 500 bucks first goal and slapped it up there. And uh, everyone was like, whoa. And I was like, is that legal? I was like, well, fuck it is now. So uh, Grand Rapids scored the first two goals and Merle texted the group. He's like, oh, all right, you just saved 500 bucks. And I'm like, well, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, I didn't say like, I said first goal to the guys in the room. I didn't say first goal of the game. So I was like, well, I, I didn't look at it as like, once Grand Rapids scored, oh, good. I just saved the nickel. I was like, if. You know, if Chicago doesn't score, then okay, then then there's nothing to pay out. So, anyways, Max Comtois, former Anaheim Duck, he scored. You know, the first goal of the game for them, and then I was with Zach Bell, who's pals with him, and and I was like, dude, tell him like, you know, we'll meet him after the game. Well, you know, I'm not sniffing anybody here, so we met him after the game. I all right, what did you do? Pop a pimple or something? What's what's up no, with your I neck got a, over there? I got another toothache, <laughs> fucking issue, dude. I look, I look like fucking Vito Corleone. Look how the mouth's good, my boy. Biz, before you got on, I asked, <laughs> what's up brutal. with your teeth? He he said he he always brushed them too hard. That's oh, I brush my teeth hard. Brushed. Yeah. Oh, I brush my hard. teeth hard. Biz, you brush for like We're, 15 minutes, too. I brush my insane. teeth for about 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you're still a young buck, it, like, worst thing you could do is brush your teeth super hard. I always thought, oh, sorry, <laughs> getting fucking anger out of somebody. I always thought that was, dog. No, get the fucking shit out of it. Worst well, thing you yeah, do, you, you take probably have right the off. fucking same toothbrush you clean your toilet with, though. The bristles are probably yeah, down, scare the, the, down scare the, the cast cast a lot of those molars, wah, wah, wah. all right? What do you mean? Hey, uh, R.A. Oh, yeah. R.A., you're you're switching your toothbrush every month? Guys, you act like I'm a fucking Neanderthal who lives in the fucking cave. I mean, I'm, a, I mean, I'm somewhat of a that. A fucking but Neanderthal who lives in the fucking cave. I mean, like, I, you know, you don't think I, what do you think, it. I've had the same toothbrush for 15 fucking years? You're, you've mean, had the same underwear for 15 years. What's different? I have definitely have t-shirts older than Grinelli. I, I will definitely go up to that. <laughs> oh, no some of those that. boxers you wear with the holes in them? Come on. Yeah. No, all right. All right. Maybe, maybe I'm being maybe I'm being a little too judgmental. <laughs> all right. All right. So well, pump your tires, R.A. Oh, pump yeah. your tires a little bit. Chris Terry, 
captain of the Chicago Wolves, he said your lineup read was outstanding. He said he thought you might have been like gambling on the money on the board. Like where you thought you could win money. But I think he was just joking. But he said the lineup read was incredible. Oh, that's so. good. That's awesome. Thanks, Wade. I appreciate that because you never I, know how they how they go. You you wait all day and then you, it's over in two seconds. Kind of like oh, losing your virginity. What's up, Biz? I think there was a, one of my buddies who works for the league now. He used to work for the Coyotes where he put money on the board. And then after the game, he's like, hey, he's like, yeah, like, where do I collect? And he, they're like, collect. He's like, yeah, I put 500 on the board for a win. And then they're like, what? this ain't a fucking casino, buddy. We're going to go grab some <laughs> beers with that. Like, fork it over. So this got the highs and lows of, of a, oh, a, new, a new NHL intern for crying out loud. But, uh, I, well, it sounds like we all had a great weekend. Gee, you must have had a great weekend. You and uh, Fishy's video. They had numbies. Uh, you went to yeah, North, that was awesome. North Dakota. Probably the best one yet as far as the rink tours. Yeah, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I think a monkey could have done that tour and it would have got 200,000 views just because of how insane <laughs> those facilities are. I mean, you guys saw like the zero gravity beds, the high altitude rooms. They just have bunk beds off the off the locker room. It was insane. It was, uh, it was an awesome time. Unfortunately... They didn't get the W this weekend, so I don't want this narrative to be created that I curse teams. Yeah, right, There's Drake. No shut up, you Drake. Curse. In the fucking bed shut room. up, Drake. <laughs> Aaron, oh, if BC, Aaron Ward if BC is tweeting lost, me. I had my tweet written out about the Grinelli Mush. Had BC well, they're going to lose now because he's got the track seat on. <laughs> BC ain't losing. I'll tell you that. It's much. such oh, a it's such a little cut move that Billy. you're a BC fan. Like Jesus. knowing me that we do the pod together. Uh, Jay Pandolfo helped you out in Burlington, and and I just hate you so much that you're like this BC fan BC out of the clouds too. I know. And one of my best friends went and played at BU. Yeah. Like so why D- are you this BC fan for no reason? Well, BC was very warm and welcoming to me this They're season for the Chicklets U video. Before think- anyone else signed on, BC was like, hey, we'll do it and we'll give you the fourth overall pick, the highest draft pick in school history. They welcomed me with open arms. They fed me. They, I mean, I, they gave Gee, me this for you were free. Projecting, you were projecting when you chirped me about the global ambassador, about, oh, how much they paying you. How much are these fucking schools paying you? <laughs> I want to know. What ki- what type of duffel bag money? That's a money? good bag. Yeah, what type of duffel? Now right you're there, on your base. heels. Look at you. You're they, pre- no, fucking no, they pay me. They pay me in good times. I'll tell you that. Penn State oh, paid yeah. me in a few nights at Champs. They brought me to a frat. But yeah, uh, yeah Jesus I probably still get some money from these. From Jesus these Shuttlesworth over here. He's got titties in his face at the frat house. Just kidding, Alana. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, insane weekend in college hockey. I mean. BCBU national championship still on the table. Uh, we're actually going to be in Minnesota for the uh, Frozen Four. Game Notes, Wit, myself, we'll be there. Uh, Biz, are you going to come? You you mentioned that you were thinking of coming. Boys, I, well, I'm supposed to just be hanging out in Atlanta because I'm not flying back out here. I'm basically going to be out east for the next two months other than uh, FDNY, NYPD when I fly to New York. But uh, I just, rather than sitting around Atlanta, you guys got me in this NCAA bug. I want. Love I'm it. all in. I'm ready to sit. Do you down. have a Sunday game that? Uh, do you have a Sunday game? Yeah, that, that I would, week. I would fly. I would fly back Sunday morning, and I would come oh, in okay. for the Thursday yeah, game. I didn't know you were allowed to do that, buddy. We'd love to have you. Now, here's the whole thing, and we should just get into the NCAA. Let's do it. And guys, we're gonna have tons of NHL discussion. I know we've been long winded at the in show here, but it was nice to, for everyone to catch up. We're getting into NHL discussion. There's plenty to talk about, but I think that NCAA hockey took over the show this weekend from Thursday to Sunday night. There was one bad game, one bad game. And, and even the ones with higher scores, like they were close for a lot of the time. The thought of BC and BU in the national title. I don't know if I can even watch that. Like granted, they've, they've ran our show this season. So that's part of it, but it's just uh, my, my arsehole will be this tight if they somehow play each other, but Denver and Michigan are going to have a lot to say about it. I just, I was not shocked, but so impressed at the hockey that was played. The broadcast by ESPN was phenomenal. Everyone did a great job. We can get into the discussion about the, the, the regionals and where they should be. I was, I, I took a lot of, um, conversations with people and, and and digested them all in terms of people who don't want the regionals to be at the number one seed spot. I understand their point, but I still am in the camp of Grinelli of get the number one seeds to host. But that hockey man and some of those players and the fact that Denver, BC, Michigan, BU, there's about 
15 guys, I think, who could be star NHL players in the first. Have you ever seen this before, Wit? I I was trying to think back, and I was texting a few people. I don't know if there's been a Frozen Four that one featured the four blue buds like this that just has so much NHL talent just ready to go. I love that Goche kid. The fact that he told the Flyers to fuck off and he's doing what he's doing on the ice, like that that gets me going. That's like That just reminded me. I listened to your Pardon My Take episode. You told the story then. You haven't even told it on Chicklets. What? About his old man calling you. Yeah, his old man called me. Yeah, great guy. I had a nice conversation <laughs> with him. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't agree with some of the things that he was saying, but it was a great call. I'd love to have him on the pod. We got to get this Cutter Goche kid on when he fucking reaches the show or when, it, or maybe when he wins the national championship. He's fucking that kid filthy. Can play. You, in order to pull a stunt like that and have the fucking balls to just go out there and do what he's doing, buddy, you <laughs> That is just he's got he's got I, the I, juice. I, I still think Ryan Leonard on BC. Oh, I, I somebody oh. texted me. I wish I remembered who it was. It was in a group chat. He's kind of Matthew Kachuk, Colby maybe Armstrong, even a little Army said maybe it. Army, maybe even a little bit of a better skater. Better skater, yeah. This guy, Capitals fans, for anyone that's a fan of the Washington Capitals that hasn't seen him, hasn't heard much, you don't have no idea what you're gonna get. He's a lunatic. He does a little bit of flopping, which the entire BC team does, but he plays like a motherfucker. Wow. He has skill. You're calling them floppers? Oh, they're flo- Dude, that team has been flopping the coach since was 1954, saying it too. buddy. The Boston College Eagles are flop city. <laughs> Population, <laughs> Chestnut Hill, all the hockey players, they're floppers. They always have been. But. Leonard also will run you right over and then stare at you while he's laughing in your face. So the team, the team is amazing. He's unreal. Gauthier, he's he's going to be something else. He can shoot the he shoots it like Matthews. His release is incredible. I don't know if he's going to be a goal scorer like that, but the entire tournament and Michigan, some of those players, Rucker, McGrory, the Jets. Whoo, you got a you got a wagon coming to your team with this kid Brindley. That assist by Nazar. For the oh. uh, winner, or the make it made a 4 2 against Jerns, Michigan yeah. State. That was, that was out up. of this world. That was fucked up. That was a, a Blackhawks draft pick. I know. So yeah, if they I get mean, Celebrini, no, that kid, B- Bedard, well, Christ, they so might that, make I playoffs mean, a lot next of people year. Are, think about college hockey next season, Wit, if Celebrini stays, because there are rumors that Celebrini could stay next season. Iserman's coming in. Supposedly, the whole BC line is coming back next season. That Leonard's be sh- got to be gone, though. He has to be. <laughs> Who and knows? So Gauthier is gone, and I bet you Leonard's gone. He's, he's yeah, I, I think Smith dominant. and Perot are back. Smith and Perot definitely should come back. I, I that agree. shimmy I shake agree. that Smith did on the, uh, I think it was a power play goal at the line, just so silky smooth at the, to- at the top of the umbrella. Did you see? What was it? Was that? Was that? Who was that against? Quinnipiac? I don't. Yes, I think that was. Goal. I think it, it was. I think it was their first goal of the game. To, so he got them going with that little shimmy shake at the line. Now going back to the flop, the Quinnipiac coach was saying that to the ref on the play in which I thought it was a bullshit call. So Quinnipiac was up three two in that game. There's Bad a call. back checker who comes back, mm. goes stick on puck, and it just so happens that his shoulder catches Leonard's head. And then, as you say, the flop artist show up. He goes down, and then I think he's on that fucking power play. Now, is it the same rule in college hockey? I believe they called a five-minute to begin with so they could review it, but then they yeah. had to give him a two-minute penalty. The most bullshit call in hockey. They should just have the ability to look at it and if it's not a penalty it's not a penalty let them out of the box because that they ended up scoring to make it 3-3 on that power play or ch- or Huge get goal. rid of their penalty and then chuck a two minute embellishment on the other team there you and, go and, there you and go quickly quickly I want to um, just in the midst of all this college hockey talk so I was told that all these Canadians were tweeting me that they couldn't even watch it now, apparently on TSN Plus or something, it's about $8 a month. So for next season, maybe everyone can kind of get involved that wants to spend the money. But I, I guess if you if you subscribe to that, you could watch all this college hockey action, which I highly recommend. I know there's unreal players and juniors, but at least this regional weekend, it, it's the hockey's out of this world. So for Canadians who didn't get to watch, I'm sorry. Hopefully we talk about some of your favorite prospects in the game. Um, in terms of BU, right? Celebrini, he was he was awesome, outstanding. But Lane Hudson, 
When I first saw him last year, you know the one-on-one skill. Montreal Canadiens fans, you're well aware of this guy. And and then the speed burst. He's able to kind of like slow down the game, and then he boom, he's away from you. It's it's crazy how he's he, he's done it. Now I, I kind of was like, I don't know, defensively, he's small. He's a competitive kid, but he's small. But then over the course of this year, and then talking to a, a few different scouts, I I think he's a I think he's going to be able to to get to the NHL and be a fifty point guy. I do. It, 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 when he has the puck on the blue line, Biz, I, I can't wait to see whether it's this year or next year, him on the blue line, he does these head fakes and his quick speed bursts. Like You can't stick with him. And yes, there's going to be PK guys in the NHL who are a lot faster, bigger, stronger, quicker. So Makar-like or Quinn Hughes-like? So it's, it's different than that. It, the, the, I would say they're a little smoother. They're like a little more elegant. But he he is so fast from stop to start that and and his head fakes and he, these tight turns he does that I I think it's going to translate to the next level defensively it'll be an adjustment for him but at, at at the beginning of seeing him last year I was like this kid's an insane defenseman college hockey superstar I wonder what's going to happen at the next level now I'm convinced that his point production in the NHL will be the exact same. It's 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 crazy, man. I can't wait for you to see him and and see what you think. But BU's on a, on a special path. It's it's been a hell of a year watching these guys. Now Denver getting to watch them. They went in. They went into Springfield, Massachusetts as a one seed and basically played like three home teams. They had to beat um, UMass, UMass, which is twenty overtime. minutes away. They got that done in an unreal game. Cornell then beat Maine, which was kind of surprising to me. And then this is all pretty Cornell, Maine, and and UMass. You could bring fans to Springfield, Massachusetts, and then Denver got got by uh, Cornell as well. This Zeev Booyam, holy shit, Biz! I think top fifteen, top ten NHL pick this summer. Can, uh, California kid. We chatted about him at World Juniors. He's got poise. He's got the ability to see the ice. His brother's also a defenseman on the team. They're on the power play together a couple times, which is cool to think about the thought of playing with your brother in college. But Denver's got some wagons too. So it's like, I think people are looking at BUBC in the final. Michigan and Denver are going to have a lot to say about that. They should be getting Rizzo back too. Massimo Rizzo only played 28 games this season. I mean, I think he had over 45 points. So that, that'll be a huge addition for Denver. I still got BCBU in the final, though. So um, I didn't really see any standouts on Cornell, but I just thought overall, the way that they played and their structure and their defense, they were in that game one, I forget who they played, but they just smothered them. And I think they got to the tournament only scoring 63 goals, they said, this year. So it tells you if they scored, if they got ahead and got the one nothing, maybe I'm crazy here. I heard that on the broadcast. Maybe, maybe it was for like a, like a different stat. But if I'm not crazy, I heard that they scored goals in the, like the 60 range. What do you play? 30 something games in college? Yeah. yeah so they've always they, been I, I mean, like that. Well, you are crazy. They've yeah, that's what like Merles that. was saying. Merles said on game notes, he's like, it just pisses me off because I'm watching them and it brings me back 20, 30 years when every fucking game you'd play against them, they just beat you down like that. They've oh, always yeah. been big. They've yeah, always big. been strong. This was Doug Murray land, dude. Oh, this really? Is where I first saw Doug Murray. The and Viking. They had this kid. Steven Bobby, he was about 6'6". Six, six. They've all I remember this kid Sam Paolini injured about three of us in a weekend up in Ithaca, New York, just getting run over. They've always been a lot of Canadian kids. They've always been tough to play against. I think they're like 0-6 in their last six games to go to the final four. So Ivy League ECAC team that has a lot of success. The guy Mike Schaefer's done an awesome job. My brother Sean played there for four years. He loved his time there. They got one of the best in-game experiences for college hockey. The fans are nuts up there. Um, Michigan, back to Michigan. They were without Seamus Casey, who we saw World Junior stud, devil's prospect. Pasha's loving that. Apparently, he's going to be able to be back for the Frozen Four, so that's big for them. But yeah, the storyline's going in, and, and we can get to the NHL. But you, if you didn't get to see anything, you missed a big weekend of college hockey. For I, four uh, days. Uh, Quinnipiac, the, when, the, when it got thrown in their mixer on that OT goal, why didn't the defenseman just clear it? I know. Oh, that was I know. He did, just he did, rip it against the glass. Because you're, you're making that play to the weak side forward where, like, what the fuck is he going to do with it collapsing to the net? It's like, here, take my problem. He must be fucking kicking himself in the ass. I kind of wondered if he was going to skate with it and then almost, you know, that's like what I would have done with it. That's what I would have done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you would have done the ice in overtime, Paul. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of that, Quinnipiac. That's a hell of a team, point, that, all right. 
<laughs> that might be the best analysis you've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> Hey, speaking of that Quinnipiac team, though, I would bet you in the next 24 to 48 hours, you see Colin Graf sign with an NHL team. He he's in, he was, you know, one of the top 10 in points this year. Last season, he was third in points, only behind Logan Cooley and Adam Fantilli. He'll be able to jump in an NHL lineup tomorrow and contribute. I don't think, uh, I don't necessarily think, well, you can't use him for the playoffs because you're signing him after the deadline, but you can get a good look at a guy now and know what you're going into the offseason if you get a few NHL games under their boat. Jacob Quinlan from Quinnipiac as well, I think he'll sign with the team. I wouldn't be shocked if Graf ends up with the Florida Panthers or Nashville Predators. He skated at both their uh, preseason development camps. But speaking of the Nashville Predators, the transfer portal right oh, now Whit, is control. insane right now. So Matthew Wood, first round pick last year, uh, 15th overall, I believe, for the Nashville Predators. He's at UConn. He just entered the transfer portal. 180 kids are currently in the transfer Whoa, portal right now in Division One gee, hockey. These hoes ain't to, loyal. You, did you talk to Nodak's coach about that, G? These you bros ain't broil. We did, yeah. We can play that clip yeah. right now. Throw it over. What are your thoughts on the transfer portal? Is that something you guys utilize here? Are you a fan of it? Well, it's it, it's here to stay, yeah, and it's part of the everyday side of it right now. And and I guess I I, I I'm not a I guess a huge advocate of it, but it has helped us, you know, uh, over the last few years. Uh, each year we presents a different opportunity. This year we had to go into it quite a bit because we had guys sign NHL contracts, we had guys exhaust eligibility, and we had a couple guys that transfer. So we needed we needed uh, you know some players coming through us through to our program, and we couldn't bring in 14 freshmen. So we had to bring in some transfers and, and they've helped our group. You know, the, the freshmen have been outstanding, but the transfers have really helped us too, as far as leadership, guys that had experience playing college hockey already. You know, there's some years we take one or two transfers. Sometimes we don't take any, but at the end of the day, each year presents a different opportunity and what that looks like. How, how much are you helping kids too with, um, you know, hey, like, you're, you don't have a spot on this team next year. I know you've been here a year or two, but there's just not a position on a team you should look to transfer. Or is it more they kind of see the writing on the wall? Like, look, I, I don't make, I don't fit on this team anymore. It's probably time for me to go. Yeah, well, I think there's a little bit of give and take there. But it all starts with communication. And it doesn't really, you know, uh, start at the end of the year. I think it's situations that that go through the year and, and you see where that opportunity lies. And, and I think it's a situation where, you know, we're trying to do the best for both, right? Yeah. For, for the for the student athlete and the program. And sometimes it's, you know what, hey, you know, hunker in, dig in here. You know what, there's going to be opportunity. You're going to, you got to just get through the grind here. And, or there might be a situation where, you know, that player goes, well, I, I don't really see the light of day. I, I think I want to go uh, try to have a fresh start somewhere else. And, and we're open to that too, you know? Yeah. So again, like I said, it, I think each and every uh, situation presents a different um opportunity and I think we uh, we do a good job of communicating. So yeah, that was Brad Berry. Brad, Brad Berry, he's the North Dakota coach. He kind of went in depth on just like how how much the the college game is changing between the NIL money and the transfer portal. You have to be thinking on your toes and you have to be scanning the league at all times. I mean, North Dakota had that kid from Lindenwood this year. He scored a huge goal in the first game and yeah, you just you have to you have to be on it for the transfer portal. I, 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 I like the transfer portal. In one sense, okay, if you're if you're a um, uh, if you finish your sophomore year, you got some recruits coming in. You haven't played much, and you're like, dude, I, I'm kind of in one the next two years. I totally get that. I I think it's fair, but it's almost like I wish it was maybe one transfer allowed because there's a big difference between finishing two years, not getting much ice time, not seeing much ice time in your last two years ahead of you and being like, I want to go somewhere else, not have to sit out a year like it used to be. But we got kids now playing a freshman season, getting good ice time and just looking elsewhere. I don't love that. I think if you do one allowed, I think that that's more than enough. I think that's fair. It gives you a chance to get out once, but the hopping around and I'm talking not just hockey, every league, every sport, I, it's crazy now. It's it's free agency every single season. I don't I, I don't LeBron. agree with how often you can just leave to greener pastures. I yeah, you should LeBron. only be able to do but, it once. You shouldn't yeah. be able to transfer yeah. it more than once. You know, at the same time, like cream will rise to the top. You know, chickens will come home to roost. Like if you're that good, then it'll be worth it. If not, then people will be like, oh, that's the guy who transferred six times and he still sucked. True. You know what I mean, True. you know, as far as the games, yeah. They got to just make these games available everywhere. I know uh, Canada is not as hip to the to college business as we mentioned earlier, but if it's on TV, people will watch fucking hockey. It's like when uh, leagues don't let you use their highlights or 
musicians don't let you use their music uh, if you're hosting a podcast person. For example, G, it's like, why would you want 800,000 people to hear your fucking uh, your song or, or see your highlights this week? I don't get it, but either way, that's one way they can improve. And as far as the uh, final, the Frozen Four went, if uh, Michigan State had won, it would have been the first time that all four number one seeds advanced to the Frozen Four. No shit. Still hasn't happened yet since they started the Frozen Four. Nice little four, nugget so. rear. Fuck, you're uh, buzzing. Oh. Single R. We will be buzzing. there, though. I mentioned it before. Saturday, we're going to do yep. a little Pink Whitney party. I'll tweet out. We'll get all those details out there later this week. I got two predictions. We're going to show up, and it's going to be a BCBU final, and Cutter Goche is going to score the OT winner, and he's going to give us the fucking double barrel on the way out. And then my second prediction is, is the NCAA is going to wake the fuck up because all these coaches are now starting to speak up about this regional host being the number one seed. And people might, I saw a lot of people on Instagram commenting like, oh, stupid idea. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Stupid uh, idea. More people think it's a dumb idea than smart biz. And I'm with you. They're, Cause they're but, fucking morons. And, and, and the fact that the NCAA like prides themselves on like, you're going to school. You should be making an educated decision. So they try to quote unquote, test the interests of the St. Louis market because they're going to be hosting in 2025. And G made me aware that they played out of the fucking practice rink. 2,000 yep. seats in the practice rink. And to make up for the lack of seats, they jacked the fucking ticket prices up to like 1,000 bucks. Talk I, thought, about I think that a, was the team's fan bases. I think that was the fan bases that created the But regardless, it's like they made it they made it impossible for fans to get to the game. It, it's, Biz, it's can I give and, you the argument for not having the number one seeds? Post absolutely the not. Move on, RA. All right. <laughs> no, wow. no, I want to I want to hear it. No, <laughs> no I want to hear it. We gotta hear it. Uh, Plus, can't, do you know what do you know what the people who don't like the idea have said, or, or are you going into this blind? Blind. So what they say is that. There are certain teams and programs who rarely, if ever, will be able to get a number one seed, according to them. So in their mind, it's so much harder to get out of the regional at the number one seed's home building than it would be in a, in a um, what's the word um, when it's random? Neutral. Neutral. Neutral site. Neutral site. So they're like, they're looking at like, we're never like RIT say like, we're never going to be a number one seed. That's not fair. And my argument, cause I'm with you is like, play better. Now, granted, BU, BC, Michigan, North Dakota, these blue bloods. Yes, they will have a better chance many times to host the regional and be able to have home ice advantage for two games. But I just think it's more about the atmosphere and it's more well, about creating yeah, but like you also drama have on the campuses. Okay. Than okay. helping out these lower seeded teams who think they need a, a neutral site to move to the Frozen Four. Okay, that's a very fair point. Now going back to you, G, of these coaches who have spoken up, are these like wagon uh, uh, schools that are typically getting the one seed, or are these no. coaches who who, who no, who it's kind of just like Wade said, vocal? it's like the smaller schools, the Bemidji States, the Ferris States of the world. Those are the schools that I'm sure are worried about. You're telling, and, and oh. so the. You're telling me, though, that these kids from Ferris State don't want to go into fucking uh, That's DU what I think. I think the and kids would rather do that. Barn and saying, I'll fucking go play the villain. This is about exactly. growing the game here. Oh, 2,000 people at a practice rink in St. Louis? Suck my dick. Fuck that shit. <laughs> That's so the fucking Grand Forks Bozo Herald, land. That's they're going to play this at the NCAA meeting. This is Bo said, suck my dick. That is All right, we're Bozo moving land the bullshit. Like, if you're doing... 2000 seat Gee. practice rink where all the tickets can get resold. And like, we might be off base on the fact that they were a thousand bucks on the resale, but it just shows you that nobody wanted to fucking go watch at a St. Louis practice rink. No offense. Hasn't Make David Cowell spoken against it? Sorry, Biz, to cut you off. Gee, didn't David Cowell have, have a statement? That's why I was asking, G, was it in RA? You're referencing my question about like, so these, these schools that aren't predominant have had coaches speak up, correct? I mean, yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Denver is a predominant school, but North Dakota, we talked, North Dakota is a predominant school as well. Brad Berry was adamant that you need to change this. And so the Grand Forks Herald talked to a dozen anonymous coaches and they said, according to conversations with a dozen college hockey leaders, I'm sorry, not coaches, leaders, there are athletic directors and coaches who are believed it's unlikely their teams will ever be in the top eight of the pairwise rankings and have the ability to host. So they'd rather play in an empty arena in the middle of college hockey desert than a packed house on campus they believe that gives their team the best chance to advance 
Which is I just know, moronic. Uh, hey, here, hey, all I keep hearing is about uh, uh, the student athletes, the student athletes, the student athletes. Pull the fucking players and see what they want to do. And pull the ones that don't get the, the number one seat. But I'm telling you, man, if you don't want to go to an 8,000 seat sold out barn and you'd rather play at a St. Louis practice rink because you, you'd rather play at a neutral site, I don't know, man. Maybe the NHL is well, not for you. The, the Cutter Goche cut- would tell you to fuck off. He wants to bend DU over. That's what I mean, Cutter Goche would decide, my new favorite the, player. The quote from Coach Kyle, it's, it's a little long, and I don't have the audio from it, but I think it's worth sharing. He said, uh, it seems to happen to it's us a little bit. It's way too long. I saw this okay. quote. Okay, all right. No so basically, no, like, I'll read like it. 10 minutes to read it. <laughs> all right, uh, four score and two I'll read years it. ago. I'll read it. Let's go to the no, National League. Yeah, let's fuck it. Yeah, I, I know. Canada hung up fucking two hours ago on, on the show already, but either way, uh, like, I wish that Canada could see more of these college games because they are fucking unbelievable, and, and thanks for supporting for those of you who have been. Before we continue, I need to talk to you about Rocket Money. Do you find any subscriptions you forgot about or any you paid for twice and didn't realize it? Because I did. And once I started using Rocket Money, it was a game changer in terms of saving money and realizing, oh my God, I got two Netflix accounts. I got two Disney Plus accounts. What is this bill being paid for twice? It's just sometimes it's hard with a bunch of different things in your life going on to to realize where all your money's being gone and why you're spending double the amounts that you should be. So Rocket Money's easy, easy to use and can help you out with all those issues. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you have full control over your subscriptions and a clear view of your expenses. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place. And if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. All you got to do is basically clip, click cancel. They'll take care of the rest. It's great how the dashboard shows you this month's spending compared to last month's so you can clearly see spending habits. Plus, they'll help you create a custom budget and keep your spending on track. Rocket Money will even try to negotiate your bills lower for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash chicklets. That's rocketmoney.com slash chicklets. Rocketmoney.com slash chicklets. Moving right along. Playoff standings. They haven't changed a ton since last week. Uh, the Bruins did clinch a playoff spot. Currently first with 101 points. Uh, Florida two back with a game in hand. The Leafs still in that third place spot. But Tampa Bay, like we talked about last week, with red hot. They're only four points back. Both teams have nine games to go. But we have to congratulate our buddy, Austin Matthews, hitting 60 goals for the second time in three seasons. Uh, we're going to talk to his agent, Judd Boldaver, a little bit later. But uh, Pablo, the, just the ninth player with multiple 60-goal seasons in the NHL. Uh, Gretzky, Bossy, Mario, Espo, Brett Hull, Pavel Bure, Stevie Y, Yari Curry. I mean, that's some elite company right there. Uh, moving on to the Rangers, unless busy. I know Austin Well, I was McCoy just going to say, what's the hardest there? thing to do in the NHL? Score goals. And he's doing it at a faster pace than Ovechkin. And if he stays healthy for another 12 years, he might be the all-time leader in goals. And that's just how fucking good this guy is. He can score from everywhere. He has one of the sickest releases we've ever seen. It doesn't need to be a slap shot. He loves that spot that Dreisaitl loves. It, it seems to be the new hot spot. You know how Ovi made that top of the circle shot famous? I think Brett Hall was very similar in the way he was able to find those lanes with that fucking knee drop one-timer, like a 60 flex. That weak side off the goal line he, he's he's a fucking maniac from there. So it's so impressive to be on a list of, of nine guys and the names. I mean, he's he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's the greatest yeah, Toronto that's Maple already, Leaf. That's already locked. That's, that's a, already locked. That's a lock. To have those nine guys be be, be two times 60 goal scorers, it, it, he's a Hall of Famer. And much now, like, here's the thing about the goals, Biz. Well, just quickly, much like Ovechkin, though, the one thing that's going to be held against them is the Stanley Cup and the playoff performance. Hey, look out for Pablo this year, baby boys. Hey, look out for Pablo. <laughs> what were you going to say with, Doc? So he's at 359 goals, and this is his eighth season, I believe. He was drafted in 2016. Um, so you think, all right, you're going you to do this again for another eight years, and you're still, right? You're still 
you still wouldn't be at the record. So to say, yes, he has as good of a chance as anyone of, of breaking what will be Ovi's record, I think we can all agree on. But it's still like so far away from happening. And health is everything. But even, even not being healthy, like skills diminish quickly. I don't think it'll happen to him. But if you look at this run he's been on, and he's got this many goals already, and then you double it with another eight-year run like this, and he's still not even there, it's like, buddy, like for anyone to say he's going to break Ovi's record for sure, that's crazy talk. Crazy talk. And if he actually ends up doing it, it would be like for it to be around that long and take this many years for Ovechkin to break Gretzky's if it was just broken like somewhat pretty quick after Ovi. It's it's wild to think about, but people are so presumptuous that like, oh yeah, Matthews is going to break whatever record Ovechkin the reason, scores. The reason I say that though is the way he treats his body off the ice. I know, but... he's a, I, I know that... Listen, Longevity, I get it's important, and there's a lot of luck involved. And it's luck. But when you, yes. what you, what, what you, when you treat your body and you're as dialed in and focused as he is, I think it's just a matter of time. And that's my opinion, and I get, and maybe I'm off base by saying that I think it's a guarantee. You know, when Charles Barkley gives it the guarantee, <laughs> that's what I I'm mean, thinking, baby. I, and I as think much as I've chirped you for, and I'm a lifelong Leafs hater, right? You, you, I think the, when I said the gloat they, three years ago, you laughed me off stage. I, I, I did, and I've, I've, come back, I've come back upon that one big time. Thank greatest you. Leaf of all time, could be the greatest scorer of all time, is currently the best goal scorer in the world. Yeah. But Leafs fans, can't stand you. But their presence in Buffalo, and it's always been like that, but their presence everywhere, it really gives me some serious thought on your uh, yacht club vibe of the Scotiabank Arena. Because when these normal blue-collar Leafs fans can go into other buildings, mm -hmm. they're wild and crazy. And it makes me feel so bad for the Leafs players that they have to deal with this morgue of the Scotiabank Arena when they're playing at home. Corporate these guys would rather play on the road. And Buffalo, it's, it's always been that way. They've always been you know, adamant on buying tickets and just driving down to see them. It's cheaper. But every building that the Leafs go into, their fan base shows up loud and proud. And it, 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 it's pretty cool to see because their Leafs, their fans get a tough rep when you watch the games at home. It's like, where, where is everyone? Why is it so quiet? Well, they have three home barns. They have uh, Buffalo, Ottawa, and Toronto. Those are their three home barns. Buddy, when they're down in Florida, it's all Leafs fans. Yeah. Maybe not uh, so much anymore. Florida attendance has been good, but... Um, all right, we were, we were going to move on to the Rangers. Now, I could potentially have cool. the back-to-back the -back President's Trophy winners missing playoffs. That would be, that, that's going to uh, uh, basically deduct my gloat comment, right? I got the positive you know, flying high, and then all of a sudden. That's long gone anyways. Yeah. But just real quick, back to Austin. I mean, I, to, to back up your point, his goal, goals per game, 0.65 goals uh, per game. Gretzky and Ovechkin, 0 0.60. So. He's on a, a good pace to, if he's going to smash that record. But uh, to the Rangers, yeah, they grabbed the, the Metro and the East by the balls with their five-game uh, winning streak lately. 24-1 and one since February. But we got to doff our caps uh, around the snaps. Actually, uh, stay in the They're 24-1 uh, and one in their last 25 20 games? 20-4-1. 20-4-1. Yeah. Holy dash shit. Four dash I one. Like, still, well, still, that's still wild. impressive nonetheless. Hey, and a big reason why they're there? Quickie. Fucking what a story, man. Congrats. John Quick. Uh, he stopped 27 shots to beat the Yotes 8-5 to five Saturday for his 392nd career wow. win. Wow. Uh, he passed Ryan Miller for the most goal, uh, most wins by an American goalie of all time. Obviously, a future Hall of Fame, even before he got to the Rangers. But, Witt, I love this, like, second, like, uh, encore of his career. I mean, I think everybody thought he was done last year. After, you know, they, they very rudely, I would say, traded him to Columbus. They didn't give him the courtesy of a heads up for what he did for the organization. Then, obviously, in Vegas, he got the third cup. And I think people thought he was done. And man, he's not only getting it done, he's got the numbers to fucking back it up. 17, 5, and 2 in 24 starts, two five four goals against, a 9-1-3 save percentage, two shutouts. He's a 38-year-old guy. And numbers are across the league are way down. The, I think the league average save percentage is like 9-1-5 right now. So I, I love this story, Wit. I love it. And I respect the Rangers fans who I've heard be open and honest about the fact that not only does he break the American all-time win record as a Ranger. But he saved that team's ass this year. Oh, yeah. It was a signing where everyone was like, oh, yeah, quick, he's got, what does he have left in the tank? They got Shesterkin. Does it even really matter? Well, Shesterkin had nothing. He lost his game. He had the yips. 
And Quickie came in and just backstopped them to continue to be able to dominate the league. And and without him, with a, with a backup this year who was struggling as well, I don't know where they sit. But because of Great him, call. Shesterkin was able to take his time. He's now at the Shesterkin level, if not above what we've oh, seen yeah. before oh, from him. Yeah. And I think if you talk to him, he'd say, like, thank God for Quickie. I had a guy filling in for me that was playing way better than me. And our team was con- able to continue to roll when we could have we could have been in the shitter. If I was playing the way I was and our backup wasn't able to come in and do the job. So this entire season, it's like, that's a, he, you know what, you know, the Bruins do the seventh man award mm-hmm. and Some which play, is always yeah. like the, I don't even know how to describe it. The best non like star, the best like depth guy. If the Rangers had that, that's quick all year for me. Now I know usually that's given to a defenseman or a forward, but in terms of a depth player making an impact quick has done that tenfold for the Rangers this year and and I look at American goalies to me it's um it's quick is the easy number one and Ryan Miller like what I saw in 2010 in Vancouver I don't know if quicks ever played at a level that high yes 2012 he was the best goalie in the world and he's got the two cups and I'm sure that his top end hockey was right there but I saw Miller steal games so it's somewhat close but the cups and and the record now quick to me there's no argument. The best American goalie ever. I think Tom Barrasso's in the mix. Yeah, and Mike Beesbrook Richter. would be in the mix. Mike uh, Tim Thomas is kind of in the mix. It wasn't the, the longevity of these other yeah. guys, but that one year, Tim Thomas might have been better than anyone else. So yeah. it's just cool to see. Knowing Quickie a little bit as I do, and all the guys talk about him, just old school, quiet guy, loves having a few beers and cooking pizzas in his backyard. But Johnny's a pizza. An American legend. Yeah. Um, they hit another milestone too, Chris Kreider. 300th goal as a Ranger. The last, I mean, he's always been a good goal scorer, but the last three years for them, man, and what he's done for their power play, one of the best net front guys in the league. And uh, he's, uh, man, they are just humming right now. And they're buzzing so much, they're getting shout outs from fucking Larry David, RA. Oh, oh, we got, we got to jump. I think we got to save that. I think save it for Davis what, thing. dude? We're talking about okay. the Rangers and Larry right, David right, no, stroking <laughs> Panarin off about his puck control. <laughs> Panarin's getting he was cameos. A fan. Yeah. No, no. Well, dude, it was funny. I, I put it. Yeah. At the end, at the end of the outline this week. Curb your enthusiasm. I don't know if you've been watching with the whole season or you biz, but episode seven they had a plot line about uh, group text messages and how much Larry David hated that people do these group text messages. I hate. He group didn't text know anybody too. on it. Huh? I hate group <laughs> text too. Other than like the work ones were on. I don't like. I'm not a big group text dude, guy. Exactly. Well, those are fun. But th- that was one of my grand new gears a hundred years ago about that. And then this week's episode, it was another hockey reference. And he was telling his ex that he liked to have sex on the floor, so he wouldn't have to cuddle afterwards. And she said, "Listen, if if you didn't want to cuddle after, he says, hey, wait, what about the bread man's plan? We want to talk about the ranges.' Basically, he said, "I'd rather talk about the ranges after sex than whatever than cuddle with you." And he actually says. What about the bread man's plan? The way he controls the puck, it's really amazing, isn't it? And I'm like, wait a minute, Biz, is, is Larry David maybe like a secret chicklets fan? Yeah, I mean, you like, explain like, that as well as your movie review, that but was, yeah, that was, that, that was brute. I mean, it was right. Am simple. I crazy? Am that I was crazy awful. here? That was, was terrible. Am I, am I, not, I, 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 I've are, seen wait, it, so I wait, know what you're talking wait, about. Wait, you, you describe it. If you haven't it. seen that, you're like, what is he talking about? Wait, Who you, said you, wait, what? Wait, you describe it, please. Can you please describe it? Larry David is talking to his ex-wife, Cheryl, and he is discussing the fact that he's disgusted, basically, at the thought of cuddling and having sex and then telling your wife you love her and that he enjoys having sex on the floor so he doesn't have to cuddle after. He then mentions, if we were to have sex in a bed and you didn't want to cuddle and talk about the love we have for one another and you wanted to talk about the bread man and the Rangers winning and his puck control and his ability to dominate play holding that little black biscuit, then I'm all in. But I would rather have sex on the floor and then not have to cuddle afterwards. All right, round of applause here for Ryan Whitney there. Thank you, guys. Uh, hey, now keep in mind, R.A.'s you, playing his tooth game right now and he's battling probably a couple... No. Couple no, I was going to say we, we we literally said right before we recorded. Okay, we're going to literally we're going to save this thing for the very. I end know, of the but show, we're so. shifting because we're talking about the Rangers. <laughs> well, Jesus that's, Christ, that's man! Well, think you on your feet. feet, I, feet, I, feet, I, feet I, I, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, I did, I did get I uh, biz. I did get quite a few tweets saying that my description of poor things is pretty accurate. By the way, okay, about, uh, the, 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 the <laughs> okay. movie. Yeah, so. All right. 
<laughs> we should no, do anyways, a little, little vote. I, I want to hear from you fans after about who gave yeah, the better I, breakdown I, there. I, I did put you that Larry, Larry David description. If you haven't watched <laughs> Curb Your Enthusiasm, by the way, this is the, the final season. I think the uh, Sunday is the last episode ever. Wait, would you agree this is as funny as it's ever been, even the early years, like the, the season? I actually, I think the beginning was a little funnier. I loved it. I, I, I love the show. Uh, I just look back at the beginning seasons as a little bit better, but I've always enjoyed all of them. I mean, the 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 Palestine episode where he had the chicken that he loved from the Palestine restaurant and then all his Jewish friends, and it's kind of a tough oh. topic now, but oh. when he's at oh. the end and he's got a woman that'll sleep with him that's hot and the chicken he loves, and then he's got his Jewish friends and he's looking back and forth, that's an all-time scene, an all-time show. I think it's amazing. And him bringing hockey into the mix was a surprise because I didn't even know he was a hockey fan. Yeah, he shows I don't think up he's at, ever mentioned that. Yeah, I know he does show up at MSG once in a while. By the way, what, what I love about the show, what, how I know everything's like nowadays, both sides, both sides. He skews like like both sides, like whether, whether, you're, whether oh, yeah. you're red, fucking blue, green, purple, left, right, whatever. He just fucking goofs on everybody right now. He's just funny. Middle, so. He's just he flat out funny. funny. Oh, what a, what a run, though. Like, I. I, I'm, sh- I'm sure he's ending it because he's exhausted and he deserves to ride off into the sunset. How many years was Seinfeld going? And then and then to recreate something. I know it's it's a similar type of plot, but to kind of recreate it in its own way, just a, a remarkable entertaining career for Larry David. Jesus Christ. Biz, that guy Desert is a Island. legend. Desert Island. What? You can only get one of those shows. Which one are you taking with you? So I would so I haven't seen all of Curb, so I would probably pick Curb. Because the, the you've shows seen all I, the Seinfelds, biz. No, but uh, definitely more. No, no, time out. Yeah, but yeah. definitely more. Yeah. Whereas, like every time it's on TV, I'll, I'll finish an episode, and rarely am I like belly laughing. But I like I love you know. I actually think George is probably the best character on Seinfeld, yeah. if I had to be honest. But I would pick Curb because it would be fresh to me, and I love his. Uh, Who's the, is it the black cousin? Is it his cousin or brother-in-law? Leon. No, oh, Leon. it was a yeah. family he JB took in Smooth. after Hurricane Katrina, the blacks. But yeah, yeah, so that was when I kind of started watching and I was like, this guy is unbelievable. So that was probably the the, the top of, of Curb, I would assume what you were referencing. When all that was kind of, those were the best seasons, you would say? Yeah, it was even before that the show was on. But Biz, two things. One, George Costanza, all-time character. All-time all character. Time. What's funny, there's a Curb episode that Elaine's in the episode. She's in Curb as herself, Julie right. Louis Dreyfus or whatever. And um, there was a lot of George based on Larry. So this Curb episode is like people basically saying how much of an idiot and how much of a scumbag and a loser George is. And Larry's just getting furious the entire episode. Like George wasn't an idiot. So it's a, it's a kind, of, kind of a good crossover. My second thing is when you talk about TVs and movies, I, I always get a kick out of it. And Grinelli and R.A., hop in if you want. I've never seen you watch TV or a movie. No, like, I don't. You don't watch TV. So when you no. talk about TV, she's like, what? you don't watch TV. When yeah, I first but, met Biz, when, was when the last I first time met you him. When you watched a TV show? Really? I usually binge watch them when I do. <laughs> um, Here, it has dude. been years, dude. Yeah, like, a couple years. Because you haven't years. talked about one. Late, yeah, a couple late years. Night, Biz, we watched. When we had that place in Charlestown a couple of years ago during COVID. We we watched a couple of late night movies. I remember me and you would have. A yeah, night. I like watching Snuggle old school. Night. I always I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. So whenever I have a free time to throw something on, like I usually just chuck on There Will Be Blood. I could watch that movie oh. over and over and oh. over and over again, rather than watching something new. I'm funny. I I am the worst when it comes to routine. But as far as yeah, I'm not a a huge TV guy. I did Sons of Anarchy. I binge watched that. Uh oh! The last thing I binged watch on television was the greatest TV series I've ever seen, and it was the one with Matthew McConaughey and um, True uh, Detective. True Detective. Woody Harrelson. Okay. It was yeah. incredible. Yeah. So the standard is so high that I don't know if like what else am I going to watch? What's what's a comp to that? You guys think? I mean, the, obviously the big three: The Wire, Sopranos, uh, Break Bad. I couldn't I mean, get into are- The Wire. It's too old. It's too old. You'd love Breaking Bad. That mean? I've so seen cool. Breaking Bad. I've Sopranos seen, but that was incredible. Yeah, Sopranos is I need to binge watch it. But yeah, I don't oh, watch a lot of TV. I'm a loser. Anyway, we can move on from me being a loser. No. I'm too busy going on dates. Wait, wait did you, just, you mentioned uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Did you ever watch Veep? Wait, yeah, it's funny. Fucking hilarious. Super underrated. All right, moving right along. Biz, we got to talk about Josh Stone. Unbelievable. 
Uh, we just mentioned the Rangers. That was his third NHL game. He did get an assist that game, but he had a hell of a debut Thursday night versus Columbus. Scored not once, but twice, uh, including the game one of the first Coyote to record a multi-goal game in his debut. Took the uh, customary rookie lap as well. His second game, he had two assists and a win over the Preds. The only active player with multi-point games in his first two NHL games and one of eight active guys to pot two or more goals in his NHL debut. And with the assist on Saturday versus the Rangers, he became the first Coyote to register at least a point in his first three games. Just a fucking awesome stuff for this awesome. kid. I mean, obviously we're friends with Shane and fantastic guy. We're rooting for him, but I mean, he just come out of the fucking the barrel shooting hub is. Yeah. And you know, he spent mo majority of the year down in the American hockey league. Like even when they were going through their struggles, like he never got the call up and he was doing really well down there and um, cool story. So uh, we went to ice con. And, you know, the Coyotes are so nice to us and, and me, and they allowed me to park in the back. So as I was leaving, Donor was at the rink. And he and I, you know, obviously, I go give him a big hug. And he goes, hey, he goes, Josh just got the call up. I think he's going to be, don't tell anyone, don't say anything. But And then they ended up announcing it like an hour later. But I think he's going to get his first NHL game against the Columbus Blue Jackets. So right away, I'm thinking, great opponent. Like, he's probably going to get some ice time and, you know, fucking. I, and I sent out a tweet before the game. I said, he's going to fucking get one tonight. And sure enough, he gets two. And, you know, I've had the ability to see him kind of come up enough, like where I went to, I think, one or two of his minor league games, like when he was playing for the Junior Coyotes. And then I went and watched him a couple times at ASU. And, buddy, the hockey brand in this guy and how good he is around the puck and in the offensive zone, much like Donor, man. Donor was a fucking relic near the blue paint. And he's, I would say the only thing that holding him back from being a fucking true like NHL star is maybe his boots, but you, much like everything else, buddy, he's just going to continue to work, work, work and work. And for him to come in and get those couple goals right away, like you got to imagine it's hard following your father's footsteps who the yeah. greatest coyote of all time is. And even when he was drafted in the second round by the team, like a lot of people, like even some check marks online, like, oh, Nepo baby, Nepo baby, Nepo baby, where it's like, buddy, fuck off. If you had any type of fucking hockey sense or, or, or watch any games when he was co coming up with the Chicago Steel and then the impact he made on the ice with the ASU. And not only that, but his leadership qualities. Much like Donor, he's extremely like, calm demeanor, great teammate. And imagine having a mentor like fucking Shane Doan bringing you up. So I couldn't be happier for the guy. He deserves everything he's gotten. And to be able to do that in the same organization that your father came up in and fucking basically kept in the desert, bravo. And I, I couldn't be happier for Donor and his family. And to see all those shots in the, in the, in the box, I think his his one his one kid and then his I think it was his uncle were tarps off fucking swinging their shirts around like North Carolina come on and raise up take your third <laughs> off it was it was awesome buddy and and I couldn't be happier for him and and I don't know what you guys have to say about it but uh, bravo to Josh Don yeah Biz don't don't always gives off those positive vibes the old man but like uh, what would you have to do to actually piss him off in the locker room back when you played with him I'm sure I'm sure you raised his Irish up once or twice fudge boys. What, what Doing out there, we gotta freaking get going here, man. Door slam. <laughs> he, um, it, but he was. There was a couple times where he would come and he would never like call individuals out. We need to be better. Starts with me. It always. He would always start it with I need to be better, and everybody else needs to be better. And it was that's what made him the best leader. I would say throughout the course of my five years. Not many times in the first three years because we had such success, RA, but he was the guy where he would just shut the door. He would go tell Tip, no need to come in, and it would be a closed-door meeting, and we would have a conversation. And that was really the first time where, like, you know, at the, at the end, I mean, I, I was such short time in Pittsburgh, so I just loved his approach as a leader and everything about him. I could go on and on and on. Like, so, like, never did he really have a snap show. It was always about acknowledging that he needed to be better and, and bringing the team in more of a discussion. And then after that, he would be at the rink till 12, 31 o'clock, talking to people in the hallway, being the biggest Coyotes ambassador there was. So just the ultimate guy. Like, you will never see me say a bad word about Shane Doan. If he called me to bury a body today, I'd fucking, right now, I would chop off the podcast. I am as loyal as they come for, for Shane Doan. So uh, love him and, and couldn't be happier for the family if I've, I know I was long-winded with that answer, but never oh, any sorry. major snap shows. Who's Cowie? I was, I, I was, uh, I thought it was cool that they, they mentioned 
I think when he was 14 or 15, Josh was 5'4 or something like that. Five, yeah, he was five. short. Like, he was a big time kind of late bloomer, which is awesome because, you know, you're, like you said, your dad's this NHL star and legend on the Coyotes. And then you're just trying to, you just love the game and you want to be like your dad. And I'm sure there was a lot of kids a lot better than him at a young age. And with a dad like that, stick to it, stick to it. You know, you love the game. Good Bugsy, you love the game. It'll love you back. And then he is able to hit that growth spurt. And then he goes to Arizona State, doesn't leave after the first year, doesn't leave, says, I want to dominate a little bit more and I think I'll be ready. Dominates the second year, leaves, and then doesn't just get thrown on the NHL team. I'm a big believer in dominate the level you're at before you're ready or, or think you're ready to go try the next level. And he goes yeah. to the AHL and he dominated. He had an awesome season so far in the AHL. It's, it's earn your stripes. He's done that along the way. Andrew Berkshire just puking at home watching this <laughs> Nepo baby. He just disgusted by his dad's <laughs> success and his dad getting him a job with the Coyotes. But the kid's done it on his own. He's done it on his own and he's been able to kind of work through a lot of different things that were going against him in terms of size, in terms of maybe skating. And it's cool. Knowing Donor, the little I do, I sent him a text and that monster in the press box with his shirt off, who the, it was like the mountain. Who was that guy? The I think it was their cousin or, or, or I daughters. thought he was an NFL or something. Yeah, he looked like it. He looked like a you know, UFC fighter so. or something in the heavyweight division. Uh, but no, great point, Wit. Like, you know, as you know, he 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 hit that growth spurt late. Uh, he was able to go to the USHL as a result of probably deciding that he was gonna go off to college, where you know, Donor owns part of the Kamloops Blazer. He dominated the, the WHL, but Donor was also a man child. So yeah. for him to take that path, and I think we've talked about it before about uh, the the resources that the Chicago Steel uh, provide in the USHL, where they got the skills coach, they got the ice all the time, and the, the owner there has really put a lot of money into to helping develop all these players. So he was fortunate enough to go there, where I mean, it's pretty much ran like most WHL teams. So it's been awesome, and 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 as you stress, like not rushing into to the career where dominating at every level does matter. So bravo and. Uh, a great story. Yeah, good shit. We'll obviously keep tabs on. Uh, you just mentioned that the Andrew Berkshire. Uh, wait, we should jump right into that. I mean, Zach Hyman, I, we've been beating this guy's drum all season. I, I mean, one of he's become one of my favorite players. Just watching this guy grind. Uh, he got his 51st goal Thursday night. Boy, was 4-3 win overtime. And this guy, like, posts, like, weird shit about the craziest thing I've money. ever seen. Like, honestly, like, like, Biz, when you can, like, have everybody in hockey Twitter galvanize against you, then you really done fucked up big time because hockey Twitter is like clusterfuck. It's like a, a round circle. Everybody's shooting at each other all the time. And it's like he brings in parents' money and being rich and like not talking about hard work. It was like, buddy, what the fuck are you talking about? It made no sense. It was just like babbling. And buddy, I'm the king of babbling. I had no idea what his point was. And obviously people dug up some of his older tweets. And, you know, I, I don't know if he has issues with certain ethnicities around the world, but it was certainly a question that brought raised, but wait, I know you, you had a pretty fucking hottie dunk on him as well. I, I was just like, why? What the fuck are you talking about, dude? Yeah, it just made no sense. And, and you, you mentioned everyone was against him, which I found hilarious. That never happens. There's always sides going against each other. Nope. It was just like, everyone, get him. And, and he deserved it. I mean, it made, it made zero sense. And there is, there is truth to hockey being um, a very expensive sport and there's a lot of people that are good at it that come from money, okay? Well, what, what, you could be the richest kid in the world. It doesn't mean you're going to get to the NHL and score 50 goals a as, as a 31-year-old. And he was just going at him in such a weird way. Like, Hyman's, Hyman, I think he has four, three or four brothers. They all have the same amount of money, and none of them are in the NHL getting 50 goals. It was just, It was just so, like, I don't know if tone deaf is the wrong word. It just made no sense. It was I was watching it. Feidelberg from Barstool. He wrote underneath my tweet. He's like, I just watched this. I, I thought he was kidding around. Like, like it, it came off as like a joke almost. So the guy just got dunked on, deservingly so. But Zach Hyman has earned everything he's ever had. Yes, dude, having money, you, you there are certainly some advantages. Private coaches, things of that nature. But it doesn't matter. Once you look at the big picture, you got to be able to put your balls on the line and sacrifice uh, 
so many things growing up, whether it's hanging out with your buddies, going to a school dance, partying with your friends, going on a vacation. Like it, it, you, you sacrifice so much, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, to get to the level that he's gotten to. And to take that away or try to take that away by saying his dad was super loaded. That's it right it's there. Just, just, it, yeah. it, it has nothing to do with it. It really it's, it's, doesn't. He, he he tried to take away from his moment. It was it was it was bullshit. Now yeah. going back to the parody aspect, like maybe he's like, how can I garner the most clicks off of this situation? And yeah. that was his his um, mindset going in. But just uh, uh, an absolute banana lands take. And if anything, you would probably be positive towards somebody who could just not do anything and and be a trust fund kid. And 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 yeah. guys, if my yeah. parents were that rich, or I would have been yeah. RA ripping Money. the bong at fifteen, nah. looking at porn, I would have been a disaster. What do I need to work for? And the fact that even since he's gotten to the NHL, he's continued to try to develop his game and make a name for himself, like just a wild, preposterous take. So, um, damn, just a yeah. walking L. I had I didn't and, know what the what fuck anybody said- was talking about because I've had that guy blocked for three years. He came at me. Oh, at so he has tweets at you. From 14 years ago, dude. He was yeah, he's been coming at stuff. Nobody. He's, he's been, been coming at me forever. I'm not kidding. So, like 2000, so, uh, 2011, 13 so finally, years he's been going at biz. Yeah, so finally I'm like, all right, block. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. It was just preposterous nonsense. Now, and like, we like to... Like, we like to joke around about funny shit, like the cap circumcisors, like the Vegas Golden Knights and stuff, but this is just a whole different fucking level. Yeah, he was, mentioning, he was mentioning like, Everyone who says hard work, you work hard, you'll have success. You work hard, you'll have success. That doesn't mean shit. It does not mean you'll have success. There's no doubt that there are very, very hardworking people out there that are still struggling. But if you look at the other side and being lazy and having no drive and not caring and not putting your, your, your balls on the line, as I said, and giving it everything you got, which one would you rather have? Which one's going to lead to more success in any aspect of life? It might not be what you're working hard towards, but your goals um, or, or your desire and passion and ability to work hard, it's going to help you out in the end. Financially, yes, you can work hard and, and you can kind of get screwed over and it never can really work out in best for, the best for you. But that is a great quality to have as a hard worker because it, whether it's being a father or a husband, like if you work hard and you work at your craft, there is no downside to that. And, and his and, argument that it doesn't ma- mean anything is bullshit. And could could he be going at a nicer guy? Like direct your energy <laughs> yeah, to the to direct your <laughs> energy too. to the trust fund kids buying fire festival tickets for 10 grand. Not Seriously, Zach Hyman he, fucking a, putting putting up with the net fund head. punishment <laughs> for crying Seriously. out loud. But anyway. I mean, plus like money, your, your parents' fest. money, anyone's money. You can't buy fucking NHL skill with with fucking money. No, no matter whose money is. That's yeah. That's the stupidest fucking point of all. I had every advantage in the world to be a good hockey player, and I wasn't. Same shit, here. So, same here. <laughs> well, Biz, you know the guy who worked very hard to get where he's been an all star for the first time in his career this year. Frankie Vitrano from the four one three West of Mass. Love this kid. Finally got him on the show. So we're gonna send it over to Frankie V right about now. Enjoy. All right, gang, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Game Time. Hey, gang, did you know that you could go see the Rolling Stones at Gillette Stadium right now for under $200? $150, are you kidding me right now? Greatest rock and roll band ever. And that's just the tip of the iceberg with Game Time. That's right. Game Time, the official official ticket of partner of Boston Sports. You should never have to worry when you buy tickets to the next big event whether it's a concert like the Stones, playoffs, Bruins, Celtics, whatever, whatever town you're in, game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. You like a play? I love a play myself. Boom. Hit up game time. Unreal deals. They got flash deals for sudden discounts. Zone deals when you're feeling flexible. And their lowest price guarantee means that if you find the same seats for less anywhere else, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Wowza. You don't get that anywhere else because game time is the best place for last minute seats with up to 60% off your favorite events. Again, stones under 200 bucks. You kidding me? Craziness. Get on it right now. What are you waiting for? I'm buying. I might buy the second show here. I might go to New Jersey. I might go to Vegas. If stone tickets are this cheap on game time, I'm going to see them everywhere. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app. 
create an account and use the code Chicklets for $20 off your first purchase. Terms to apply. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Well, it's great to welcome this fellow mass hole to the show finally. After his time at Zoo Mass, this undrafted forward signed with his hometown Bruins before blossoming in Florida with the Panthers. After a brief stint on Manhattan, he signed with the Anaheim Ducks, where he's now a team leader and an all-star for the first time. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chickens podcast. Frank Vitrano, congratulations, my friend. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, hot Excited. pleasure. This must be like crazy for you to go undrafted, you know, spend some time in the minors, down bounced around from Florida, New York to Anaheim, and now here you are, an all-star, 29 years old. Yeah, I mean, something that I never expected, even just playing the NHL. You know, maybe back in the day, I thought I'd get a cup of coffee in the NHL, but uh, it'll be an all-star now. I never expected of it. Um, but yeah, I, I bet fit in well in Anaheim, and it's, it's been fun. How cool was that 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 way you found out, right? Like went pretty viral, just having your family there to, to, to give you the news in the locker room. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, they've been there since day one, so to share with them, I mean, I had no idea. I don't know how the, the picking goes. I don't yeah. know when they're making the selections, but... To be surprised with my family, my style, that was that was uh, icing on the cake. Was it was it just such a relief this year? Maybe not necessarily relief being the right word, but starting the way you did, man. It's like it just opens up the whole season. Like the pressure gets taken off. It must have been so good. You're just lighting it up right up right off the bat. Yeah, I talk about it all the time, especially at the beginning of the year. I think I will, everyone always talks about the hardest goal to get is the first. I one. know. And if the more it takes, you're like panicking. I've gone through stretches where it took me like seven to 10 games to get my first goal. Oh, so, yeah. um, you know, to get a hat trick in my second game, you kind of just play with kind of call it house money. You yeah. Get your cookies early. And if you go through a little bit of a drought, you know, you have some of that, some of the goals that you scored in the past so you can get through it easier. Yeah. Sure. When, you, when you got to Anaheim, did you feel at home right away? Like, did you know you were going to be given a good opportunity to get your ice time and, and be able to show them what you're capable of? Yeah, I think that was part of the reason why I signed there. Um, when I went to New York, I think going to New York was the biggest thing that's happened in my career. Being able to play with uh, Krides and Zabinajad and playing a top six role in the playoffs on the highest stage. And once you can do it in the playoffs, you know you can do it in the regular season. So I saw an opportunity in Anaheim and Obviously, Anaheim's a great place to live. I was used to living in Florida, so I wanted to go back to another sunny spot and <laughs> have an uh, opportunity to play. A little different than Springfield. Yeah, it's a little, it's sunny there. That's Although, if, if an NHL team yeah. is in Springfield, he'd sign a lifetime deal. Sign a lifetime deal. It's a 10-year deal right <laughs> <What's>, now. <laughs> uh, what I know about Springfield, I never actually went to it. There was this famous strip club. There. Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, 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 hey now. That's like it, world known. Everyone who's been through Springfield knows the Gras. Yeah. Because then you have to get <laughs> the Gras. <laughs> the Gras. I think they shut it down. I think there's some, I think some COVID, operations COVID going on. COVID ended that oh, one. Yeah. Where it With amongst yeah. other things. COVID. <laughs> COVID and other, other things. <laughs> but, you, but you could go there. You could go there all day. Guys would go after practice because they had this unreal buffet too, right? Yeah, was, you can get a 12-ounce ribeye right next door at the 350 Grill. <laughs> He's the but, mayor, but dude. It was, it was kind of like attached. Dude. Attached. So you can kind of like walk around. Girls hanging from the poles while you're eating your ribeye. You know? <laughs> nice. nice. Only, in, only in Springfield. <laughs> How much of your signing bonus went there? The funniest, I've never been there. <laughs> okay, all right. I usually try to stay away from downtown Springfield. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's <laughs> the locals don't go downtown. Area. All I hear about is this famous tattoo. That you ended up getting, right? You have a Springfield tattoo. I do. On your I have leg? the skyline of Springfield on my leg. All the, uh, all my buddies who played hockey, played college, all of us have it. I know you guys had Ryan Leonard on, so we told me he couldn't get it till he plays pro. So exactly, we'll try, we'll try to get it. So you guys show. are all kind of cut from the same cloth. Then. Oh yeah. So, so not to interrupt you before he goes. Growing up playing hockey in Massachusetts, the, the Springfield Picks. I don't know if they're still the Picks. They yeah, were, uh, they're Mass Con United now, but yeah, the Picks. Okay, buddy. When you were going out there to play these guys. They were workhorses. They played their dicks off rough. I'm like, everyone going out there, you're like, put the bootstraps on, boys. You're going out Western Mass. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a, they're motherfuckers. Out Is there. that a good sale job for what you right, guys had? For sure. They play it. Always tough. You're kids. probably playing at the Enfield Twin Rinks, too. Every, every. And that rink hasn't changed one bit. The really? rink's the size of this room. The nets aren't regulation. The size. parents are nuts out there. You just got to know how to play in that rink. <laughs> <laughs> but growing up, like, were you always one of the top players? I mean, I know you went undrafted. Like, grown, like, were you kind of elite from a young age? Yeah, I was always good. I always played a, a year up. So I've oh, really? I played ninety threes. So I actually played for the picks. Uh, I think like squirt minor, squirt major. Then I actually played for the Flames. I played for the Flames. So uh, all the best hockey's in Boston and. For like development in order i was fortunate enough my parents own their own business so they were able to take time out of the schedule to drive me an hour to practice every yeah. single day so yeah i did that but it was always good i always played a year up and you know i was always good and then my parents weren't crazy though they 
I played hockey from September to March and played baseball. So you weren't you weren't a summer hockey tournament. I was not. My parents maybe when I was thirteen or fourteen years old, I played one tournament a year, and I was like right at the end of the year. But other than that. I loved hockey. Always knew I wanted to play hockey, but I enjoyed playing baseball. I was going to ask you: Would you have rather gone pro in baseball or hockey? But hockey's the answer. I love baseball, but I just didn't have the art for it. baseball. Used to get me so mad. Power hitter, slap hitter, but power line drive. <laughs> Use opposite field. I was going with the pitch. I'm a lefty, so I went left center. I wasn't a pole hitter. Yep, yeah. But uh, the thing about baseball I didn't like was like. If you made a mistake, you couldn't do anything about it. In hockey, you can at least run someone from behind or <laughs> talk shit to someone. But Paros is listening to this. In, in, like, in baseball, check. it's like you got to wait for your next opportunity. So I went through probably hundreds of pairs of batting gloves, maybe a few broken knuckles from the dugout. But, you know. <laughs> so uh, so when you, you were playing for the junior Bruins, your family was commuting an hour and a half every day for practice? Well, yeah, it was about a little over an hour. Because when I was out there, um, I never had my license. I played at New England Sports Center from – second grade till 10th grade and then i went to the national team so yeah my my credit my parents is everything they were able to take time out of their schedule to uh to bring me there were you still in ann arbor then i was in ann arbor uh yeah junior senior year so was it it wasn't they had yeah, it they was hadn't moved to plymouth yet. yeah i think they moved maybe a couple years after me but yeah pioneer high school alum who were the other big time 94 american born kids we had uh seth jones oh. uh truba Brady Shea, Matt Grizzlick, like almost all of our decors playing in the NHL. Then Ryan Hartman, Intracop. Oh, sick. Yeah. So it, Yeah, I it, mean, was Truba always that Truba train? Yeah, he was probably one of the first commits. He was he used to decapitate guys. It was insane. <laughs> He's still doing still it. Still doing it. He's playing the same way as he played when he was, what, 16 years yeah. old? Yeah. Yeah. Did it piss you off to not get drafted? Did it like, just like sort of fuel your fight even more after that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was it was definitely tough. I mean, I interviewed with fifteen teams, and I part of part go? of what's that? Did no, you? I didn't go. I think part of the blame was on myself too. I wasn't in the best shape. I didn't take things seriously. So, really, myself, yeah. Um, believe it or not, at eighteen years old, I was two hundred and thirty pounds. Oh my god, yeah. you were a little fat. Wow. So I was a whale. Yeah, <laughs> what? No fucking hey, I, I, no, I tra no training. No training. I was gonna say I saw some like early like interviews with you in the locker room. Like this guy looks a little a little bit chubby. Yeah. Then when I went to Boston, you know, you have no choice but to uh to buy in or else you're not playing. So yeah, you're done. Going to Boston, I knew how to train, knew how to eat. And, you know, it, it was tough at the time, but I mean, that's what you have to do to play in the NHL. Was was it like UMass kind of where you always wanted to go, being from Springfield, or like was that like you didn't have other options? Or you how got, did that work out? You guys are gonna kick out of this. Not many people know the story. So I committed to Boston College at sixteen. Okay, I got kicked out of BC. No shit. I got expelled from BC. Wow. So uh, I committed to BC at sixteen and went to the national program. I wasn't the best best uh, student. Okay, I had a two point one GPA in high school. Oof. Just just so obviously, by the way, at Pioneer High or Huron High. That's yeah. like that's like a, a point eight. So with the NCAA, you have to get your ACT and uh, SAT scores. You have to have a, if your GPA is low, there's like a sliding scale. So you need like a twenty four if your GPA is this. So I took the ACT my first time. I got a fourteen on it, which I think you get like thirteen points for signing your name. Yeah, whatever. So I called BC and they're like, "Yeah, I don't think those grades are good enough to get you in school." So I was like, "Okay." So I take the next test. I cheated on it. I got a twenty four on it. Call BC. I was like, hey, this is like January, February. I have to sign my NLI by like March or something. I was like, hey, I got a 24 my ACT. Like, what should I do? I was like, just send the scores in school, but they might investigate your scores because you jump so high. Don't hear anything of it. Month goes by. ACT contacts me. You're being accused of cheating, blah, blah, blah. Write a letter back while you did better. Write the letter back. They denied it. So it's like April now. I was supposed to sign my NLI like a month ago. So I was like, you need to take another test. So I was like, all right, I'll just take the SAT. Took the SAT. I got a 1550 on it. Not bad. No. That's which, pretty good. I think. Which was equivalent to my 24 in the ACT. Call BC. Hey, I got a 1550 SAT, as I told you guys before. My ACT scores are getting- And you didn't uh, cheat on that one? No. So my ACT scores were invalid. You guys already know this. I have the test scores to get in. They were like, okay, send those in. We'll see you in September when we get there. So I'm at school. I'm at BC. I do rookie party. I'm doing classes. Practice. No games yet. No games. Practice. I was there for a month practicing i get called off the ice by the coach he's like hey what happened to your act scores i was like you guys have been knowing about this for five or six months now like i told you what happened They're like oh okay 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 another week goes by hey so what actually happened to the act scores I was like i told you guys i studied i just did better They're like no i know you cheated i was like i didn't cheat so i just denied 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 they got no proof yeah but at 18 years old and like you're young you're nervous you don't want to lie to your coach i was like yeah i cheated on one section They're like okay it's happened to players in the past 
Like, we'll get you out of it, blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, I trust you. So in order to go with, uh, to, I would have had the red shirt at BC that year because my scores were in too late. So just deadlines and stuff, which I was bummed about. But I was like, all right, whatever. Bite the bullet for a year in red shirt. So in order to do that, I had to go through admissions again at BC. <laughs> oh, oh, no. And I barely did it the first nightmare. time. So NCAA nightmare. was fine with me red shirting at BC, but admissions had to be okay with it. So I'm going into the, me and Jerry York have to go to the Dean of Admissions and tell him what happened. So I probably are in, in there. I'd probably tell my side of the story for 15, 20 seconds before I can get everything out. Dean of Admissions like, yeah, um, this happened to a non-athlete last year, so we're going to have to let you go. No way. And I'm just like- You crushed. At the time, I'm like, like holy, like, what the fuck is going to happen now? You know what I mean? And then I literally went to my room, packed my bags, done 20 minutes, my cousin Barry Almeida actually was in Boston at the time, picked me up and drove me home. Like Holy just, shit. And then after that, I had my transfer penalty started and I had to get into uh, UMass by January. I actually, so my freshman year was 2012, 13. I sat out, re, transferred to UMass in January. I sat out, didn't play all 20, 20, 2012, 13, didn't play 13, 14 and played 14, 15. And signed Is that how you got the 230? Yeah, just lifting weights. <laughs> so you didn't play a game for like two years. Wow, dude, yep. that's a, that's a kick in the dick development wise. Yeah, for sure, and especially, you know, I probably would have been drafted after playing that year. Yeah, to see if I played a year, and you know, everything happens for a reason. I'm obviously at the time it sucked, but I'm glad it happened. It you know it teaches how to deal with a lot of first. How uh, like, how does go. one cheat? And yeah. they said it was on one section, so you only did it on one section. Was it a written part? It was just, it's A, B, C, D, fill in the bubble. So so how did you know? He went like this. Like that. <laughs> like that. That's it. Although I actually uh, thought that they had different tests, so like you couldn't do that. I, I thought they did too. Oh, you just not. risked it. Yeah. So, so people are listening right now. When you look over, you mean you look over at the next person's answer? Yeah, you get the eyes going. You just get the peripherals going. Classic cheating. Oh, you make, you're making it sound like like this is like rocket science. Like cheating like how you look at the other person's test no no i just i guess i was a little confused as to how it all went down now you're saying that they they looked it up to the person you yeah so they they look if you increase in scores even if you don't cheat they still investigate it so they can say whatever they want um they said my whatever i was test taker c your answers were similar to test taker d's answers but i was a smart cheater usually you know got, you, got, you got that one okay i'll I'll make sure I'll fill in this one. <laughs> Can't the same pattern going. Well, oh, when you finally get to play at UMass, I think you know, like twenty goals, and and it was it was that big of a year. We're like, all right, well, I'm undrafted. I could sign with anyone. I'm ready to go. Yeah. the The thing about it was Boston. It was probably December, January, and and uh, Don Sweeney called my agent and was like, "Hey, at the end of the year, Frankie wants to turn pro. Uh, we'd love to sign him." And that, I mean, I didn't expect that at all. I was yeah. having a good year, but I didn't think I'd be a one and done kind of guy. Um, well, it was three and done, but <laughs> three and done. So basically, I was a senior, but I was a freshman. Man, wild. I can relate. Um, but yeah, uh, I think being undrafted and you get the opportunity to sign and play in the NHL, you never know if the opportunity come across it again. And for it to be in Boston, even if it was anywhere, but for, for, for it to be in Boston made it extra special. And I knew it was something that I had to do and had to do it right away. Was it harder to stay focused because it was the home team? Like, yeah, probably a lot of buddies asking you for tickets and asking you to go out and grab pops. Like, was it hard to kind of dial it in? Because you hear about guys who even like go back home to play and they get overwhelmed by the experience. Yeah, I always tell everyone, I wish I played in Boston later in my career. Um, for me, I don't really get distracted by that stuff. I like, I love having buddies around, hanging out with them, um, my family around and asking for tickets. Like, I don't mind that stuff, but. I think to be away from home when you're playing the NHL is you don't have to worry about as much stuff, like you said. Um, like I wish I played there later on in my career uh, before I kind of figured out my game and how to how to play in the league. Obviously, there is some pressure too with the media being a hometown kid and all that stuff. And Boston's nuts with the media, as everyone knows. So yeah, um, as much as you say you tune out the media out, if you go five, ten games without a goal or a point, you know that they're talking about you regardless. Yeah, of looking it up. You well, said, you know, well, you said before you figure it out, like, what do you think was the biggest thing that you needed to learn at the NHL level? Like, what was the hardest for you to grasp? Was it maybe like the defensive side of the game? Like where to find your spots to score in? Like, what was the hardest thing? Yeah. I mean, you can score goals at every single level and you get to the NHL and it's a different animal. Like people, so hard. people don't understand how Time and hard it is to score zero. in this league and how to be consistent every single night. And I was always a goal scorer. So, and I was either finding you know, areas to score goals or 
it's all about opportunity too. And, you know, if you're not getting power play time, you, scoring even strength in the NHL isn't easy. So you're going to go five or 10 games without a, without a goal or a point, but what are you going to do if you're not scoring goals? So for me, I kind of had to change my role and be a little bit more of a prick to play against, finish every hit, chirp guys, try to be alive, block shots, finish hits. So it's some guys can't figure that out. And for me, I knew I wanted to play in the NHL and I was going to do whatever, whatever it took to stay. Now, you've always had like, a big shot like a, one of the top shots in the league like every kid grows up shooting pucks but were you like extra about that or is that something that came natural like this release you have it just allows you to not need as much time and space to get it off and score as a kid i would always be on the drive with just my brothers beating the shit out of me or just playing horse or are you younger brother i'm the youngest of four so oh, oh, oh. Uh, we'd be on the drive with just doing like stupid stuff like that but i never really shot pucks as a kid i shot street hockey balls really so my release is a little bit different i think it's all credit to shooting street hockey balls Huh. just having to like because you can't sweep it like a regular wrist shot you have to just kind of snap it and that's how i shoot the puck every shot i usually takes a snapshot and i really a wrist shot so yeah i credit to using as huh. crazy as it sounds shooting uh street hockey balls so being the youngest of four just getting pounded on cold fat pounded on <laughs> loogies in the face fuck, uh, beef stew everything you name beat it. up any of them no nothing <laughs> That's awesome. Say beef. Would you say beef? Yeah. You ever seen bench warmers? And they fart in the kids' Oh, face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, I was a younger brother, so I, yeah. I can relate. Uh, I just want to yeah, quickly yeah, just yeah. go back to Boston because we'd already kind of mentioned it. Like being able to play there, though, around those guys and just kind of learn that pro game. Like, I don't know, like maybe you got like a Char story or Bergeron story about just like the impact they had on you during your time there. Huge. I think going through it now in anaheim like i get asked a question all the time like are there any guys that you you know credit your not success but how you had to become an nhl every day and i was i credit those those core four guys Cratch, z and bergy and marsh the way those guys treat their bodies and interact with people and how they go about their business every single day is that's how you should that's how you be a full-time nhl that's how you train that's how you treat people and when I got, I was fortunate enough to have those guys to lead lead the right way and show you the right way. And I try to do as most as I can for the young guys on our team now. But having those four guys there was was huge for me, showing me what to do every single day. You you, you left school and played a couple of games in the AHL right away. But the next year, your first year pro, you had thirty six goals in thirty six games in the AHL. Like, are you like, when am I getting called up? Like, what else do I need to do here? Yeah, I, uh, that was a crazy year. Game easy I, I for made, you there, quick. Yeah, did I had a great team, great power play, and. Our team in Providence is unbelievable. And was Josh Hennessy there then? He was not. Okay. No, he wasn't. But uh yeah, I mean, I, I had so much fun playing the American Hockey League. Like obviously when you play in the NHL and you see the paychecks, you don't want to go back down. And um I went back down, but I had fun going to back down to Providence and whatnot. And the, what the, no bad attitude then. No, I never had a bad attitude. Obviously, I was like, oh, shit, I want to be up and called up. And I'd never forget I went <laughs> one time uh, just being a young guy in the NHL, you know you the GM always tells you stuff. They kind of control you for the first yeah. four or five years until you have your own rights and stuff with free agency. But I think we were playing Portland Pirates and we won 3-2. I had a natural hat trick. I had three goals. And I remember after I thought I had a great game and I come down to the locker room after the game. And Sweeney's like, hey, great game, but you still need to work on your D zone. I was like, all right. You're like, wow. <laughs> I was like, okay, shit, dad. Am I ever going to get called up again? <laughs> you know? I, I know you had uh, Julian and Cassidy when you were in Boston. Two guys, not exactly, uh, I'd say, favorite young guys. Did it get frustrated at all? Did you maybe think you had, should have been getting a better chance out of those guys? Or did, were you treated fairly, you thought? Yeah, I thought I was treated fairly. Uh, Chloe was obviously a little different. He was there and won and had his guys, had his core guys. And obviously, he was a more of an old school coach and um, and whatnot. But he was good. He was great to me. Um now, as a young guy, you don't really get communication as much. And but but with Butchie, I had him in Providence, and uh, he was great. One of the smartest coaches I've ever played for. Uh, then I had him in Boston, and you know I don't know what happened, but things a little changed a little bit. Obviously, he's I think he's a great coach. Um, he's won in Vegas and and all that stuff. But no, he was a great coach. I've never seen a guy that can read the game like him, X's and O's wise. Really? Yeah, he's. Uh, I've never seen. He's a head coach and does the power play the way he can dissect other teams' PKs in order to. You know, kind of use other plays to your advantage. He's so smart in that aspect of the game. Were you pissed off when they traded you to Florida? Just you know, again being a local kid and all. I was ecstatic. Actually. Oh, really? oh really? yeah, yeah. I was gonna say you yeah. watch watching you in the Bruins. Like, never really got a top six chance. Yeah. So in terms of getting traded, like, all right, I'm gonna get a role now. Yeah, I'm so fortunate for Dale Talon. You know Dale. Yes. He's such a loyal guy. I had him at World Championships after my first year uh, in Boston, and he loved me as a player. And um, 
it was kind of behind the scenes thing, but I know they were trying to trade for me all year, the last year at my entry level. And I knew it was definitely one of the teams that wanted to, to you know, trade for me and put me in a, a role to succeed. And, and he did that. And I was fortunate enough to go there and sign a three-year deal and he knew what kind of player I was. So credit to him for, you know, seeing that in me. What's cool is that like he, he wanted you as a player, you go there and then after you know, that season ends that you got traded, boom, next year, 24 goals. Like everything kind of went the way he saw it and you saw it. Yeah, too. absolutely. I mean, I credit him with all my success to, you know, to seeing that player in me and put me in a role to succeed. He's one of the most loyal guys I've ever met in hockey. He always wants his players that he has, uh, that he signs and trades for to do well. You know, if things aren't going well for you, he'll always try to find a place for you to succeed. And uh, that's, that's all you ask for as a player is someone that cares about you, not just as a hockey player, but as a human being. Yeah. Uh, just with New York, I know you were there only a short time, but fuck, man, playing an MSG, you get to play playoffs there. Like that's like what prime time. That's the, that, that's that's the climax. Everyone always asks me, "How was it playing New York?" I go, "That's that's playing in the NHL." <laughs> just uh, just the whole persona of New York City, and you know, you're coming up Manhattan, and you see MSG, and you see how busy it is, and all the blue shirts, and just everything about it is first class the way that they treat you in the organization like they don't cut corners on anything and um you know in order to you know to go to the conference finals and play at msg and we went uh game six we almost we went two game sevens and to see that building during game sevens is one of the coolest things i've ever been a part of were you hoping to maybe resign there and like obviously they got some money things there but i don't know how that free agency went yeah i mean i uh, peter fish is you know obviously him and drew are you guys so i knew drew before i even went to new york and I obviously have an exit meeting with him at the end of the year. I wanted to go back. And at the end of the day, you know, you can't have everything. And obviously sometimes the money thing, the business side of things don't work out. And he was straightforward with me. He was like, I don't know. We have to sign some so-and-so. And, um, but if there's some money left over that, you know, you, your appeals to you, we'd love to have you back. But sometimes that's just not how it works out. And you got to get your payday too. Exactly. So I was, um, I was fortunate enough. Anaheim was the second, it was first or second team on the list that I wanted to go to if I wasn't going back to New York. So, um I'm, I'm thrilled to be in anaheim now uh i think we got to talk about anaheim and all the young prospects right like you've played a lot of places where you got there and these guys were established but you're kind of the veteran now and you got these young guys coming up like mctavish unreal he's a bulldog like, like who's impressed you the most and, and where do you think this team can like get to with all these young guys in the pipeline yeah the young guys that they've drafted and whoever they've gotten through trades are they're so talented the way these kids can play at 18 years old now is it's bizarre it's scary like think about what i was doing at 18 years old to see you were 250 guys, well, <laughs> well, 230 and take out chinese food <laughs> but uh, Mardi Gras. yeah the gras <laughs> eating your beef tips <laughs> stirring up beef curtains <laughs> but uh, no leo carlson's 18 like this guy's gonna be i don't even want to know what this guy's gonna be like in two or three years like, he's, he's a fucking he's, he's a monster he's too huge killorn was saying his like hip plates aren't even yeah they're saying grown. his growth plates haven't fully grown in like this kid's probably what six six two six three he hasn't even grown in his body and then you have mac T mac t who's 21 going on 40 he's, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's old school huh? yeah, he's a 215 tank. pound just an absolute animal and then we just called up zellweger like he's unbelievable he got his first point the other yeah, day, right? He's like the win. Like yep. Quarterback, like definition of a quarterback on the power play. Then you have Leno, who's uh, who's going to be unbelievable. Mintikov, like you name it. You just go down the list. Like our, our prospects, our D prospects and forward prospects. And now I great. saw Gauthier the other night. Yeah. That kid's going to be legit too. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I've heard great things about him. So he'd definitely be a good piece to add to Anaheim. I'm excited to have him. Uh, the, the Mintikov kid, that was like right off the hop. Like we're talking about all these rookies. Like- he looks like a seasoned vet too. Like it's crazy this, to just to see how many guys are coming up that in the next two, three years, like there's going to be a wagon growing there. Yeah. I mean, I think every single defense that we have is a puck moving defense. Yeah. And that's so important in the NHL, especially as forwards. Like we want to be out there with guys who keep the puck out of that, but also a guy that can move the puck up the ice. And that's what we have. I think we have the OHL defensive player of the year, the Q, QMJ defensive player of the year, and the dub defensive player of the year. All three of those guys last year. And then you just got rid of a, a stud on the yeah, back. Tries to, yeah, Yeah. Was that hard? He seemed like a very likable guy. Was very close with, the, with like all the young guys too. Yeah, Jimmy, that that kid's the best. He's such a good kid. He's unbelievable hockey player. Really? Um, obviously, the news wasn't, it was tough. No one expected it. Um, but you know, we said, you know, you're going to a place that wants you. And 
you're going to go with them being created NHL or it sucks at the time. I go, even once you get to Philly, you're going to forget all about it. That's just the business side of things. You know, they don't take it to heart. It's just how things work in this league. And as a young kid, you don't understand it. But as you get older, you understand how things work in the league. And, um, but yeah, I'm thrilled for him to be in Philly. He's playing in a big market now and I know he's happy there. I see. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, but, uh, I was just going to ask about Cronin, like an intense dude. Um, is that blood pressure? Or is he tanning? What's up? What's up with the gold? Why, he's, he's got so those red. gold glasses too. Those, he, like, those I, Armani. He's, he's, yeah, I don't know what they're. I gotta look <laughs> next time. He surfs, so maybe he's getting the sun for, for sure. sure. It's a tan, then. Yeah. But yeah, he is uh, the definition of intense. Uh, he expects a lot of out of us as players. Um, really dissects the game, whether it's X and O's or little parts of the games. Um, keeps you on your toes for sure. Make sure you're paying attention in meetings, uh, paying attention to details in uh, practice, but. Uh, for him, he just wants the best out of everyone, especially with a younger team. He wants to develop those guys the right way and making sure they're not slacking and trying to teach them how to be professionals every single day. So, and hiring, I think that was the whole process of hiring him was making sure he's holding guys accountable, and making sure we're playing the right way. Is Verbeek um, one of those GMs who's talking to guys, or is he more just kind of out of? The I heard picture? he's fucking hardcore, intense. Yeah, he's definitely super old school. He's intense. Um, expects a lot out of us. He's kind of stays behind the scenes a little okay. bit. He doesn't really interact with the team much. Um, he does a lot of scouting. He's always trying to make the team better. Uh, he's always somewhere. And uh, but no, um, good relation. Most players have good relationships with him. But but for the most part, he stays behind the scenes. Frank, I saw that clip of you uh, a couple weeks ago uh, last week. Uh, Zellweger was going out for his rookie lap, and you know I know you check with uh, Gibson, the goalie first. Then you said go head out. So it seems like you really taken on like a leadership role with the squad. Is this the first team you've been you would consider yourself a big leader on the Ducks? Yeah, especially with how young we are. Our age gap is we have eighteen year olds, and we have. Henrik's in 91 <laughs> everyone acts like he's 50 years old he's only 32 years old <laughs> so it's like whatever yeah I mean I try to just give to them what was given to me as a, as a rookie making sure you're including them taking them out to dinners and make sure you're just treating them well and making them feel welcome especially as an 18 year old and living on your own it's not easy making sure we include them in everything that we're doing with the older guys at home it's a little bit different everyone goes home to wives and kids but on the road we try to include them as much as possible do you uh do you get after zegris quite a bit because you mentioned the coach is hardcore make sure you're, you're paying attention and all, all dialed in all the time does he have a hard time with that being a young guy no he's Maybe. good he's uh there's been some meetings where that don't go so well not just for him but for all of us <laughs> so definitely uh that was eye-opening for him and a lot of us what do you mean he'll just like all of a sudden quiz you and then you'll be like ah. a lot of rhetorical questions in video that's a panic for me. Oh, yeah. I don't know I, what to I, say. I hate rhetorical questions. <laughs> what were you thinking here? Like, what's our system in this situation? Just And then he'll call your name out and ask you for it. But uh, no, just if you have like a little play in the game, like you're, you will see it in front of the entire team. Oh, he's and showing everyone. He's showing everyone all the clips and stuff. And I've, I've had coaches that done that in the past. They used to call my seat in Boston the, the, the hot seat. Uh, oh, sorry, not the hot seat, the roast seat. <laughs> so I, every video session with Bruce Cassidy was kind of a roast session. Oh, he, yeah. He and here's hard. Frankie yeah. again. What the fuck? I'm trying to go like this yeah. in my seat. <laughs> the 280-pound dot in the yeah, screen right there. He hey, what were, you, what were you thinking here? How's it going? I don't know. <laughs> Try, was it? Trying to survive out here. Yeah. <laughs> what's that? What's this thing about a day in the life video at UMass that we hear about? What's that all about? Oh, Yan shirts me for it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I was like 18 years old. I was like 230 pounds and showing this like interview uh, interviewing of my hometown and showing like all my high school and the angel always tell you no one's ever heard of the tornado and the tornado that happened in massachusetts was in springfield and it knocked down your high school he goes that just doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> <laughs> but he always like yeah uh, pizza's my favorite food here he always yans always says that to me that's what i said in the interview <laughs> and i had like in the video i had like cotton mouth so i had like spit like hanging right here oh, so yeah. he just yans <laughs> will like send it to me randomly like you won't talk to yans for like a month or two months then he'll just send you like a random clip or like a random asking you a random question it's yeah he's, he's the best and then you'll respond and he won't respond yeah then back. he won't respond back <laughs> yeah, he's a space cadet. Uh, speaking yeah. of random they had the uh, the draft last night for the all-star game now the last four guys that i guess they gave you like a randomly assigned uh picture but you didn't know who it was and that's how you found out what team you were on yeah so was that kind of like so they didn't like have one guy be last that hurt his feelings it was kind of seemed like a weird way to do it yeah i guess that's just how things are you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings are yeah you on, uh, age, are you on tate mccray's team no, I'm on uh, Michael Bublé. Oh, buddy, Ooh. he was on shrooms. I, I know. People were sending me all the clips. I had no idea. He, he took. Uh, he thought he took a micro dose, and then he took a a, a, oh. a major dose. Oh, so he was whacked out there. Yeah, he was I talking mean, a lot last night, but I wasn't. You couldn't hear anything on the ice. I, I, I thought it really. made no, it. He didn't. You couldn't he hear didn't anything. Give a shit. He was mucking it up with reporters. He was taking the mic. I think he called Brock Besser's name wrong at the wrong time. He gave him a a song, but 
I, th- I think it's good for the league. It's great. Yeah, yeah. As much publicity as we can have, it's, it's awesome. You ever taken shrooms before? <laughs> no. <laughs> Panic attacks, man. <laughs> Pizza and beer. Pizza did, you, and beer. did you score the other day and chuck your stick in the crowd? Yeah, that was actually more of a frustration. Really? You were just finally like it went in? Yeah, it was like six or seven games without a goal and- I was like, scored all star break. This stick's getting. I, I need to get rid of the stick. Did you kind of like it. cringe a little after like you were gonna hit someone and they look like? No, I mean no. maybe I'll have a lawsuit waiting for me in Anaheim when I get back. But <laughs> this thing would have touched the three hundreds. I took my two fingers and launched it like right out of there. I know it's a <laughs> hilarious clip. You just look. You look like mad, but you just scored a goal. That yeah. makes sense though. Is there uh, is there any guy at the all star game you kind of? I wouldn't say fanboy over, but you're just like ah, oh, maybe a little bit intimidated to meet him. Like who were the who were maybe the older guys you looked up to like Sid? I, yeah, Sid was my guy growing up. That's who I looked up to. Um, he was my favorite player growing up, and obviously I've heard guys that play with him. He said he's an unbelievable guy and and whatnot. So yeah, definitely a guy I'm excited to meet and excited to be around. Who do you think the best player in the league is right now? Connor McDavid. You don't th- thank you, don't, you. Not McKinnon. I, so it's different for me. I bet if you ask people that play in the Central Division, they'll play. They'll say McKinnon, but I play against McDavid four times a year, and it's just like I've never. You like, get me off the ice. There's get me nothing. The ice. There's literally nothing you can do to stop him. It's <laughs> know, he's it's playing not. in a different league. It's like you can't. You try to do whatever. Like you can't. You just can't stop him. Like it's. Yeah, that's you guys will talk in the room about it, being like, "Who's got him?" Guys are like, "Guy, like there'll be shifts sometime. And he'll have the puck and be like, well, you, what are you supposed to do? Like, you can't. You actually can't just tighten up. I know. I tighten know. it up. If the, co- it if the up. coach is like, "Hey, better gap," you're like, "But you like, once know. you start gapping, he's he's by you." And you're like, you're known for your wheels, but like, even you, you're probably like, it's him. It's like, it's not even like speed wise. It's just the way you can change gears. Like, you'll literally, yeah. he'll have you going this way before you even react to this way. He's already this way. It's in your back at Mardi Gras. Yeah. <laughs> You're basically on Team Canucks. I think there's five Canucks on Team Hughes tonight. Anybody uh, you want to skate with that get you a couple of nice setup passes? Maybe Cooch? Yeah. Everyone wants to play with Cooch. One of the best players That's in right. the league, right? So Absolutely. hopefully, uh, maybe I'll be in a checking line role. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> what about what about Summers? Are you back to Springfield? Yeah, back in Springfield. Uh, and when you retire, you'll be back at Springfield too? Probably there and or back in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, I have a Florida place for yeah, the winter. Yeah, I loved it in Florida. Did you buy and then keep the house or were you renting? So I bought the I bought the place in Florida. Then I actually sold it before I was traded. I sold it that last year in my contract. Probably made a killing though. Yeah, especially bef- I bought my house before COVID and then just oh. see what's happened in Florida after COVID. Crazy. It's insane. The prices. I was looking in like just the Delray area. Like, yeah, Delray is unbelievable. You, you, it's, I love it there, but you look, you're like, oh, this place in three million bucks like, i think that's a tear down you should be able to get like a house for like a million bucks like whatever perfect nice yeah now you can't even touch anything under like two million it's have crazy. you bought in uh cdm i bought in cdm nice I, yep it's a good spot uh, especially in california you can't go wrong the real estate's always up and coming there and yeah there's there's the sh- how to uh housing shortage too so made sure i buy i wasn't paying you know a hundred thousand dollars in rent <laughs> <laughs> so you, Art. you actually grew up is it east long meadow or west wait, grew up in east long meadow mass yeah okay i wasn't sure if it was actually springfield or not that's a little born in Mass-ville, springfield right? i told everyone i'm from springfield okay yeah so you mentioned your cousin barry is is that the he had the eye yeah the, he did it's a crazy story his cousin was a hell of a player was it a campfire yeah he was it was actually i think it might have been the year before he was he was probably would have been drafted smaller smaller guy kevin uh, hayes told me he was sick bro. yeah he uh was at a graduation party and a, a glass bottle exploded in his eye out and, of a campfire. Uh, yeah. So like he had to get eye surgeries, blind in one eye. And uh, yeah, just 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 wow. terrible situation. Wrong place at the wrong time. And you know, credit for him though, he's he he had himself a hell of a career. He won what I think it was two national championships at BC. Um, a chance to play in the HL on the East Coast and you know, for someone to do that one eye, I can't even imagine. I can barely see with two eyes, let alone. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's what your wingers say. Yeah, I know. Well, buddy, this has yeah. been awesome. We appreciate yeah, sitting yeah. down with you, man. Congratulations on your first All Star game, and you guys are going to have a wagon in a few years in Anaheim. And you know, when you guys are there, we'd like to get you back on and, and talk about that. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Love it. All right. Before we go any further, here's a few words from our good friends over at Sport Clips. Hey, you know. Your hair may grow fast, but after going to Sport Clips haircuts, you wish it grew even faster. I got one of these bad boys right across the street from me. The place is unreal, and that's because Sport Clips has the best seats in here. And that may or may not be because they happen to be in front of TVs playing sports all day, every day, whether it's highlights, live games, whatever. Boom, 
You're going to get your sports. at sport clips. Now, we know that watching sports while getting a haircut sure beats watching a reflection getting a haircut. I know that in my case for sure. Which is why at Sport Clips, every day is clippers and curveballs, high tops and Hail Marys, and even waves and wickets. You know, if you're into that kind of thing. But at Sport Clips, you can check in with the pros in men's hair and totally check out with pure, uninterrupted relaxation. So, yeah, come watch an endless stream of sports on TV while getting an awesome haircut. Like I said, I got one right across the street here. Place is unreal. Staff is unreal. You sit there nice and comfy. Oh, almost fall asleep in that chair. Sport Clips, it's a game changer. Thank you so much to Springfield's own Frank Vetrano. What a guy. What a career he's given himself. So we appreciated him hopping on at the All-Star Game. Uh, we're on to another story, guys. As the Philadelphia Flyers make this magical run to the playoffs, well, unfortunately, they're in a little bit of a skid, but they have some goaltending help on the way. And for anyone who's unaware of the story of Ivan Fedotov, and I hope I'm saying his last name correctly, it's a wild one. Now, this kid's a Russian goalie, six foot seven, could be one of the tallest goalies to ever play. Made in a and lab. In, in um, obviously a Russian guy. And 21 22 season, he played for CSKA Moscow. And the Flyers signed him to a one year contract in May of 2022. And he's getting ready to play and he's training in St. Petersburg, his home city. And boom, he's snapped up by the Russian police. And he was sent to the Russian military on an aircraft carrier near the Russian Finnish border for a season. No hockey. Working on an aircraft carrier as part of a Russian, I guess, military. Uh, they have Some to do that. Right. What's shit. it, what's Some it shady called? Shit. They, yeah, shady it's shit. The exa- <laughs> it, it's, yeah, so everyone who complains, USA sucks. Give Russia a try because they'll snatch you out of the way a contract and stick you on an aircraft carrier. So this That's guy... Cool. Is stuck. And then apparently after the year away, he's already signed a one year NHL contract. Well, no, no hockey that season. So then he's coming back to play the next season. And they told him this year you should play for CSK Moscow. He was kind of pushed towards playing for the Russian Red Army team. Well, he went and had a solid season. I think he was 21 and 20. Not not really as good of a numbers as maybe the year prior or the two years prior when he signed the deal. And it was a two year contract in the KHL. But Nobody really knows. I don't know if you've read anything, R.A., in terms of why Seska agreed to terminate the deal, but immediately he was brought over to Philadelphia. He's there now. Now, there's about eight games left, so this is his one-year deal. Briere's already talked about getting him re-signed on a two-year extension, hopefully quick, but as the Flyers have hit the shitter and they're struggling with, with, with Samuel Urson, and, and, and they lost Carter Hart. Right. So all of a sudden they need this guy to come in. I don't know if he'll possibly play in the biggest game of the season tonight. You're listening Tuesday morning, but Monday night, Flyers Islanders. Flyers can bury the Islanders. This can be the end of the Long Island team. The Long Island Island, the strong Island Islanders could be done after tonight. I don't know if we'll see Fedotov, but if he can come in and make an impact, and, and what a story this would be. The kid has to miss hockey for a season. If he comes in, lights it up. And then they go on a little bit of run. It would be incredible. I'm happy oh, yeah. for the kid. Torts he has finally to, gets to come over. Torts has to fucking play him next Oh, game. yeah. You think I mean, Torts not going to unleash the Rooski? Are you what, out of your you? mind, yeah. Woody? I mean, Woody, he's, tw- he's 27 years old. He was the KHL's best goalie two years ago. Won the, uh, is it Gagarin? Is that how you say it? Gagarin Cup? Well, he's basically the Russian Stanley Cup. I mean, this guy's got a hell of a pedigree, man. I, I don't know how you don't throw him out there next Oh, game. I should I put agree. the Russian national anthem right before the game to get him fucking like, going right now. I'm sure that would go over well with, with the social justice warriors. Remember, remember by when the we way, had Andre Ron? Friday night. Hey, by the way. This guy gives up three in the first and comes into torts. He may be fucking wishing he was back on that aircraft no, carrier in Siberia. No, I have to He'd be say scared. the same thing McGillney did to Keenan. He goes, you think I'm fucking scared of you? You know the shit that I've seen? That's what. No, I'm not kidding. Right. I, I forget who told me the story. Was it, oh, was it Ronick? Somebody told Maybe, us. Yeah, it, yeah there's it, an old story for those of you who yeah. haven't heard it. I think we've told it a few times on the yes. pod. Mike Keenan came in and started giving it to Alexander Mogilny, and he just says, fuck off, bro. You don't know what the fuck I've been through. Get out of my but kitchen. But it, cool uh, it was cool to hear Briere talk about what this kid's gone through and how hard he's worked. I mean, taking a year off hockey at 26 years old, like – you got to be constantly, when he wasn't doing his Russian obligations, his, his uh, uh, 
whatever, military. Ar- army obligations. I'm sure he's like maybe watching video if he was allowed to do that, working out. Like th- this kid deserves to get a chance. Fucking and, right. And I'm, I'm rooting for him because so am I. For, to get dragged away from the game at the peak of your career, right? As you sign an NHL deal. I hope he com- I hope he plays tonight. I don't I haven't seen the goaltending matchups, but a really cool story for him to finally get over and give it a shot. All right, Fucking you're gonna right. be hammering the fires tonight. Ah, uh, feast that definitely seventh round pick back in twenty fifteen too, man. So waited a long time for this. Uh also we gotta we gotta give John Carlson a shout out. He's a, a alumni of the Chicklet Show. Uh he became I'm sorry, the latest member of the one thousandth NHL Games Club, uh the sixtieth player and ninth defenseman to score in his one thousandth game. Uh, he tied the game in the second period with he also tied Kevin Hatcher for most goals by a defenseman in team history with 149. You know what else is also weird about uh Carlson? Most Goals by a defenseman born in Massachusetts. Pretty crazy stat. In huh? NHL history. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah. I, uh, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. More I than Brian. Yeah. Wow. More than Brian. Brian Leach, Leach isn't uh, from Massachusetts. Wow. That's, guy, that's, guy, that's a cool he? stat. Even though Carlson, I don't even know if he played youth hockey around here. No, we, we it, talked about it but, when we had him on yes. uh, years ago. Yeah. Yes. But just, I mean, it jumped out at me, too, because I thought Rod, Rod Langway right away, like, you know, as far as a defenseman, an American defenseman. But. I'll tell you what, we talked a lot about how ridiculous this season is and how it makes no sense with the Capitals. But I, I kept forgetting they lost him last year. They were going fine when they had him and he broke his jaw and everything fell apart. So having him back now, granted, the numbers are wild and it still makes no sense. The Capitals are in the spot they're in. But having him just in the locker room alone. That's a huge difference. That guy's the man. He's an animal to play against. I, I remember when he came into the AHL early and he was dominating down there. I think they won the Calder Cup. I'm like, who is this kid? And he's just become a star in the NHL. So do you congrats think to that, him. Do you think that they moved on from Mike Green because he was coming up? Or did that was that crossover not a thing? Oh, man. They might Mike have Green, over quick. but They had such a good offensive defenseman in Green who I think the one year oh. had 30, 35 goals. And uh, and all of a sudden it was you know it was John Carlson's time. So just, Green uh, broke the record. Remember he broke the record for goal, consecutive games with a goal by a defenseman. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, remember, yeah. remember twenty four seven wit when he was like he had like was he a Jesus on with a fucking scooter driving to practice in like a blizzard. Oh yeah. <laughs> Carlson <laughs> did play with Green. Okay. Is his, so maybe yeah, yeah maybe, maybe that, that yeah. Was so kinda... Green's last year with Washington. He had 72 games, played 45 points. That season, Carlson had 82 games, 55 points. And that was Carlson's fifth year. They played together a while, actually. Yeah, they played together five years old. Okay, yeah. I, I, I room with Green at uh, under 18 for Team Canada. What a guy. I would love to get him on the podcast. Fucking Big tattoo guy. I think he's got like, classic cars. He's a, an, an interesting cat. In- Dude, interesting he went... Case he went his his second full year in the NHL, fifty six points, seventy three points, seventy six points. Like he was, yeah. Green was a offensive machine. guy. He was a machine with those stealths. Anyway, uh, ARA another thousand games. This one's tough, and I'm not chirping I him. Know. I think Skinner's the best. Like he seems like such a happy guy. He does the. He's doing those silly videos for Buffalo too. Between two, is it between two benches? What's the name of it? It's like a knockoff of between two thir- uh, ferns, but. He's going to hit his thousandth game. He's never played a playoff game, guys. Oh. That's fucked. That's fucked. Yeah. Yeah. That, I that's, feel that, so bad for him. That's tough. And I, I know that that uh, big head account put a, a tweet out. They're, they're pretty good about it. I thought it was kind of mean. They they listed like every single game. He didn't have a playoff game after all 1,000 of them. But yeah, uh, Jeff Skinner, he's going to play his 1,000th NHL game tonight. Uh, unfortunately, he holds the record of playing the most NHL games without ever appearing in a playoff game. Uh, his first eight seasons were in Raleigh with the uh, Hurricanes. No playoffs there. Last six in Buffalo. Of course, Buffalo was going on 13 years uh, without a playoff fucking appearance since 07. Last time they had won a playoff series. Uh, the previous record, Biz, was Ron Hainsey. He had 907 regular season games before he played a playoff game. Two months later, 25 games later, Stanley Cup champion with the Pittsburgh Penguins. So uh, awesome. it can change overnight. And uh, Guy Sharon, he played 734 games back in the 70s with the uh, Canadians, Wings, Kansas City Scouts, and the Capitals never saw a playoff game. How about this? Old Jokinen played 799 games. He actually passed Guy Sharon before he played his first playoff game at Calgary in 09. Old Jokinen, 1,231 games played, Biz. Six playoff games played. And it's it's not a knock on, on a guy like that. It's just, you know, the bad luck of being on tough teams right. and yeah. bouncing around. But and it's and just being like, a cornerstone piece of where that team and he was wants to be a core member. He was great. He was Third awesome. Third overall pick, yeah. 
Awesome in Florida. I, I remember when he got shipped off to Calgary. He played 1,200 games, eh? Yeah, he played. And also, I think he seasons. played when he was 19, 18. And shout out to Ron Hazy. He's helping out with the PA now, too. So he's doing a big things post-career. So those are some interesting nuggets, RA. I love, love single RA. I'm upset. I know. <laughs> hey, I, hey, and there's a lot of jealous people online right now, RA, about the, Ugh. we were talking about doing the game show, and everyone's like, no, I would never watch that. I think they're fucking haters, and I think they're worried uh, about the, you, the fact that you're on the loose now. They're, fu- they're worried about their girls, is what yeah. they're hey, worried last about. Last thing about Skinner before we get to RA's single escapades, because it, it is <laughs> kind of a tough story. Thousand games, amazing milestone, but no playoffs. But once again, let's remind everyone in 1920 and 2021, I think he, he had 14 goals, then seven goals in like 60 games. And he bounced back, dude. Everyone Fucking was right. calling that the worst contract in the league. They were all over him. And he was able to really bounce back and have a couple of real good seasons. So you can't say, hey, it's on you, buddy. You haven't been in the playoffs because of your play. He's had some great years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think back to like like Big Walt, uh, my pal Keith, when he played, he he had bad luck, man. He should have had way more playoff games than me. He was on a Winnipeg team that, that frankly was mediocre for years. And then St. Louis took a while to get chugging. And, you know, Keith had a, a Hall of Fame worthy career with, but he just didn't get the playoff games because of the teams he was on. And yeah. of course, I don't know if you remember back in, I want to say 93, he signed an offer sheet with Chicago. He forced Winnipeg's hand. He's like, he knew he was what he was worth. He went to go get the money and Winnipeg matched it, stripped him of his captaincy. They ended up giving it back. But, you know, some guys, man, they just, you know, it's just shitty luck with, with, with teams they end up on. But, it's certainly not a reflection of the type of player they are, like in, in a perfect example here is Skinner. So uh, also, Biz, we want to send out our best wishes to Ethan Beer. Uh, he stepped away from the Capitals for a bit. He's going to receive some care from the NHL, NHLPA player assistance program. So, uh, you know, anytime guys uh, have the courage to go through that, we yes. have to, you know, wish, the, wish them the best because it's, it's not an easy thing you know, no. when you go through that shit with your own friends and family to, to, to acknowledge. So let alone the whole fucking world. So it's not an easy thing for guys, whatever they're going through. So we just want to wish them the best, Biz, right? Yeah, and and I think we talked about it the last time a, a guy had had gone into the program where it's if anything it's it's positive that when these guys are dealing with this type of stuff they're not just burying it and they keep going like in the past you know twenty thirty years ago just given with where society was at you know guys would try to keep playing through it and in in, in some cases probably do more damage so uh, you know I, I hope he goes off and gets the help help he needs why why'd you make that face no, no I was like my just like stubborn Irish guy who refused to ask for help like like I was yeah. goofing on myself yeah because no, I, no, I, I tend I, to be I the same you. way and, you know? and I hope that people who are listening who do need it like go go get it like have conversations don't self-isolate so the hardest thing about playing in the NHL and it happening though is it has to become public information what sucks but it shouldn't be something that's held against anybody. If, if anything, they should be commended for, for going to get the help they need. And um, that's kind of a, a societal thing as well. Well said, buddy. Well said. All right. We got to check in out West. Uh, Dallas uh, right now has a three point lead over the Avalanche for the Central. Avs do have a game in hand. The Jets kind of slipped a bit. They're in third place, nine points back at Dallas. They do have a game in hand, but I don't see them uh, stay in that division. Uh, Canucks, All right. Uh, do you remember when I mentioned of the race? To win the Central was the most important one, so you wouldn't get Winnipeg, whether it was Colorado or Dallas. At that time, Winnipeg was in the hunt. Now, that source to talk to me, Oof. the Jets, man, you might, you might be better off. You might be better off getting second in that division playing Winnipeg than possibly getting Vegas, Nashville, or L.A. It's yeah, I mean, of, I- the, the tides have turned a little bit with the Jets. It, it's so wide open, man. I mean, there's so many good teams. You, you got to beat. Sometimes the, the toughest teams you beat with in the playoffs are the first round, second round teams. I know, and but it cannot. It can beat the shit out of you, buddy. No, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. But I do get, well, fortunately, if Winnipeg fails, I do have seven other teams that have a future. Yes, that's, yeah, true. So. that's true. That's <laughs> true. Actually, uh, no, that one, actually, I got them right here with uh, LA 24 to 1, uh, Ottawa 37 to 1, wah, 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 wah. Vancouver 59 to 1. Nashville seventy six to one, Bruins sixteen to one, uh, Winnipeg nineteen to one, and uh, yeah, and whatever. Oh, Washington one hundred and fifty to one. So I threw that in late. Wow, well, so that would happen. <laughs> There's no chance. There's no chance that Washington wins the Stanley Cup. It's fucking crazy how they're even. I mean, making they might have just won it. You, they might have just won it. <laughs> you you should get paid on that ticket and the fact that they're just making playoffs. <laughs> so anyway, it's it's remarkable what they're well, doing. Um, well, we, what else we got, we, buddy? We were talking college earlier, Biz. I also have uh, North Carolina State. Uh, I got a 100-to-1 100, 100 ticket on them. 
They're in the final four right now. I know That's a fun story. Do college ba- <laughs> I know we don't yeah. do college Shout basketball. Shout out Rico much, Bosco from Barstool who told me before the first game of the tournament, the round of 64, that they were going to lose and that they had this big man, Burns, who's out of shape and was going to be exhausted in the second half. They're still playing, and this guy's <laughs> dominating. Put up 30 My points My boy last Rico, game. I'm a rider, but maybe maybe that call, I'm like, <laughs> they're still playing. Is he, when is he going to get tired, Rico? He put 30 yeah. up last game, and he's, he's like nationally known now. They're talking about him playing in the NFL. People are like, the NFL's interested in this guy. I'm like, he's too tired to play in the NFL. Uh, also, Biz, uh, Tampa Bay, 18-1, to 1 and uh, Philly, 85. All right, if you like, read God, off one right. more future, I'm going right. to fucking spike my hey, mic. Just trying to fucking be open and honest. All right, out west, like I said, Dallas. I'd rather uh, hear about what- your sex capades than you read, you read off another future. What do we got Hold next? On. There goes some tumbleweeds right about there. <laughs> All right, Biz, uh, connects, like I mentioned, Six point cushion over the Oilers in the Pacific. Edmonton has a couple games at hand. Uh, Vegas currently the third seed in the Pacific, but the Kings right now the wild card two squad. But two of their last nine games, Biz, are against playoff opponents. Did the Kings end up in the wild card spot or the third in the Pacific? I don't know, man. I, I we, we talked about with the the Leafs kind of, kind of somewhat being able to control your future and who you play against. I don't know, man. If I'm if I'm LA, I try to time it where I avoid. Obviously, Edmonton at all costs, but of course, letting Vegas slide in there and then having a Vegas Edmonton first round series. No, no, no. I, I know. No, no, I, no. I, I don't want I, that. I dude. know it's crazy, but obviously, LA controls that. And I'm not saying throwing games here. And the fact that they have a a, a brutal, like, or a, excuse me, a favorable um, uh, strength of schedule for their case to get that third spot. I don't know, man. I might fucking. I might throw you in that RA for a couple oh. of those games, and it's 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 going to be hard because they got to rattle off some wins in order to keep wherever they want in that uh, the wild card spot because you don't want to end up having to draw, let's say, the Abs. You don't want to go in a fucking Colorado. But yep. if if it's Dallas, if if I'm LA, I take my shot against Dallas much rather than I do against Edmonton. But no, the team, or, or the, Van, or Van, if they somehow got correct. the one seed. Cor- but correct. Here's the thing. As an Oilers fan, it's like, and I remember Biz last year. Our argument: you should be scared of the Kings. Well, you were not at all. I, I said, I said they were they were a good team. I think I said I'm not scared. I'm not scared of L.A. And I was correct. They beat them in seven two years ago. They beat them six last well, year. Well, their They'd power probably play beat was fifty five percent. They'd probably beat them in five this year. They worked them last week. I think it was Thursday night, four one, dominating win. I'm as an Oilers fan. Petri- petrified of playing Vegas in the first round. Please, please don't do that. Especially with Hurdle getting the sting from the rafters. Hurdle's coming Hurdle back. Oh, They're God. seven, two, and one in their last ten. They're finally starting to get going. I don't want anything to do with Vegas in the first round. Keep them away from me. So hopefully but- we can get LA. And quickly on the Oilers, guys, I I, I gotta shout out Ekholm. He's got he's got 39 points this year. Four of them are on the power play. He's got 35 even strength points. That's as many as Adam Fox has. He's the true shutdown number one defenseman. He's a whole, one of the best trades the what Oilers have ever made for what a, a defenseman. There's Chris Pronger, and then there's the trade for Matthias Ekholm, and then maybe the trade for Ryan Whitney, because we had a lot of success <laughs> when I was there. But Ekholm is just that driving factor in front of the net. Don't even go near the goalie. He's a horse. He's a beast. And he's getting getting it done offensively five on five. So he's awesome. And then quickly, in one of the all-time races for the Art Ross Trophy, guys, all-time races, we have 127 points for McKinnon, 126 for Kucherov, 125 for McDavid. McDavid's got 10 games left. Kucherov's got nine, and I think McKinnon's got eight. So it's this run. I don't know if I might have messed it up a little bit. I'm pretty close to those numbers. But just just quickly here, Edmonton, since Knobloch took over, 42-14-3. and three. That's a 737 winning percentage. Easily the best in the league. The next closest is Carolina at a 692 percentage since November 12th. So the Oilers have done this. It's been amazing, and it's been McDavid. And a long time ago, Biz, I said to you, no, no. Even if McDavid comes back and wins the scoring title, he's not in my MVP. He's not my MVP guy. You're a turncoat. You're going back. Um, listen, let me explain quickly. I'm actually not going back. I'm mad at myself because if he becomes the fourth player ever with 100 assists in a season, which he's going to do, he's four away to join Gretzky, Lemieux, and, and Orr. 
that is so mind blowing and outrageous that that the fact of the matter is that I me saying he wouldn't be my MV pick, I'm mad at myself, but I'm still leaning towards McKinnon because of how many more goals he has. Okay? Correct. So right. so even if McDavid wins it by three points. McKinnon having 20 more goals, that to me, that's the MVP. Hey, and, he could and, still still potentially even get the Ted Lindsay too, right? The Ted Lindsay is voted on by true. the players. Yeah. So there's He's still well. plenty of hardware for him to collect. But I think that anybody outside of Edmonton and Colorado, most people would agree that at this point right now, McKinnon does uh yeah, McKinnon deserves it. And Lightning do you want to flipping? Uh, right. Well, and, and, and that's a story for another day, but come on here. No East Coast bias. McKinnon is on a fucking heater. Also, I want to say that Cooch does have a lot of empty net points. Not to take anything. Easy Pasha. N- n- not, hey, I was just about to say, not to take anything away. Now, that could lead us into the discussion is did he get screwed on the point? He got consecutive- screwed. Okay. Screwed. That's your that's your feeling on it. There's a comparable video that came out where Barkov was able to uh, continue a point streak. There is a discrepancy in the video. One one is like most like a, a poke tip, where Lindgren does swipe and make contact with the puck. But do you believe that Rottenen does make contact with the puck before Lindgren puts it in? Like does he does he touch the puck with a with a hair of his stick? Because if that so is if the people case, are a little, if, pe- if people are a little confused, McKinnon had this amazing home point streak going and he didn't have one against the Rangers. And then late in the game, it looked like he got an assist, but they ended up basically calling it an own goal. And in that case, they're giving it to the a one point to the goal score. The last guy to touch it Rantanen. right away. I, 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 I kind of said, oh, he's going to get that. Like, it's at home. This streak's that incredible. He'll end up getting it. Well, no, they, they didn't give it to him, and the league stood firm. No, he's, you do not get an assist there. And then what happened in Florida, it was pretty similar. It was similar enough in my mind where you, if you're giving that point to, um, to Barkov, and who was the other guy who got the assist? Uh, did Barkov uh, get the goal? Barkov got the goal. Yeah, they uh, gave assist to Reinhardt, I think, and somebody else. Yeah, that, Ekman Lassen. Yes, and that if you're going to give them assists, you got to give McKinnon one on that goal against the Rangers. I was really surprised. I, I think there's there's an argument to be made that that the league got it correct in Colorado and that they messed up the one in Florida. I, I know what you're saying, though, Biz, where it did look a little different. But well, the one was enough. a deflection. Like, it was, it was yeah. more of a poke. So, like, it was on its way into the net as opposed to, like, it wasn't. If, if Lindgren doesn't swipe at that puck, it probably doesn't end up in the net. So, that's where I can understand it. But the discrepancy is, though, is Rotten and is swiping at that puck at the exact same time. And it does look like the end of his stick does make contact with it. So in that act is why I think that it should have been continued. Now, everyone outside of Colorado might be like, who gives a flying fuck? But I'll tell you, for a guy to potentially surpass a Gretzky record, that's got to mean a lot to to at least enough people outside of the fan base. You explained it last podcast. Wayne Gretzky had a point in every single home game in the 80s. But they only played 80 games. So it was 40 games at home. This one could have surpassed it where if he did it in all 41 home games, he would have been the lone record holder. So fuck, man. That to me is a big deal. And maybe they do go back and change it. But ultimately, guys, this race of of MVP, uh, even if you look at the second tier of guys who won't even be considered in the top three, like Reinhardt, 50 goals, Hyman, 50 goals. Like who are some other uh, uh, second tier guys? Pasha, Panarin, Yo, uh, Panarin. Panarin, yeah, Panarin. Panarin. Panarin's favorite player. Um, also, the thing that I wanted to mention about McKinnon, when McDavid w- McDavid had ten points in eleven games or whatever, and, and it's been on this run, he's got twenty five points in his last ten games. <laughs> but at the same time, November twelfth, uh, McKinnon didn't even have a lot of points. So, so his his run's been almost as impressive. I think he might have had 15, 16 points. It wasn't like he had been coming out of the gates and been hot the entire year. His run is his recent run's been just as amazing. So I believe in 2023, he had the most points in the NHL. Last year, same thing. 
he had this insane run in the second half of the season where now it's been more sustained throughout the course of the entire year and agreed with you. Maybe it's not as hot in, in, in points per game. It's it's definitely been on the rise. But from a full body of work perspective, the start or the end of the 2023 year was enough to have the most points of any player in the NHL more than McDavid. And that just tells you the run that McKinnon's been on in the last 18 months. It's been yeah. so fucking impressive. It's a joke. And, and he, he had deserves- four the next home game when they waxed Colorado, which was shockingly, I think it was 7-4. Like, I didn't see 11 goals coming out of that game. So, uh, those are busy. your... No, well, go ahead, Dari. O- o- only player in NHL history to have two 19-point streaks in one NHL season. Even yeah, Wayno we said that, that last week. That's no. wild. Damn. Well, I mean, yeah, it is absolutely wild. You're just full uh, of nuggets today, R.A. Ha, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that nugget oh, was oh. from last week, but yes, you are. Right. I love recycled well, no, nuggets. No, he, he hadn't. He it's hadn't like eating a booger. 19 games uh, twice yet. Uh, <laughs> actually, before you uh, send it over, we're actually going to talk to Austin Matthews' agent, Judd Moldavis, short, Judd Moldavis shortly, but we got to give the props to the uh, National Predators once again, Piz. The, the FU, FU tour. tour, they were calling, I guess. Huh? 16-0-2, it came to an end uh, by Arizona, uh, funny enough. But they basically, you know, guaranteed themselves a playoff spot at that point. They lost to the Yotes Thursday. First regulation loss since the 9-2 spank from Dallas, which sent them into this whole uh, FU2 tour. So uh, just an unreal run by the Preds. Basically got them, not basically, they got them in the playoffs. So want to get a little shout out there. But boys, uh, I think we should send it over to Judd. Uh, interesting character. Uh, has the, uh, some of the contracts. Super right? agent. Super agent. Judd, Judd. super agent. I mean, don't forget NHL that. NHL runs uh, through his phone. I was That's what he says. This one. Enjoy. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our good friends over at Verizon. Hey, gang, like a lot of you out there, I'm always relying on my phone to keep up with the latest news in hockey. Every day something new happens, boom, you want to be on top of it, especially if you're in hockey media. Whether you're streaming games, searching for live scores across the NHL, or just keep keeping up on major trades, I can always trust my phone to get me there. Verizon, boom, absolute shout out for them because there's nothing worse than your phone glitching out during a shootout find out who's about to win the Stanley Cup. No, no, no. That's not going to happen when you rely on Verizon. That's why you rely on Verizon's fast, reliable network. Let's you stream games, keep up with what's going on in real time. Also, man, Verizon, the home internet is unbelievable. If you don't have Fios and it's available in your area, you're doing it wrong. Get all over this. You can stay up to speed on everything, on your phone, on the TV, wherever. Verizon internet, boom, so good, so much better than unnamed competitors out there. And they get you covered everywhere, on the go, at home. Plus, when you bundle your mobile and home internet plans, boom, you save tons of money. So visit verizon.com slash barstool to learn more. Well, folks, oh, it's man. finally, <laughs> finally happened. A longtime friend of myself and a few other guys in this room, we have the executive vice president, one of three at Wasserman Hockey, super agent, super Austin agent. Matthews, Connor McDavid, Roman Yossi. The list continues. Judd Moldaver. Welcome to the, <laughs> oh, welcome to the Spin Chicken Podcast. Oh, 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 hey, we, we came to Toronto. We got him. It had to be in He's person. Like a white buffalo. <laughs> and this might have been my modernized white whale yeah, to get yeah. him on. You exceeded Brett. We finally fucking got you. This is awesome. Well, I can't say uh, how happy I'm to be here. I appreciate the persistence. Uh, and I feel honored to be on the show, fellas. Thank you. And one of the things I respect, and we've talked for a long time about this, is you, you, you've told me, listen, like the players are the players, and I don't necessarily want to be an agent that's always out there getting quoted, always in the media. So it took a little while, which I understand, but has that always been kind of your mind frame in terms of representing guys? I don't ever want to be the story. I'm behind the scenes helping you guys out. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, I'm only in this chair because of the guys, right? So I wouldn't be uh, have this privileged position that I have or be in this room with you sickos if it wasn't for the players and the families that have given me the opportunity. So I think you guys know and those that know me and my clients, uh, I'm not shy and I'm certainly willing to speak my mind. I just think that they're the talent, they're the guys, and my job is to make sure their career is in a good direction and I do my part. But, uh, you know, I'm here in Toronto, very proud of Wasserman Hockey, very proud of our, our clients that are in the game. Uh, I grew up here, so a lot of emotions and uh, a lot of excitement to be here, but absolutely try and in some ways fly under the radar and just whatever it takes to get the job done for the guys, but I'm here because of them. And so, yeah, I don't lose sight of that ever. Yeah. 
You grew, you grew up in that game, didn't you? Was it you showed me a picture of you playing on the same team as Justin Williams? He was the captain. Up? The Vaughn Kings. He, he was the captain. <laughs> He's sitting in the center. Were you the same height then? Stud. Yeah, it was the same height then. That's what it was kind of juicy back then, but it fell off, you know? Okay. And his no dad, insults here. No, 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 it yeah. fell off. Hey. I'm big Rick Cavs, don't worry. <laughs> and his dad was the coach, so that might have helped. Uh, by the way, <laughs> hey, GM, that. GM. <laughs> GM. <laughs> Even better. Hey, the funniest part about the picture, though, is like you went to you and then your dad and you looked the exact same. Yeah. And at, like what, 14 years old? Yeah, pretty much. No stash, though. No? Uh, okay. Yeah. I was a little lighter on my feet then, too, but... Yeah, no, Willie, it's incredible. Like, Willie and I play on the same team. It was grade nine, Vaughn Kings. And yeah, it's a crazy thing. I remember seeing him after he won the Conn Smythe and said, hey, we put on the Vaughn Kings. You went and played on the LA Kings and won a Connie, <laughs> yeah. a couple of cups. Like, yeah, you're thing. welcome, bud. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Mr. Game 7 from your leadership <laughs> yeah. on the Vaughn Kings. I played down the middle too, boys. Just so you want to <laughs> Willie was on the flank. Don't worry. So like how high level of a hockey did you get to? And was it always like all of a sudden I want to be a hockey agent? Like how did you, how did that career path go? Yeah, I well, so growing up here, right? Like hockey is everything and influenced everything I was doing in life from where I went to high school and college. I played at no high level and wasn't very good at the level I played at, but I loved the game always and just was addicted to it every in every way, playing it and obviously just watching it even more and just learning about it. Um, lucky, my parents have always been super supportive. My older brother and sister um, are attorneys. My dad's an attorney. So all through high school, when it was kind of clear that hockey could be something I could use to play in college. And like two of these guys did at some level, it just became play hockey, try and get a scholarship. Uh, and from there, use that opportunity, maybe go play in Europe in some league. And that was always the thought. But obviously, early in high school, I was pretty realistic that, hey, I might be able to play in college in some way, but a business career in hockey was more likely than an actual playing career. Uh, had the fortune of great parents, great brother and sister, made calls, um, and found my way into an internship uh, after my junior year in college. Um, and Played there. at Colby, right? Yeah, yep. that's right. Uh, wish I would have worked out a little harder. Um, <laughs> Might have had a little better career. But yeah, I did. I did. Um, and I uh, should have gone to BU, but they didn't want me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did that internship in, in New York. It had nothing to do with hockey. And then took another internship in a hockey department at a different agency. Um, that agency became another agency that I previously worked at. I'm, I'm now at Wasserman and yeah, just a, a crazy ride from growing up here in Toronto and having a chance to play in high school and play in college and I'm pinch myself. You know, I, I really feel fortunate. It's, it's been a blur. That's it, where I got to come in because Judd was, I, I, I almost got to call you one of my first agents. My, my first agent, when I was in the NHL, of course I got Paperson. He's calling me all the time. I'm roommates with Sid. All of a sudden, I get sent down to the minors. I got another guy calling me. <laughs> all of a sudden, I get sent to Europe. And all of a sudden, I'm getting these emails from Judd. And I got him in there. <laughs> oh, no shit, eh? Judd. Like, who is this guy? Like, I don't even know if he's an agent yet. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, I was grinding the Swiss League for you, baby. <laughs> grinding it. Staying up till 1, 2 in the morning. Babe. Yeah. Matt Morley can fly. Yeah. Great okay. team. Oh, and it's Drunk. one of my bigger regrets. It was, uh, it was Beal. They were in the Swiss B. Just moved up to the Swiss A League. And you're telling me, you're like, this is a good opportunity. Yeah, it's the low money end of Swiss, but they'll be happy if they win 10 games this year. And at the time, I didn't know any better. And I was like, do I want to go to a team that can only win 10 games? This is going to suck. He's like, you should take the deal. Oh, you're playing like 12 games over there. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're skiing. It's one, it's one of my skiing. bigger mistakes. Oh, and then that's when you ended up I ended up coming back and played another year in the AHL, and then I went to Russia later on. Well, what it's I amazing. remember, what I remember is, and you could go more into it, was you started low, man. You went through every single step. And yeah. I think so many people want to just be at the top. And you're a prime example of like, you got you got to grind at the beginning, man. It's, there's no easy days. And the whole time, I'm sure in your mind, you had the goal of being where you're at now. But that's a lot, a lot of years of being like grunt work. Yeah, no, listen, I think it, just like you guys in, in any walk of life, you want to be successful, you got to go through it all. If, if it's not handed to you, you got to grind it. There's good days, bad days, everything in between. Um, for me, it's, it's an even longer time coming than most people would know. Cause most people haven't known me my whole life. I've wanted to do this really since I was, you know, 14 or 15 years old, the seriousness to it picked up kind of in college and all that. But, uh, talking to my family about it, I've always wanted to represent players. It was just etched in my head. And then, you know, like I said, I worked for some great companies prior to working at Wasserman and, and there's a lot of great experiences with, with players and families and people, um, and obviously a lot of credit along the way to my support system of family, friends, 
people that believe in me, um, my clients and all that. But I think, I don't know if it's Snoop that said it, I won't quote Snoop, but you know, you got to believe in yourself uh, and you need help along the way, right? You need a champion along the way. Players need coaches that believe in them, management, yeah. ownership. Um, take you guys, right? You start this show, there's yeah. doubters, there's, hey, you never know when you want to do something great. Um, so for me, yeah, I'm really fortunate along the way and and certainly um, try to learn everything I could along along the way from all sorts of different people, players, different experiences. And here I am. It's uh, it's fortunate, but I'm uh, I'm feeling strong. So you're 42 now. And was there any point along that run and that ride up where you were like, fuck, man, like it's not going as quick as I hope. Like, did you ever consider maybe something else or at any point or at no point where you're like, no, this this is what I'm doing? No, it's a great question. I absolutely considered a bunch of other things. Really? Which, and nothing to do with hockey. Yeah. You know, I got to a point where some guys you played with, some pretty special players you guys know well yourselves. Like I had some amazing experiences and just got to a point where, quite frankly, I just, I wasn't stimulated anymore, you know, for all sorts of reasons. And so I thought about different things, right? Uh, a host of different things, not that interesting. Uh, and there's a quote that, uh, I'm not getting political, but it's, uh, I think, an Abraham Lincoln quote, and it's been used a few times. It's something to the effect of, I was brought to my knees by the conviction I had nowhere else to go. And every time I thought about doing something else, um, it's the job, man, and the, and the fellas and their families kept bringing me back to it. Um, and so for sure, I went through a long period, wait, of, yeah. do I want to do this? I'm unhappy. Um, I think like a lot of people go through in their careers and I think the hardest thing to do is stop believing in what you believe in, right? Because yeah. we all want vindication from everybody. We all want validation. And I just realized the most important decisions I made in my life, I didn't ask anyone but myself. Yeah. And I'm like, I know this is right. I know what I'm doing with my life, whether that was at 16 years old, 19 years old, 34 years old, 40 years old, doesn't matter. I think, you know, for my clients, for anybody that wants to be successful in hockey or anything they're doing, like, believe in yourself. Don't be delusional. Like, fellas, I'm not dunking a basketball this afternoon, <laughs> no matter how much I believe in myself. So there's some physics and some science that will defy some aspirations. <laughs> yeah. But by and large, like, you know, grind and yeah. don't complain. Yeah. Like, get it done. Find a way. Like, no one's life is easy. No one's life is peachy. No one's handed things. So don't make excuses. Grind. You're allowed to complain and vent, but push through. And for those that don't, then they will be at the bottom of the mountain. Yeah. For those that That's do, they'll cold, scale the yeah, top. Not, yeah. not, not enough of them are willing to do it, right? Oh, buddy, they don't oh. make them like this anymore, oh. <laughs> Juddy. They don't make them. Did you have an advisor when you were uh, when you went to college? You said you made some calls. Hey, hey, I wasn't that good, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, no one no one represented you? Because I know it was different back then. He represented then. himself. But dude, you made yeah. some phone calls. You're like, hey, 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 I want to still want to play hockey. Is there an opening on the roster? And you're not, it's not BU, but it's like, you still have to get in there. A hundred percent. Like what the four of you guys have done, uh, however many games or not many games you guys all played, you guys did play in the actual hockey league. Like it's incredible. Uh, I'm the example of someone I think that didn't make it, didn't play at a high level. And the level I played at wasn't anything special myself either, but was able to take all of that and be in the hockey business. So yeah, I know I did not have an agent. I should have, if someone would have called, maybe I would have grown a little taller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, I was just obsessed with playing hockey in college, like from 13 years old on, that was an obsession. Uh, cause I just saw it as the best way to keep playing and use it as an opportunity. And I love the guys. I love, you know, I, I love just miss being in the room myself. Yeah. Right. I'm sure you guys not playing anymore. You can't, you can never replicate that. Right. This is pretty close, but it's hard to, so I, I always wanted to play and, and just thought it would be good for my life. You know, that's why you're the captain of Justin Williams team. And Willie was, yeah, like, listen to this guy. <laughs> yeah. Listen exactly. to yeah. this guy. I, wh when did I first meet you? I think I met you. It was uh, 2005 or six. Yeah. Sid's rookie. Correct. Yeah. We Correct. were in LA and yeah. I was in, I was roommates with him. And yeah. you came over to like, it was a jersey see him or, or do something with him or yeah. take care of something business wise. That's right. For him. And that's when I first met you. Just like a young gung ho kid came in there, hit it all. You were like, just like us. So it was like so easy. Same you age. Jumped right in. Same age. What were you, what was your title? And were you just getting in then? Were you just grinding your way kind of through the machine a little at the start there? Exactly. I mean, I talk a lot in hockey analogies, so might as well stop. I might as well not stop on the show. Uh, yeah, it's like you get to rookie your rookie in training camp. You pick up the pucks. You know, you do all the little things you got to do to just grind and and contribute to whatever it is and kind of pay the respect. Just like you go into a dressing room and you act a certain way. 
Um, Putting the social life aside, right? You're just yeah. traveling, first guy on, last guy off. Yeah, like, all, all that, all that. It's it's Everything is about the job and I became obsessed with it. It wasn't so bad. I was living in California in that way, but it just became um, an obsession. The job is still an obsession. Um, there's no two ways about it. Um, I wish sometimes I could manage that, yet I believe that just, you know, being obsessive about something you love is what allows you to be successful. And so I've just always been just, uh, I know this is a family show, but fucking obsessed with the game, obsessed with my job, even when some other things were complicated in my personal life. And yeah, you just, you just when I started, there was no real titles. I just started as trying to help in whatever way I could, right? I didn't have much yeah. experience. Like so. runner, helper, Anything. everything. But you're like, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Anything. Were yeah. you, uh, like, what what age were the guys that you were representing when you first stepped in? Like, are you dealing with some unrealistic parents sometimes? Or are you handed these types? There's of no such thing, Biz. Um, <laughs> like, so, you gotta have some insane, <laughs> insane asks here. No, no, no. There's only there's only representatives that don't get the job done. There's no insane parents or clients. That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I uh, look at this fucking guy, uh, legend. Man. I was thrown. You, you ain't slipping. I was thrown in. Uh, I was thrown into <laughs> all sorts of situations. So it's kind of funny to look back, like. Colby and I met and been friends for a long time, never worked on his behalf professionally. Mm -hmm. I did in Merle's case. I've known you two guys for forever as well, obviously. Um, I just was kind of thrown in and um, whatever needed to be done, you know, like got done. So if you're a player that was 15 years old and I could connect and add some value, great. Um, you know, I think of, uh, I don't want to forget any names because I, I was thinking not just before coming on today, but just reflecting on the plane here two days ago, like, how many players I've been fortunate enough to work with over the years. And I'm sure I'm not batting a thousand, you know, I can't call everybody back as fast as they want me to, or I want to. That's and the business. Song. And there's a bit of a pecking order. Uh, you yes. know, if, you know, it, if well, Connor's calling at three in the morning, I'm answering it. Well, you know, it, whoever, if you're calling at three in the morning, I'm answering too, but okay. uh, yeah, uh, go you, know, you, know, <laughs> you know, if I can solve your problems, I'll solve them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I, it was really, it's been really a function of like whatever made sense. So anyway, without forgetting anyone, I, I really, and I say this, I, and I know the fellows would chirp me and you guys should chirp me about this, but I, I get emotional about it. Cause like, I definitely not batting a thousand at the same time. I'm here because of players. Like I'm in this chair because of the players I've worked with and the information that I've learned from them, not even by them saying things to me, the experience. I think of guys like Stefan Robida and Philip Boucher and Ian LaPerriere just, and again, I'm bringing like Daniel Briere who's now a GM, Sean Workoff, like just a lot of guys that, and I'll forget names and, and I don't want to forget anyone else. So I'll, I'll leave it the listing, but just so many guys that I learned from at the very beginning that were in the NHL and just saw so much right on, on guys starting at different paths, American guys, you know, going to Europe, Canadian guys going to playing in us markets, vice versa, everything, you know? Um, and they were teaching you a little bit. Right. hundred percent thing. Like you're yeah. seeing, oh, all right, this is how it works for all them. And I guess the whole process started so early that like you look back now and you realize without all that stuff, you just wouldn't be here. No, a hundred percent. Well, like that's what it comes down to. You got to learn all of that. And I think it's in any business right? you got to know how things work to understand how to fix them, maybe make them better. Sometimes things don't need changing or like evolution. The CEO you know? of Lululemon, you know, he'd make them work in the store no matter what your position for at least a couple shifts a week. You got to kind of see how the engine runs. Totally. And I think a lot of companies are like that. Like the, I didn't know that they did. Uh, if they do that, I mean, a hockey culture, any business that's smart has people exposed to everything. I think someone was telling me the other day and who's telling me this in some sort of uh, uh, Italian culture that they like to do that as well. Someone was telling a personal story about how they built a, a property and then they wanted to show all the builders how to exactly do it. Like something to be said for right. uh, everyone at every level, um, from the builders to the owner, excuse me, like knowing how the faucet works, how the garage opens, like everything so that you're not guessing. So yeah, I think all that is important. Just like you guys, picking up pucks, you know, last on the bus, whatever, sit at the front Pain of the bus, whatever dues. it is. Pain, Pain in the dues. So I, I, um, go ahead, Mercer. Yeah, I just say you, you've been around all the best players in the league. What is one trait that you notice that all of them have that maybe some other guys don't have? Consistency. It's just, I think it, it's, uh, it sums up everything, right? Like the other word I like is awareness. I like that word for life, not just for hockey players, but awareness is a word where it's, a, it, there's a lot of subsets under awareness. Right. And so I think consistency, I mean, the, not just the best players in the world. Uh, I think any guy that has a career of any sort, they, they care about what they do. 
Like, you know, uh, I often say there's kind of sort of three ways to, to kind of make it to the NHL. There's getting drafted, there's signing a contract, and there's having a career, right? Uh, I want to represent guys that are in the third bucket. And I think every guy uh, that I represent wants that and knock on wood has that right now. Um, so to me, it's that consistency. You know, you guys know, again, I, I just say it because you guys lived it, right? So it's, it's much easier to talk to you guys just because you lived it. You guys know the grind of the NHL. Um, and the draft's nothing. That's just the beginning. The beginning. And then guys get there and the grind. And even though, yeah, guys are treated well and they fly a certain way and they travel a certain way, like it's not, but it's hard on your body and to be, to play 82 games. And then if you're lucky enough, compete to try and win 16 to hoist it. Like it's consistency. It's how you take care of your body, how you train, you want to get better. You know, again, I just liken it to other business. Like you can get to a point in your career as a lawyer, as a teacher, as a police officer, and just say, that's just enough. I'm just going to do enough to collect my paycheck and get by. That's not limited to like hockey or anywhere else. That's society. So I think the best players are players that have a, a sustainable career. Like they're consistent. They eat the right way. They take care of themselves. They still have fun, enjoy being in the NHL and have a good time when it makes sense to have a good time. But there's a, there's a hunger and there's a consistency and a dedication that's like none other. Um, no nights impressive. off. Yeah. No in nights terms off. Of consistency, I think on ice, like, McDavid and Matthews, like every night they're bringing it, man. Like, and you see a lot of guys that go up and down that wave. And that is a good difference in terms of the superstars, like you said. I got a question for you. What do you think a good, um, you know, we talk about traits of players um, be, being an agent, representing what, what do you think that you've been around a lot of people, uh, low level to high level and tricks that you picked up is it just being yourself you're a good talker smooth guy get along with people easy to walk into a room like is that important like jerry Maguire shit like what's an important real important quality that you found from your clients that sets you ab above or makes you what you are um i just try to be myself i know that sounds so Effing what cheesy a loser or fucking cheesy <laughs> loser alert <laughs> loser um no i mean you know i try and be myself as cliche as that sounds because i think that you know players need to talk about things that aren't just hockey sometimes too and a little therapist action yeah just just you know bsing like i don't know you can call bullshit on this like i would have hoped that i would have called you once in a while and just said what's up and not had anything to tell you except just saying what's up. And yeah, he never, he and never it, called me with the seven hundred thousand from the KHL. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and in certain cases, like some of these guys don't trust a lot of people either. Yeah. So you know, you're one of one of the few that they can come to with maybe stuff that they wouldn't bring anywhere else. Yeah, and I take that and I take that as an honor and a privilege, right? Like in some cases, I've represented players since they've been fourteen years old, and it's been that route. Some of my clients, it's been later in their career. You know, I, I try and get to know everyone's families or and you know girlfriends, wives, fiancés. But that's just how you are. Yeah. I think that's just how I mean, you are, right? Yeah, that's just built it's not for this shit. Man. Well, it's just, yeah, I don't I don't do it as a script. I I you know I, I just think of like quite frankly like what would I want? You know, I didn't learn it in a textbook. With all due respect to my high school and my college, I didn't learn it from my family. Even though without them, I'm I don't know where I'd be. I didn't. It's it's just you just have to like trust your instinct while learning along the way. And I just think players have, like you said, biz, there's a lot of like the lack of trust. A lot of people want something from them. Um, don't understand the lifestyle. Uh, I think it's important to make guys feel like you, you can have a, an honest conversation with your agent. And I don't really like the word agent, to be honest with you. I, yeah. I think it's a misnomer because uh, I think the word agent, depending on the business or vertical you're in, the functionality is different. I think of myself in many ways as sort of a glorified consigliere or if I get into Godfather speak, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or, you know, I love those movies, uh, or like the <laughs> seat, or, the, or, the sleep. C or like the CEO. Yeah. What the fuck? All right. I show up. You're not here. Yeah, um, he wait, you guys can't afford another he's, lazy boy. He's a here? senior citizen. He needs a nap. Now. All right. We got right, a recliner yeah. for him. I'll give him, I'll give him a mulligan. But, uh, no, the other way I look at it is I, I've been saying this thing for a number of years. Uh, as long as I can remember, I'm the CEO of guy's life and I'm my opinion. And inside that there's agenting and there's advocacy and there's negotiation. But, you know, uh, I've got wonderful colleagues, obviously Marcus Leto and Dave Gagne are our other executive vice presidents at the group. You know, Adam Phillips and Rachel Fight are, are amazing. Joe Pinter, several other agents in our group are awesome. And for me, it's just 
thinking through how we use each other, how to use the group. Um, and then that going back to what you said, Army, it's like, who do connect, who do I connect with and who connects with me? Right. Cause this You're really dealing all, with humans. Well, like it's all about, yeah, it's trust and respect. Yeah. So I could be an expert at negotiating contracts or marketing deals or all that stuff. But like, if there's no connectivity, then it yeah, doesn't yeah. really make sense. That's, I want to ask you about the marketing stuff. So you're one of the guys where you, you're, I mean, I wouldn't say you're pushing it on these guys, but you're bringing them brand deals that we haven't really seen in the NHL before, right? Like obviously Connor's Connor, but the stuff that Matthews is doing and collabing, like with the Bieber stuff, like that's, is that something like I would say that Wasserman is pushing or is that more of a you thing? And, and, and where do you see that going in the hockey world? Because that that amount of of money that these guys can make now from marketing dollars, I feel surpasses any time we're in in the game. Yeah, it, it's funny you should say that, and not to, I'll stay on the marketing, but just I, I got to say this. And um, hockey is the greatest sport in the world, and I don't like when players like you know even on the contract negotiation. We all know we live in this hard cap system that somehow a guy signs a ticket and the amount of money he makes all of a sudden is relevant to how much he wants to win. Like, I think it's ridiculous. It's insane. It's ridiculous. It's insane. They've pinned, other the owners sports, have pinned the fans on their fire. Well, other sports, a guy signs, you know, a kajillion dollar deal and that's amazing. Everyone's and no one's like, hey, does he want to win? Yeah, like, yeah. it's absurd. <laughs> it's insane, like, yeah. let guys sign their deals and has no measure of their desire to win with the caveat being obviously that in our universe, there is a hard cap and a, hard, a salary cap. So I don't know if it's a fancy word. It's a budget, right? Cap. It's a budget. And so teams have a budget. That's the system we're in. Um, and yet that shouldn't be the discussion, right? A guy makes X, move on. That's his contract. Um, I bring that back because it segues in the marketing. I feel like it's the same thing. If you bring the noise, if you're consistent, if you show up for what you're supposed to do, then what you do off the ice is Didn't relevant. matter, yeah. Right? It's, it's the guys that, you know performance leads to deals deals don't lead to performance so there's got to be a mindfulness as to when guy do when guys do deals right. what state throughout their career but no i i think it's it's the willingness of our clients i mean austin you guys all know him um and you know connor i mean they're obviously the players that they are but they're willing to do this stuff they they understand you know their importance to the game um their commitment is to winning number one but they're both in positions where there's these cool opportunities. So I think credit goes to them. I mean, Adam Phillips and, and Rachel Fight, who are my colleagues, work. Rachel works closely with Austin and Adam with Connor. I mean, we we work as a group um, and we just try and be creative. We look at, you know, go goes back to what you're, you guys are all saying. Like, you know your clients, so you, tr you try and know them as best as you can and you try and pair them with things that make sense. And so it's a constant search. We're always looking and thinking. When Austin did GQ, like you're not seeing many hockey players in GQ. So like, to me, I feel like that opens up a whole new audience to the hockey world as well. If your stars are coming outside that, that box that you're kind of saying that the, the establishment has put them in from a winning, Absolutely. some, from a signing and winning perspective. And even from the brand deals, it's like, oh, he's doing too many brand deals. It's like, Fuck, dude, he's fuck. He's got forty goals after forty-seven games. Like, shut the fuck up. Right? No, like, no. What do you mean commitment to well, winning? Are you fucking watching? Well, that's that's just the thing. <laughs> that's just the thing. And and I exactly. I just the thing. Like, if guys are showing up at the rink, and and by the way, I, I'm happy to say that no one's making uh, making an issue of it. But I think the old some of the old guard old thinking was always. Oh, too busy doing deals. deals. Like, He's got fucking deals. Sign like, deals. And listen, let's be real. Some guys do get distracted, right? And and not just with deals. They get distracted because they get to the NHL or they get to a certain point in their life. Booze and, they, and pussy. Well, Those um, two, that's what Merle says. That's when you really I mean, I test the kids I out. I mean, I played <laughs> I played zero games, so I can't comment on that. But um, but no, I think it's, I think I appreciate Hasn't you. Hasn't taken you down, Judd. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was a tire pump yeah. because I feel like you. you appreciate you, you, Army. Good looking out. It was a tire pump too, because I feel like you see that where maybe traditional hockey agents wouldn't and it's not even a place where they maybe necessarily look but do you have to push guys into doing it sometimes like hear me out hey hey, hey hear me uh, out a hybrid of that i mean like like the guys want to be educated okay what am i doing what's the purpose like how are they using me like so there's a normal education to it um i guess i i don't maybe subconsciously i don't think about it like in my head, I just, it just makes sense. Like in my head, I don't even process it. Like, like I know that they're non-traditional deals. Not like I'm delusional to that, but it's not driven to do it. Like it's not driven to do that. It's just like, okay, there's these amazing hockey brands that have been in hockey for a long time. There's some new brands that are now in hockey uh, and are spending money in hockey in different ways. That's great because there's a natural passion for it. But how can we, like you guys are saying, take brands that aren't really investing in hockey. Like 
Prime is, yeah, Prime is is maybe with Austin Matthews, who happens to be a hockey player, right? I feel like a lot of the marquee in the past has been just their hockey players. Like it's about the person, the individual. I played with Drew Shore, a good friend of mine, and he's now working for you. And he told me I got to ask the first time you met Austin. Uh, well, yeah. Well, by the way, Shorzy is a beauty, as he's you guys a great know. Guy, man. Ama amazing guy. And and while well, you guys have have chosen this path, kind of after your guys' playing careers, you know, think about you guys being in the agency business uh, and having like that experience, like the level, right? So you guys playing college, playing in different markets, playing in Europe, and going through the AHL bus riding that a lot, most players in the NHL forget. Most guys ride buses, right? Like- I know, you forget. You know, it's forget. super humans that don't have to do it. Right, yeah. even like the, the like I, another guy I'm very fortunate to represent, Roman Yossi. I mean, Roman Yossi played in the AHL, right? And yeah. people are like, wait, Roman Yossi, but it happens, right? Um, it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and for many reasons. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's awesome. Um, first time I met Austin was in California. He was playing for the Arizona Bobcats, and there were two players, him being one of them on his team, uh, amongst a other other good players on some other teams. There was a local tournament and got a tip on him, and this other player from someone we knew. Uh, and I went to the went to the game, went to see some of these games play or some of these teams play. Uh, I'd spoken to his father Brian, who's an awesome dude. Uh, leading up to that. Uh, my mom is from Honduras. I grew up here in Toronto, but my mom is originally from Honduras. Um, Austin's mom, I think it's been well documented. Emma was also an amazing person. It's from Mexico. And so I was doing a little bit of my, you know, trying to speak Spanish to the degree that I can. Just chopping it up, man. Oh, hey, loco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he brings the taco. Hey, car he the taco. He's got, a, he's got a suburban. He busts out the taco maker in the back. <laughs> I got a pinata. Yeah, yeah. nah, nah. You got a mariachi band. <laughs> Fuck, I should. Where were you guys? I should have yeah. you guys before. Oh, yeah. um, like you would have had him when he was 11. It was yeah. on, the tournament was on Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but Sorry, I, we derailed you there. Yeah. No, Canel, no, Canel no. comes out. There's a boxing match in the fucking bar. No, I'm lock. just thinking about having a mariachi band. That's the one that really like oh. is sticking with me um but he's uh, i think he's the first of of uh hispanic descent to play in the nhl right well uh, well his mom is from mexico but weren't there i mean i think scotty gomez, gomez. 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 Oh, cool. gomez. sorry sorry yes but yes, certainly yes. like uh in rarefied company that from having mexican right hair, being a mexican american yeah um so yeah i'd had great banter with brian before on the phone and how old is he at the time sorry 14 14 14 um, hey. uh, we'll get we'll get to my current practice in a second, which doesn't include fourteen year olds. Uh, um, but uh, no, it, Brian was really gracious about taking the call, and he was getting a few calls at that time. And uh, I went there, and then uh, after the game, his wife and actually their youngest, uh, Austin's youngest sister, Brianna, his oldest sister wasn't there. Alex, um, she was there. She's probably eight years old. Jeez, uh, and we met in the parking lot. And I remember, you know, speaking Spanish or trying to speak Spanish and to the degree that I can from my education here and my mom being from Honduras and just chatting. And I think I think Austin reminded me I took one of his twigs and started like twirling it and just probably saying some ridiculous, crazy, stupid You're shit. Like, buddy, 100 million prime five year deals instead oh, of eight. Yeah, the good yeah, thing. Yeah, what the hell? Yeah, we're going to bend LMSC over, um, man. That's even I, how you say the initials. They make a great margarita. Salt and old salt. And yeah, that was, we had that interaction in the parking lot. And um, yeah, it's crazy to think. Uh, that that's gosh that would have been probably i want to say 2013 or 2014 maybe and he just there was no leveling well, off huh he well just, here's the thing like so we got a tip from a coach ron Filion, who's a great guy knew him from la he was coaching the team he said i got a couple guys that are going to be good there's these two players so went out there uh to this tournament and obviously i trusted ron and yet i saw austin do something again i'm sure he'll say i, I didn't but i i did see him do this thing with his feet and I was like, okay, like he's not just good. This is for sure. We want to represent this player. Um, and then while I was beyond impressed at that point, uh, the second time I saw him play was actually at a WHL. It's for you, Army. Thanks. Uh, WHL California Showcase in Anaheim. And I remember being in the stands and, and truth be told, like I didn't, well, I love the game and I watch more NHL hockey than I think almost anybody. I don't. I wasn't going to a lot of rinks. I wasn't doing a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so and, you, did you not have like a, 
a keen eye for 14 year olds and what they could no. be that's kind of hard right no and and there's yeah. people and no i do, i didn't and don't and there's a lot of really smart hockey people that are amazing at that right we've got a lot of those people that work at wasserman there's nhl teams and other colleges and, and european programs and, and the chl like people have those people that are really good uh at doing that you know a guy named ken hornick out here for us in ontario and and several people that, that do that i didn't but i knew enough to know you can also tell something's different. I could tell something's different. That's a perfect way to put it, Wade. And so I'm in the stands at, at the Anaheim, the showcase. And I remember literally looking around. I'm like, is it just me? Or is he like not just better than everyone else, but like way better and like just looked really like something. And he was already a client at that time. And then honestly, I've said this a million times, like, and you know, I can say this about Austin, I can say this about any client that's successful, but I think, you know, obviously guys like Austin Connor or certain certain air, like the mental, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 the physical, but it's the mental stuff. And and yeah. And then after that, I think um the next sort of the spike for me when people really realized how good he was. Um, I think I I was confident when I saw, uh, but then he went to the US program. And you guys might remember, you two may know this, you guys may know this or not know this was a top 40 camp. And at the time, I, I don't even, the trial camp the, the year before. Exactly. Yeah. And uh sometimes I think they give early commitments, sometimes they don't. You know, obviously with what we thought Austin was accomplishing like he'd be a player that maybe just uh would get that right like come to the trial but you're already on the team yeah right just and then that would clean the slate he'd know he was making the team yeah. and all that um you know maybe it had some function to do with like there's where he's playing in arizona i don't know and it, it doesn't matter long story short he was not given that early commitment so he went to the top 40 camp and i'll never forget i i wish i had the voicemails i regret not having them but all of a sudden, my vo my phone had a voicemail from every major college. Like, hey, it's you know, hey, Holy it's David shit. Quinn <laughs> from uh, Boston University. Like, you know, your client Austin Matthews has a full scholarship, and and on and on and on and on and on. It was the first day of the top forty. Holy camp. shit! Because at that point, I think it was like, okay, he's really good, but now we put him in an environment. And you guys may yeah. or may not recall that ninety seven birth year for the Americans. There's like, think about all those guys who were on that team. They're yeah. loaded. There, there were a loaded team. Yeah. You know, Wierenski only played a year. Was who, Kachuk was there as well. that year? Yeah, the Kachuk was on that team. Uh, Rosovic, I think Tage Thompson, Hannafin, oh McAvoy. God. Wow, that's a big year. That's uh, gosh, a big year. whoever I'm forgetting right now, but they had uh, that's really a heavy year. So he went there, and then um, yeah, and then from there, I don't think it was too much of a secret anyway. <laughs> so the amazing thing was that every every American kid. Well, sometimes you go. To junior but all right where is he going to college he's going to go to the o whl no we're breaking the mold we're going to the swiss league that's draft why year. i was going to ask like did yeah. you knowing about that league through through merles and what an interesting well, ball hey, hey, hey. Well, oh wow well, 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 did you oh do i have residuals here <laughs> but a ball a ballsy move right like yeah i mean the the rewind to that was for sure, all jokes aside, Merle's Chuck Kobasu, I haven't talked to a long time, who was a is an amazing person, was an amazing client. We're exactly the same age, I think almost like you and I. Yep. And uh Kobe's another guy that had played in every league in the world, right? Literally he was a captive at the AHL team, played at BC, played in the dub, played in the AA, I'm pretty sure wore the cheddar, played in the national, played in the Stanley Cup final, played in Switzerland. So he was over there, did a deal to put him in Bern and and knew a lot about the league from different guys, the lockout. I'd done some deals, a lot of familiarity with with the Swiss League. And throughout the year, it was just, you know, the late birthday players are always interesting, right? Um, handful of top players in the league are late birthdays, and you get that free year. And so it was obviously, for most North American players, it would have been college or the dub. And Everett had drafted him, and he was probably narrowing down colleges to three or four places in reality. And it just felt like, you know, again, not putting a pressure on him, but that he might be too good in a sense. Not that if he would have played in the dub or D1 by any stretch of the imagination, that things wouldn't be how they are. But it seemed like he was ready for mentally. Yeah, and for a different kind of challenge. And so I've said many times over the years, it was never done to create an archetype for people to follow. It was just the right per person, the right player, the right family. His mom went over there. His dad was going over there. His sister, like it was yeah. a really family commitment to enable it. There was a lot of particulars and, and details immigration wise that needed to get God, sifted that's gotta through. That's got to be hard on the parents because you're basically like making life decisions. Go all in. Trying to let the your kid boy. establish his well, dream. And and that's, whew. Well, it was really complicated. And again, just it was it was credit to his family and, and to him to have the mental ability to, to handle it all because- you guys won't recall this, but if you do, amazing. You're the biggest hockey nerd losers ever. The uh, under-18s that year at the end were in Zug, Switzerland. 
So it's one of those things where you also like he was there anyway. That had nothing to do with the origin but he of the But was thought. able to see the environment. But it was like, yeah, because to think of him coming back, having to make that decision, going back, it if just he'd made never not happen. There, you don't know. Right. Yeah. So we just all think the the passion to to make it happen, um, the commitment from his family, uh, the commitment um to Stars getting him aligned. there. It just aligned. And I remember funny, Edgar uh Salis, who was the GM at the time. In uh, in Zurich, he uh, I remember I'm gonna tease him for this. He he got to training camp. He's like, yeah, he looks pretty good, but you know, it's a pro league. Because I I told uh, we looked at his YouTube and we saw him. And, uh, <laughs> well, I was telling he looks like he can play, but we're not sure. Well, you know, that's all they do. We sign saw here, him sign here. Well, I was just saying, I was like, guys, like I'm not one of those guys that doesn't respect the European leagues because I've I've done so many deals. I, the Swiss league, the Swedish league, it's good hockey. There's really, really good players and guys are man strong and it's, it's no joke, but I go, he's ready. And I said, I just think he's ready and, and he'll be able to handle it. He's got the right support around him. And it was the right organization at the time. Crow was excellent. The right, it was just the right fit to be in, to be in Zurich. And, you know, look, I think he proved that he had a great year there. Um, he had a little bit of an injury, but otherwise I think was close to leading the league in goals. If second, I believe it was an amazing life experience. Like you just said with the, a little bit of, well in Europe, pro men, that type of environment. And then look, I, I, it all worked out. I think the way the aspirations wanted them to be is first overall rookie of the year. And He's got Doesn't 40 and it's not February 1st. Let me let me ask you. Um, <laughs> is that good? You that say? Is that good? I was going to see if you're still listening. Hey, yeah. no, he <laughs> fucking oh, finished fuck. it with a wink on the end. The yeah. dismount of that little Wait, rabble I just was just I said, And he scored 40 before February 1st. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gave me the wink. I just want to see if we have biz with still listening. Yeah, yeah. We just uh, lost I another like year on the deal. Around, <laughs> I feel like he's been around forever, but sorry, Wit. I, I just feel like, did that all happen like to you? I, I, Austin's not here. He can't answer, but I imagine he would say it. Was that like just like so fast? Did what happen? Did sorry, all, like, of, all of a sudden he's at the U.S. camp. Then he's like, teams are like, who is this guy? Then all of a sudden he's like, holy shit! First now overall, I'm going boom, to boom, boom, boom. four goals first. And then game. I'm it's just, just playing, and then all of a sudden, it, boom, he's in the show, and he's just like, it's like, whoa! Oh my yeah, God. honestly, I think it's it's crazier saying that's because saying this because in a different way, just was just been reflecting, right? Like uh, not in a dorky way, but I'm being a dork about it. Like Toronto. Um, you know, it's the city got drafted in, like not every chance, not every player gets a chance to play an all-star game, let alone several, let alone play one in your home city. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think he just embraces it. I think he said it from the beginning, you know, you guys, again, you guys know him, so there's not much I can say, but for, you know, for what I can say is, you know, Austin's just, he handles things really well. He embraces it. He loves playing here. And, I, I think the going back to Merle's your point in question, um, the best players, which isn't just defined by Austin or Connor or Yost or Wierenski or these other guys that are amazing players, it's it's just the ability to get through game one and whatever happened in game one is game two. It's it's that amnesia. It's it's being in the moment. And it's oh yeah, easy the to say mental eraser. If you but got that, you that but that's the strength, it, right? That's the strength. Like, there's not. That's why you pay these fucking guys because not many guys can do what they do in well, Toronto. You need to be well, a special type of person. And also, like, guys don't listen to the noise. You know, like, like obviously, you guys don't count. Ha ha. Like, and I don't. And <laughs> we I, create the noise, yeah, John. Well, right. And I don't. And when, you, and when you guys say something stupid, I don't listen either. Which is every which is every part. Yeah, I haven't listened to those ones. So I actually been like, oh, how much do you know, these guys you know fucking what? drink today? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Patrice, no, there's no scoop there. Patrice Bergeron's Pigeon coming alert. back. What's that? Bergeron's coming back. Uh, says who? Patrice. So this is the rumor, boys. No, no, no. Uh, I, I said like, no. Right no. away, I said no after. No, so, uh, like, again, you put your player hat, hats back on. Like, the and you guys play with some pretty good fucking players. Like, don't listen to the noise. Like, I, I don't listen to the noise. The guys don't listen to the noise because it doesn't matter. Like, People are allowed to have their opinions. You know, players get paid because fans go and people are supporting it and yeah. no one's lost on that. Like that, but if you start listening, I think anyone in life, like you're listening to many pundits, too many opinions and you get caught up in that, like why? It doesn't matter that some guy says you had a bad game or a good game, who cares? Like your coaches matter, your organization matter, your teammates matter, your general manager matters, your family matters. Like. Yeah. You know, like who cares what everybody thinks? Yeah. Like whatever, everyone. Easier said than done, for sure. But but that's the but challenge. That's the, that's the truth of it. it yeah. It, who cares? And a lot of people talk like in opinion under the guise of fact, right? Like two plus two is five. 
what? <laughs> like, just because you said it with conviction doesn't make it fucking true. There's things that are like, yeah, no, I know, I know biz does this. How do you know? You think you know, or you know? Yeah. And I just, that shit drives it's me right fucking. on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this video he posted. <laughs> yeah, but listen, that's part of it. No, like the part of the fun is that people are giving opinions, analyzing, speculating on why a deal happened, didn't happen. How come a marketing deal happened? Like that's all part of it. Like this, there's no, that makes it exciting. But I think for the, for the fellas, um, I think for me, who's just, uh, you know, trying to serve their interest to the best of my ability uh, and our collective ability, it's like, I don't really care what anyone thinks because if I start to care too much about everyone's opinion, then no, and what am I doing? Right. Then you go, Hey, you take over. Yeah. Oh, good luck. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. Dude, Dude, take the, this the, seven the year deal for 14 million total, but I'll yeah. get you a side gig. Yeah, 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 you guys, I'll, hey, I'll get you. gonna win the cup. It's we're gonna, gonna win the cup. So don't wanna wait free. So don't want to wait in your per diem pack. You're getting 120 a day every day you're on the road next I love year, you guys buddy. Talk about the contracts, though. Whether I agree, disagree, don't know. I have no. What, I want to know your opinion on what, like, what these top end guys should be making. Whether you think there should be a soft cap. Uh, do you like the proposed idea? And I think uh, they're like GMs or not GMs. Agents have said in the past about having like one player have a franchise tag mm -hmm. where it doesn't count towards the cap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where are you? Where are your stance on all this? Yeah, no, I, I love this stuff. My stance is uh, I'm extremely confident about our sport. I'm extremely confident about our sport for a few reasons, namely the talent we have. I mean, obviously, uh, the guys that I'm lucky enough to work with and our group is, but there's a lot of tremendous players uh, across the league that I don't know and don't work with. And so the game, I don't think, has ever been richer with talent. Yeah, I think we've got, you know, the Canadian marketplace is a Canadian marketplace you know, well, we've got ESPN and TNT said we've got the right kind of things brewing. Um, I'm a, a big supporter of the PA. Um, I think Ron Hainsey and Marty Walsh um, uh, are doing a hell of a job and all the other people that are there. I can't rattle off 20 people. I think they have a healthy relationship with the league. Um, I think the key is for the league and the PA to do what what they're doing, which is continue to harness this growth and work together to, to drive it forward. And that's more of a macro level statement. These, you know, things that are going to be coming out. I mean, you were here at all-star weekend, so I don't know when this is airing or not airing, but, um, you know, the Olympics are likely to happen and all these kinds of different things. You know, I love all that macro, put that in a big stew. Uh, with respect to the marketplace, going back to what I said earlier, look, we live in our own ecosystem, right? So there's things in the hockey business that are not unique to just the hockey business. They're in every business ecosystem. And then there are the things that are unique to the hockey business. We have our own salary cap um, and our own structure, our own ownership group. So um, while you can pull from other sports, uh, we have to figure out how to actualize what's realistic, right? This, uh, these improvements, whatever they are for players, which I think there's lots of things that we can do to improve it for players in the league, uh, aren't going to be done in the court of public opinion, right? They're going to be done by thoughtful discussion on the realities of how to improve it. Um, you know, escrow is, no one likes escrow. I don't want escrow. You don't want escrow. Uh, but we work in a percentage-based system. That's the system we work in, hence the hard cap, right? Um, obviously next year we'll have uh, a cascading upwards cap, um, just under 88 million. Um, you know, you'll have, um, some contracts expiring across the league or closer to expiry on some situations. And I think the third prong of it, you'll have teams needing to make decisions. So you'll have, you know, the cap goes up by 4 million, some contracts are expiring, you're getting close to expiry. And the, like I said, the third prong is the need to do some stuff, right? Um, you know, we have a hard job as as an agent, right? You want to deliver for your people all the time. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm not batting a thousand. I try to um, in every way possible. Um, I want to do that. Uh, I think teams want to do the same thing. You know, uh, I actually, as much as I know, business is going to tease me for this and, and you guys will jump on me like GMs have a hard job too, right? And I respect that, right? Um, they're dealing with a puzzle, a budget, you know. Um, it's and, the owners who don't have a hard job. <laughs> Well, well, it I guess it depends they how they got there. They did at one point, but now they're kind of just laughing. Well, yeah, I think that's that's been the hardest part. Like, we have this system, you're right. Whether we like it or not, this is the system we're in. I definitely think there's ways that we should and can improve it. I'm not going to sit here and and pontificate exactly what those things are, not because I'm keeping it from you guys or because I'm, uh, I don't know. I just think there's a lot of really good momentum. And like, you know, I look at this like any deal, the, the PA and the league have competent people. There's a lot of competent agents. There's very competent players. And I think just all the smart people have to really harmonize in a way. I mean, I work for players. 
and I work at Wasserman and that's all I care about. But, 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 but it has to be a collective yeah. effort to grow the pie. Yeah. Like, so, so do you think the top end guys are being paid fairly for what they're providing the league? Like, do you think that? I don't. I don't. I don't. Right. And okay. that's not said. And that's not said disrespectfully. That's just math, though. It's just math. Okay, yeah. Sure. Like, yeah. like, I don't say it disrespectfully. I think that they're not yet. This is the system we're in. So, you yeah. know, you try and come as close to what their do, value do you, should be. Do you have a thought in mind how you think that that would be able to happen? Is it uh, right now? I think the the most one player can make is twenty percent of his team's ca team's cap. Right? Is that the rule? It's twenty percent of what the time of so oh, it's twenty percent of the cap at time of signing. Do you think that like, that should be bumped up? Do you think that there should be like players who are maybe drafted? Like for instance, they drafted Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, Nylander. Should the, the team receive discount based on the cap because they were homegrown talent? Like why should there be punishment to retain top end talent if you were able to draft and develop it? It's like, a great. What's, yeah. what's the what, what do you what do you think it can go in order to get these like Connor where he should be making maybe twenty million a year for for his eighty two game schedule? I guess I'll answer it two ways. the The first answer to it is macro level in the next few years with this CBA, we're all eating or drinking. I'm butchering this from the same trough. So in the short term, it's how do we players, union, league, sponsors, all the constituents come together and understand the more we work together and collaborate while we have our own constituencies, the more everybody benefits. That's the macro thought. To answer your micro question, which are fucking great questions, I don't know yet. And I think for, I don't think anybody knows, right? Um, I, if they do, great. I don't think there's specific answers yet because right now, quite frankly, if the pie is as fat as possible. There was a global pandemic and all those things. Players can continue to make money. It, it's it's more the mechanisms in the system than the system mm -hmm. itself, right? Uh, and yet, how do you fix that? I think that's what's going to have to be sorted and reconciled over the next year. What are those specific things to give more elasticity to star players? Well, one thing I was just going to quickly add, do you believe in the growth of the league from like a larger scale? And is that why you're tending to say sign a four-year deal rather than a eight-year deal? Because like there's obviously a, a lot of money there guaranteed, but you're saying, well, I think the trajectory is even higher that therefore I'm going to sign up. Because like that's like an un mm -hmm. unorthodox way to sign it, mm -hmm. right? In your prime, you think you'd sign an eight-year deal? But I think the best players, that's what I was actually going to ask. It makes sense for Matthews and other guys. And maybe, may maybe, maybe like Owen Tippett just signed eight-year deal. Yeah, like who knows? But the best players, like, dude, let's go a little shorter. Let's hit it again and again. And I think that's probably what was your thought process doing his recent deal. And any yeah, system, yeah. that's the only way you could probably make it more fair for that player. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a combination of things, right? Like, I feel like every deal is its own unique situation, every player. Uh, so I look at them all, like, as their own. Um, I think it's a combination. I think, yeah, some of it is knowing that there might be some changes and some elasticity, so there's no question that that's part of it. I think it's also just, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about the long-term deals, right, as though it's some commitment by the player. Like, I hear that, too, that is nonsense, when someone says, oh, well, he's committed because he signed eight years. Huh? Why? He, he can ask for a money. trade. Yeah. The team cannot want him. So I, I think that's completely... He got the most security. Well, it's a misappropriation. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong. What I'm saying is when people talk about these contracts, like talk about them accurately, right? Hockey is a business where you can't reopen the deal. So if a guy signs a deal in 2021 and he wildly over exceeds it, people can't shade the deal in 2025 because you can't reopen it, right? Like it's a bet. These are these are bets like on how good is a guy going to be, how much are we willing to overpay yeah. now to get cheaper later, and vice versa. It's not a novel concept. I just think there's misappropriations to how people talk about the fucking deals. Like a guy says eight-year deal, good for him. That's great. That's amazing. I have some clients on eight-year deals. No problem. Uh, if we're talking about Austin's deal specifically, I mean, I think it, it's the other way to look at these short-term deals is it actually gives cap relief. So, you know. Rightly or wrongly, it's such a usually the more years you get, the more cap money you get, right? So given there might be elasticity, given there might be changes, like try and pick the sweet spot to protect a player's individual value in the right way uh, and also try and um, preserve the team cap, knowing that there's a budget, there's a cap. You know, it goes back to if a player, one player, a collection of players take too much money, oh, well, they took all the money, they don't want to win. Like, that's not true. Like, one doesn't equal the other, right? Um I just don't buy any of that. Uh, I think Austin's deal is his deal. It fit for him. It made sense. Flexibility, like I said, within the cap 
you know, more years means a higher cap hit. So what does that mean? Um, more scrutiny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about in terms of like your business and dealing with GMs? And and it's it's like it's fuck you matches. It's going back and forth. But in the end, it, it has to be. Professional, Do you have a rubber right? strap on for each one when you're doing a deal that you put on <laughs> while you're on the phone with them? But you know, like in terms of like, all right, the you deal we're, we're so far apart right now. But in a short time frame, we end up becoming like together in this. Like it, it's got to work pretty quickly. We'll also at one point thinking like this ain't getting done. Which GM have you bullied the worst? Um, <laughs> answering wits, <laughs> answering wits questions uh, first, and I'll get to business. Have you made one of them cry? Yet? I'll get to biz. I'll get to business after. <laughs> um, like I said, I'm not saying this in a in a silly way. I'm just laughing because I can't look at business in the eye right now. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, the GMs have really hard jobs and their staffs. Uh, and yeah, sometimes I think in my case, um, conversations could be spirited. Um, I like to think they're always respectful. Um, I think, I think, uh, I pretty much like every single GM. I don't know how they feel about me. Um, <laughs> you know, you get into heated discussions sometimes, you know, you're passionate about something. Uh, a manager is convicted and his staff, his team, his AGMs. Uh, are convicted that a player's worth X and this is why and as a representative and as the player and their family or the important people in their in their support network you feel it's a different number you you know things can get emotional can get that way I I really try to and again I'll I'll see if uh if what kind of calls I get based on saying this I think of every deal as really a collaboration not a negotiation yeah. the collaborative uh you know concept can get difficult if you know again the well, collaborating you have to do that off. with our system you really truly have to do that well you you do you do you do based on the system in part um but i think also the best negotiations are done privately um you know i think that uh everyone has their own style yeah, and been really sneaky. you guys have been sneaky though you've been good with the, even the austin stuff like of course he's so high profile and so good but like no one really had any Real until the very end. Well, I put yeah. My, well, yeah, right. Which you know, Which look, I put my, I try and put myself in, and I know my clients do this. You try and put yourself in someone else's shoe. Like if I was working for a team, and you know, uh, there's certain things I'd be like, why, right? And I'd like to think of how I would at least like an approach to me. Maybe I don't agree with the number, but at least how would I want to be approached? Whether than that, whether it's a plain contract or something else. Like, and so I feel like the best way to do it, even when it gets uncomfortable or you're at odds, or you're in a disagreement and Juddy, the numbers X and I say it's Y or whatever the case may be. Um, I just think it's better served to be done private. Like, I just don't think like as pundits, as people who love hockey, sports fans, like how there's a million billion shows and talk about it, but like some decisions aren't made in the public sphere. So why put them in the public sphere? Mm -hmm. Like, like why do that? Uh, and, and why would I want my clients and why would they want to be having their business out there? Like you do it behind closed doors. Sometimes, like I said, it gets how it gets, but you know, I, I got to say, I, I feel like ultimately, even when it gets heated, everyone, everyone knows that we all have a job. Part to of do. It. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who's the GM you're chummiest with? Let's keep it positive. Like who I mean, I got respect for all 32. I I uh oh, fuck I'm just saying off, that right. to you. I'm just saying that to you. We making I this political. See how, I you said, see how you react to that. Like who you said, <laughs> I mean, who I you said in Christmas emojis too on Christmas yeah. Day. I, I don't think I sent any Christmas emojis. Not to any I mean, of the different guys. No, I I've Thanks for buying all my kids it, my kids and family's gifts this year. Yeah. The, there's a few other things I say. Um uh some of them know, emoji. Yeah. Uh no, I it depends because there's some guys I I known for a long time. That's why it goes back to like sitting here and remembering we were at Globe in Vancouver yeah. 20 years ago and what we ate, and now I'm sitting here and you're on this show. It's crazy. Like, you know, I, I think of guys who actually I worked on their behalf in some capacity, whether that's Marty Bordeaux as a president of a team, and I I represent Jeremy, his son, or Danny Briere, Rob Blake, or Horkoff. Like, I just think a lot of the guys that I worked with that are inside teams, there's a different kind of history, right? Because I had that. And then there's a handful of guys that, I don't want to say we grew up in the business together, but some guys who are AGMs. Like, I've, I've known Julian Breezeball a long time. Um, you know, Chris Jury, I didn't Is know was pretty player. intense? Yeah. Breezeball? Yeah. But I think they all are. Yeah, but they all are. I mean, it's really tough because I, I think of Julian just because I've known him for so long when he worked in Montreal. I'm thinking of the guys like... 
almost as who I've known the longest. That were coming up as you were coming yeah, up. Yeah, like Jason Botterill and I known each other for a long time, had early dealings for, you know, uh, Jeff Gordon and I. Just for whatever reason, some guys I've known longer and different, like you said, and grew up with them. I've actually, Lou was the first GM I ever met when he was in New Jersey. Um, he choked and, you out. Yeah. No, he gave, well, at one point he gave me a cannoli. He gave him some no, sick, he gave me a cannoli. Yeah. cannoli. He gave him some sick Gucci cement shoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a cannoli, no shoes. Um, but no, I, I don't know that I'm chummy with any one of them. I, I look at it differently. I was having this conversation. That's why I'm just thinking with someone else in a different capacity how, you know, there's the ex player GM, right? There's the non, the guy who didn't play type GM. Uh, there's the, and there's then the legends, like who were like, un, like Iserman. Yeah. Then pocket. there's Stevie who's a player yeah. or Blakey hall of famers, yeah. right? There's all these different versions of guys. And so I was actually talking about, I don't know if I was talking with Shorzy, like just how it's it fascinating for me on the 32 teams, like how the structures are different, how you can have a similar title, but your functionality is different. Or like you said, what kind of career did you have? Yeah. It's all different. So I don't know that I'm chummy more with one more than the other. I'm not giving you the the bitch ass political answer. Okay. Um, I'd like to think I got a good enough relationship with every single one of them. I talk to maybe some guys more than others by virtue of um I got a client on their team. There's guys I talk to like Brad Chill living here in Toronto. I've known Brad for almost 20 years, right? Just relationships. Relationships. Yeah. It's just no like it's it's I'm charmed and feel very lucky that it's just yeah, like I've I've getting older. I've been in this business. It'll be officially 20 years that I've been in the agency business come this August. And you just realize like, just fuck, like lots of players, lots of people, guys are staying in coaching, scouting. There are big shot TV people now or whatever I call you guys. Uh, uh, mo mo liquor moguls, um, uh, you know, all that. I know Ryan Clooney was here. Um, you think we could, you think Pink Whitney, Pink Whitney could sign gambling Austin Matthews? Professional. Uh, yeah. What about gambling you professionals? Think, could we get Matthews and Connor in a Pink Whitney commercial? I mean, we'll talk about that. I don't, like I said, I don't do business in the public sphere. Okay, yeah. we'll talk about that. I was testing you. Jeff. I know. We'll talk, I was testing talk about that after. But yeah, I think it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's funny. And then like uh, a GM, I just won't name because I just won't name. Like I hadn't talked to him probably in four months. I don't have a particular client that I lead on his team. I texted him. Uh, this was a few weeks ago. I said, Hey, long time. Love to catch up on, on something for quickly. And he called me back in like 20 minutes and we chatted as though we chatted every day and it was super bubbly and to the point. Uh, it was probably a 10 minute conversation, a little bit of yuck yuck and a little bit of serious and that was it. So it kind of goes in waves like that. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know what uh, I don't know what they would say, but. I don't really care as long as uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as long as I'm. Listen, my job is the players, and I want to do it as respectfully and was with as with integrity and and trying to do it the the best way I can. Um, but uh, make no mistake, I will serve their interest, and that's all I care about. This, this guy started at the bottom. So now he's now here. Now you know why? Because he we let you go. I got to know. Now we, uh, when you sign one of these big ticket deals, what do you do to celebrate besides opening the pink? You go to get a time massage. Oh, time massage. Oh, hold on, too. And who do you tell when you sign the deal now? Because I know you do a private. Nothing leaks out. Any chance for a leakage for the boys? Whew. Um, and then the celebration. Zero chance for leakage. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the rumor boys. Yeah. Uh, I will start to maybe just either post your shows. I won't tell you stuff before because I, you know, but I'll after I'll be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, take that. I'll, I'll let you fail and correct yeah. you yeah. after. Yeah. So you can see. Like, stuff yeah. That could have been wrong. Yeah. yeah. That won't stop us. Let's get a, let's that get a, won't stop let's us. Let's get a telestrator up there and I'll, I'll break it down. Um, <laughs> No, I, I think it's just consistent in in just staying tight, keeping mm -hmm. it keeping it private uh, as much as possible. I think the teams appreciate that. Um, and I think, you know, uh, our clients like like that. I think that privacy is important um, to the plan. Also, you know, uh, I play a lot of chess and think about chess all the time. I mean, I, I smoke you. In I chess. think about we're going to play after. Um, I don't think he knows the rules. I think oh, about wait, steals I forever, you right? I You know, we think about them forever. Like I kind of obsess over the planning of it. So... Honestly, when it actually happens, it's like, it's not that I'm not happy. It's like, okay, I've been thinking about it. It's almost like, it's yeah. weirdly, it's super exciting He's in a, a sense where it's guy. like, been Literally. living this deal. Yeah, I've been living this deal. Um, and then, no, I mean, we didn't really do anything. I mean, we just, it was just like, like you sign your deal. Everyone else is going to make a big deal of it. And like other players, let's get back to work. 
you know, and that's all the guys. Like you get to that point, and I'm not just saying that. Like, not even a stogie or nothing. Like a no. I mean, you know, have a nice whiskey, glass of wine, nice, nice, nice white tequila, a nice dinner. But call up your eighth grade teacher. I, like, I, fucking I, told you I'd be somebody. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you just. I think you know <laughs> some things do the talking for themselves. I mean, uh, and I think you just the more you just act like you enjoy it, but it's not a big deal. The more you guys stay balanced. Mm -hmm. Like you sign your deal, yeah, you 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 keep going, and and again, like I'm really. Um, lucky today i've got great colleagues great support system great clients but i really have a great relationship with all my clients and their girlfriends or wives like i've said before and i feel really really lucky again there's a bunch of guys i need to text and call back so fellas i love you for my slow callbacks and text backs um it's what do you mean really this like that. 90 minutes you sat down with us or, or in yeah, general? Well, you know, I think these 90 minutes or, oh, yeah. you know, in general, <laughs> there's always, there's always something I'm, that's kind of going on in my brain. I, I do make the joke, which I will give to you, Biz, you know, you don't call me a fully, a, a you know what, um, I do often tell people that I do think the National Hockey League runs through my cell phone. <laughs> that's well, a it does. It does. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. run itself. In some ways it does. Yeah. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> Wizard ways. of Judd. Yeah. You know? This has been awesome, This is man. great, we, Judd. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate so much. you sitting down with us. Oh, yeah, yeah, here. I got to ask, I was told by a reliable source that you sandbagged pretty hard a tennis tournament this summer. Which, where was this tournament? In Arizona? It could have been in Arizona. Oh, because there was another thing I was accused of. Judd so small he plays on a pickleball ball court, he <laughs> thinks it's tennis. <laughs> <laughs> um... Actually, you'd be you'd be proud of me in my tennis game for with my I'm more like uh I play like Federer a little bit. No. Um, <laughs> uh I love tennis. Um a lot of our clients love tennis. So we had a little tournament this summer in Arizona uh called the Camelback Invitational, uh, which Austin and some of our, our buddies in Arizona organized, and uh we made it to the finals. Uh, and I lost, but no sandbagging. No sandbagging? Nope. Nope. I wish I would love to tell you guys that I sandbag, but yeah, he's he, one of the titles. Did he like yeah. did someone go to a loser pool and he like he lost I, the first one, battled I mean, through the weak side, then came out the other side? I was just told Judd is a big sandbagger when it comes to tennis tournaments. S sometimes I am, you know, depends, but you know, depends. You'll, and then the same the source, the same source also told me to ask about a birthday party that you went to this past year. If you went to any good birthday parties. A birthday party I went to. Uh well. As I'm looking at these sick jerseys um, made by Drew House, um, I think it's uh, people know Justin Bieber and Austin have become pretty good friends over the last Never several years. Uh, and obviously exciting this this weekend and all all of his and, and Drew House's involvement. Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited to a birthday party last March in LA and um, went to Justin's house and it was very humbling and I remember getting a text and uh, he's he's an amazing person. His wife and him are just incredible and it's been really cool to get to know them. Uh, I'm lucky that, you know, him and Austin hit it off so well and I've had that fortune. And so I actually was on a plane um, and Justin sent me a text and invited me and I texted Austin. I just thought it was like a joke, right? Kind of thing. And Austin was funny. He said, show the person sitting next to you on the plane, see if they believe you. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was pretty, pretty cool experience to go there and yeah he's awesome he loves hockey what do you like, bring a guy like how that? did these jerseys come about with, with uh drew well House? i i think it's you guys may know like so drew House has had a relationship with the leafs obviously making those jerseys yeah. and other like apparel and things like that which has been really cool um you know we have our own stuff we talk about just sort of austin and drew house separate from you know separate from uh the leaf relationship and then in conjunction with and then now obviously they through all that, getting more exposure, you know, Justin's love of hockey and his passion to help grow hockey and make it uh, even bigger and better than it is, his love for the Leafs. Uh, I think it just came is, about. Is there a backstory behind Drew? Justin's middle name. And so Justin and uh, his best friend, Ryan Good, they founded the brand. Um, and Laura is, is currently running it. They have a great team of people out of Los Angeles. And so it's part of his middle name. And for them, I think it's, it's more of a you know, it's a sense of community, right? And inclusiveness and just uh, a way of being and kind of spreading good love, good energy. And it's less of a clothing company than just like more about that. And so um, I wasn't part of all of it, but from what I know, based on in our relationships there, yeah, the the league obviously saw the great stuff. They were obviously involved too with the Leafs. What well, was a Leaf project to know there's jerseys coming into the league. And so I think that just was like, look, the game's in Toronto. He loves hockey, loves the Leafs. Him and Austin are, have a great relationship. 
why not, you know, make the jerseys and, and have some of that uh, fingerprint on it. And um, you guys will see uh, as it comes out, they did great gift baskets or gift baskets, like gift packages. I can't even for the players, it, for the players nice. like some cool stuff and swag. And it's awesome, right? You have a guy like Justin, as talented as he is and his craft and as popular he is loving hockey. And it's, it's really cool. Really that, nice. Like that's like, so not the NHL though. It's like that's good though. Oh, I know. I know. Reach. Uh, I think that that was pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, John, yeah. you're a legend, buddy. That Keep was awesome. Dude, I can't thank believe so they much. got you to come in here. Super agent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, well, oh, yeah. No, well, uh, <laughs> sorry. I thought. Uh, no, I appreciate you guys having me. Um, and hopefully, I'll make a second appearance and uh, make sure that we get Merle's a good job here soon. Yeah, that's what I. You're you're hired as my agent against Biz coming I'm, up in a few. When months. you, do, I'm in. I'm in. Have, I'm you, in. Ha, have you already done over a billion dollars in contracts? Like, you keep track of that. I don't keep track of that. Okay. All right. Well. I think Alan Walsh does, and when he when you reach like a certain milestone, let's get you back on. Well, I don't need milestones to come back okay, on, do done. I? We'll see. You, we'll see you every week. Every week. Yeah, I'm not. We'll get you for. I'm not for a week. I'm not here for milestones. You need to give me a silver microphone. <laughs> yeah, but, exactly, yeah. You know. I love it. Well, thanks, fellas. You guys do an awesome job, and I appreciate you having me. Keep killing it. Love you, buddy. Thanks, gents. Yep. All right. Before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Kraken. Today, we are talking about Kraken, one of the OG crypto platforms. These guys have been around way longer than the hockey team for over a decade, in fact. And Kraken's world-class security is like having an all-star goalie protecting your assets 24-7. It gives you peace of mind when it comes to trading. And with over 190 cryptocurrencies available, there's something for everyone here. Yeah, or maybe you're just looking for new ways to approach your strategy in crypto. Who knows? Either way, the Kraken Learn Center is an awesome educational resource for all experience levels. I'm a newbie to this, so I can't wait to learn some more about it. So you know what? Join the 10 million clients already using Kraken's intuitive platform to buy crypto. Go to kraken.com slash chicklets and see what crypto can be. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Big thanks to Judd for jumping on us. I'm so bummed out I missed this interview. I know we had a late schedule change. I wasn't able to get there, but it was uh, fortunate to catch up with him uh, at the All-Star game when I had some other adventures going on. But Biz, Wit, I know you guys found out some uh, interesting NHL trivia a couple weeks ago that if a team pulls their goalie in overtime and they lose, they do not get the point. And we saw it in real time. An empty netter overtime game winner goal from Jonathan Marsh. So who else on that fucking Vegas team this year? Wild scene. Minnesota did need the two points, but I think I, I believe it's the first time this has ever happened. Were you guys watch live? Did you see it on Twitter? Biz, take us through your journey on this first E N O T G W G. Well, I, I love the move. You need points, right? What, what are you saving it for? And, so why not uh, so do that, it in regulation? At the end of the game? Yeah, because that's uh, because, because why? I think that I I um. Uh, I don't know. I guess they're maybe chasing he's... down a team like they don't want them to get any points. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. wow. Okay. Well, that yeah, maybe they, man, it's a great point. Now, Jesus what I've Christ. read is that it's a lot easier to score uh, four on three than it would be six on five. Right. That's but yeah, that's the only it's almost ever. like take the risk. And I and it sounds like I'm I'm dogging this decision. Like I loved it and I totally get it. And it already worked once, but. I think you got to make sure that you try to get the two without Vegas getting anything. And so it kind of, to me, it's like, oh, just, just right. Just do that at the, the last minute or two of, of, of regulation. You're not getting the point if they score in overtime anyways. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point where this conversation goes for me though, is we were having a talk, this talk with Wayne at TNT and I just love the aggressive approach and hockey wasn't always that way where he even explained, and I had no idea this was the case before Patrick Waugh was in Colorado as a goaltender. So early two thousands, it was like frowned upon to pull the goalie. If you were um, more than even a minute. And if you were down by two goals, teams wouldn't pull the goalie. They wouldn't even do that. Like, were you like, were you aware of that? I was like, what you're telling me? Like, like if a team was, you know, down a goal, like, you know, they wouldn't pull it with like two and a half minutes left to maybe give their top lines a little bit more time where let's say that they don't score then, you could call the timeout and then do, no, last minute is when they would pull the goalie until Patrick Waugh 
And then Patrick Waugh in Colorado was the first one to say, no, let's go. Get me out of the net. What the fuck are we saving it for? Down two goals. So I just found that like it kind of tells you how a, 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 of a conservative game hockey is, and I don't think anybody wants to kind of stand out and be the first guy to like maybe try it and get scrutinized. But I love the fact that many took this approach down the stretch, and like even to your point, with they could have even done it even more aggressively by doing it at the end of regulation to not allowing a team ahead of them to get the point. Now it was Vegas who there are chasing, so yes, it would have made more sense. So I just found it fascinating that before the early 2000s teams wouldn't pull the goalie down two goals did you know that no i didn't i didn't even know that i did know that it used to be way later that like you know 90 hundred seconds left you're wait no we're waiting wait till 50 50 seconds left to pull them where it's like if you have an offensive zone draw minute and a half left you're down by one do it now do it then and it's become earlier and earlier but i didn't know that they never did it with two um minnesota getting back to them First, let's talk about Brock Faber. Um, it, it's it, it, it's going to end up being a tough, disappointing year for the Wild, but I think their fan base is just probably looking at a guy and thinking, like, we have, through a trade, not even the draft, we have a legit future 10 years number one defenseman. And I have been beyond impressed. I compared him to Charlie McAvoy, maybe not as physical, but even the way they look, I said that a few weeks ago, he can do it all. He can skate. He can defend. He's got a great stick. He's got 40 points this year. He's been outstanding offensively. He really can do it all. Minnesota kid, played at Minnesota, heartbreaking loss last year to Quinnipiac. Hops right in the league, no problem. He hopped in after the uh, national championship loss, and then, which probably helped him. At least, all right, I, I've, I've played some NHL games. I'm going to go into this season. I know I can dominate, and he has. Rookie of the year discussion. Wild fans are all up in my mentions that he deserves it. Your argument is valid in that he's played the full season. He's averaged 25 minutes a game. I'm with you. And I, I would say, besides several other years, uh, maybe the Crosby Ovechkin year, Austin Matthews, year, like he's your rookie of the year. I just, I lean towards Bedard. I think it's Bedard. And it's mainly because Bedard dominates. So, do, so does um, Brock Faber. But Bedard's done it with the expectations being so ridiculously high that living up to them seemed impossible, and he has. And Minnesota's a better team. And the fact of the, the, fact yeah. of the matter is, Bedard, Bedard changes the game in an even greater way. So, so like, if they gave it to Faber, I wouldn't be like, oh my God, this is bullshit. No, 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 no. He's deserving of it, but it's just Bedard's that much above him. And I know he's missed time, but like, I, I've watched Chicago games, and it's, it's, it's watching a generational talent. He's doing things out there that you heard about, and you heard and WHL and World Juniors, and nope, it translates to the NHL. He's going to yeah. be a true superstar for years, so that's my rookie of the year pick. But I get your gripe, Wild fans. Right. I understand it completely, because Faber has been that good, and, and to, to, to go into the season and be like, oh, they got this nice player, and he looked good at the end of the year, well, he's... He's looked way better than anyone could even imagine. So that's great for them. And I'll, I know I'm long-winded, but my last thing, in the positivity from Faber and Kaprizov's second half and Boldy's second half, ever since Heinz took over, there are some really bright signs. There's also a little bit of uh, weir- wariness, I guess the word is, from Wild fans in that the future's a little muddled. I don't know if that's the correct word, but it's like this will only be the second time they've missed the playoffs since 2012. But they only have two series wins in 2014 and 2015. So while making the playoffs all these years, or most of these years, they haven't really had much playoff success. And in that, you haven't really gotten a, a superstar draft pick. Now, Kaprizov, that's, that's next level. But you kind of got lucky where you drafted him. And you got lucky with the trade with Faber. I don't know where they end up heading. Because yes, they're getting the cap relief of Suter and, and Parisi. But it is a weird time to be a Wild fan. They've always been good and solid, but not good enough, yet not bad enough. So they've been in no man's land a little bit. And I think going in next year, there's, there's definitely some question marks on like, can they get over the hump and become yeah. a true contender? Yeah, and it's hard. It's hard to find the gems in free agency. More of the time, you're probably overpaying really someone with that cap space. They will be gaining another guy who I think is tremendous for that core. And you might have said it as Ericsson Eck. I oh, think I that he, oh, he's yeah. a true so underrated. Like, 
so underrated and underappreciated. So I agree with what you're saying, Wit. And then even going back to the Faber thing, I think it's victim of circumstance where you just come in the same year as this generational talent. Yeah. Uh, Bedard's also playing with the Rockford Ice Hogs. So he's got that offensive anchor, yet he's still doing what he does every night. And to say that because Faber's playing on a better roster and a better team, it's not to say he's getting easier matchups or not having to play against the other team's top talent. It's more of a fact that you can you can disappear in a sense where all not the pressure and the weight is is falling on you solely, where night in and night out, it's like, hey, Bedard, are you, you going to keep us in this one? And if he doesn't score... It's usually like I would love to see their record in games that he doesn't score when in the lineup, like from from like a points perspective. So and even a goals perspective. So it's uh, the sample size with the time that he's played. I definitely lean towards Bedard, a generational talent and just eye test. It's fucking it's nuts what he's doing at his age. So, yeah, the eye test now in 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 uh, another aspect for wild fans. Reason to get excited. Uh, you're going to resign Faber. And the number will probably be a little shocking. Like, I think you're looking at eight years, 75 million, you know, whoa. over nine. Yeah. How much dude, is, I, whoa, whoa, how much is that per year? That's like, that would nine. be a little over nine per year. Oh, that would be like oh 9.25 a year. Just getting close one to nine five. season? But he, Easily. he's young. He's, he's already proven that he can do this. He's only yep. going to get better. The cap's going up. That's buddy, what he's fucking want. Kale McCarr makes nine and a half. Dude, that's I know, but buddy, he level. signed it two years ago. That's, that's not the level. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's not the, the level. That's, that's the that's the ceiling that Garrett has him at this. He's gonna get nine between. I don't know. I don't, two if, and you, nine if you eight. if you ask Bill Garrett, do you think Faber can be good as Kale McCarr? I don't know if he's saying yes. Saying, I don't know if I'm one GM that. is saying that. But Biz, I'm Biz. A, when you when you have the leverage and you played like this and the cap's gonna only do, like I put it this way in six years if he's making nine point two five I don't think anyone says a word. No, I Bogging. get that, I get that, but but I know, I, I, I know. I've obviously seen enough where if he does nine two five I'd say hey great job to him and his agent. But as a as a general manager for and keep in mind some people are like how the you fuck want is this low. guy you want low how, how how is this guy already up for contract so he. He was fortunate enough to burn a year off where at the end of the season before he came up for a few games. And, you know, when you're a stud player and and that was kind of maybe some of the fallout with the Cutter Goche thing where he wanted to be signed and have burnt a year off his deal. Because that way, maybe this year he could have came in, done what Faber's doing. And then all of a sudden it's July 1st, you've played one year in the league and you're up for the Calder and bingo, bango, 75 sheets on the way. So now, Biz, I, Biz, we, think if of how many of these... It- Think of how Sorry, many of I interrupted these, you. No, no, I say, hey, fuck you. I do it all the time. I just think that, I think that eight and a half at eight years, if you slide that over if you're Billy G and he's going to say, no, I'm going to play this out, buddy, you're going into your sophomore year. Go ask Marit Sider how his sophomore year went. I'm not saying he was brutal, but I'm saying your, your lever, his leverage was nowhere near yeah. it was after he won the Calder. I don't what think Billy G cares about leverage. I think he he would have signed this yesterday if he could. I think Garen knows what he has. He wants to lock it up. I don't think he gives All right, a fuck no, about leverage. No, I I do think that. Are you Bill, talking he, to Garen? He Are wouldn't come in. Are you talking to Garen? That. I'm not a snitch That's guy. not his that. first offer. Like if he could ever get him at eight point two five a year, yeah, you're laughing. Yeah, but it's not gonna happen. If this kid wants to like decide to like go that way. He's going to get an enormous payday one way or the other. If if they can come in at under nine point under nine a year for eight years, then that's a huge win for the Wild. Oh, you absolutely. want to know what I would do? I would slide eight two five over at the desk, and if he says no, I'll say I'll see you in Iowa next season, kid. And you don't got to clear waivers. <laughs> Sign like, I'll the see goddamn you in, I'll, contract. I'll see you in Vegas in fucking August. Sign the fucking <laughs> deal right now, or you're going. It would Iowa. be hard if you give him eight years. That would be sixty six million to say no to that. That's what I'm saying. Say no to it, kid. You'll be eating soggy subs in no time. Uh, well, You're not getting no tape to tape passes down there, buddy. Uh, some uh, Minnesota news just come over the wire biz. Ryan Hotman, uh, he had his phone hearing on Monday. Uh, DOPS gave him a three game suspension uh, for chucking his twig in the direction of the officials. He did get high stick by Noah Hannaford late in the game. Was not called. He was irate. Uh, Vegas won the game shortly thereafter, like we just said with Macho. So he chucked a stick on the ice. Didn't come close to any of the officials, but it's been pretty much a guarantee you're going to get three games, uh, which is what he got. So 
Oh right, Hoppin? Oh, my God. That's it, uh, a little his, aggressive. People were saying online, I, didn't, I never saw the clip, so he didn't throw it at an official? Well, he threw it onto the ice, with like in the general direction, but he didn't come anywhere close to hitting well, anybody. With four it. refs, they could be like, "Yeah, that thing yeah. was right at me." Yeah, yeah, I'll send, I'll send it to you right, right now while we're talking here. But okay. uh, no, it, just, it literally just came over the wire. No, he didn't come close to hitting him. I think it's just the the idea, the action. Plus, he's a repeat offender, unsportsmanlike conduct. His third suspension in the last fourteen months, uh, third of his career as well. He's also been fined nine times. He's going to lose about 21000 per game this season, but next season, Biz, he would lose 49000 a game because of the race yeah, he's, he's getting. Yeah. Uh, and also, one other thing with Faber, uh, what we didn't mention, uh, only six players in the NHL have more uh, time of ice than this guy. He's a rookie, 21 years old. Only six fucking guys get more ice time. 825, sign the fucking deal, kid. 9-3, 9-3. Uh, also, Mark andre Fleury, another Minnesota note. He could be back next year. Uh, a lot of people kind of, I think, had a raised eyebrow when he did not get traded at the deadline this year. Everyone was assuming it would be his last year. But he said, uh, quote, the door is open more today for a return than it was in September or October. I ended up feeling better, and I started playing better. I rediscovered the joy of playing hockey. Yeah, it's probably Minnesota or retirement. So, I mean, great news for the NHL biz. I mean, anytime you have Mark andre Fleury in the league, it's, it's a good time for the NHL. So, hopefully he's back next I wish, year in uh... Minnesota. I wish you would announce his final tour where every every team would have rose petals on the ground leading him in to his final game in that arena. Could you could you imagine what they would do in Montreal for him if they knew that it was la- his last game there? Is he, could you imagine? Wh- why do you think it would be like his home province as opposed to the teams he's played for having bigger send-offs? Well, I just think uh, it, it, Montreal... I would consider it the 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 co-winner of the hockey mecca, and I think that uh, yeah, I think that they would give him a proper send off, just as much as a team that he did play for. That's my oh, opinion. Okay. okay, so yeah, little Jaffe Jaffa style. Uh, Jake Gensel returned to Pittsburgh for the first time since he was traded to uh, Carolina at the deadline. Uh, a, a pretty emotional meeting. I'm not sure if you guys saw the clip yet. And he did say my intention was to stay. Uh, they thought there was a better decision, so obviously he. Moved on. I'll be curious to see if he does end up back in Pittsburgh. But uh, since he joined Carolina, 14 points his first 10 games. Tied the Wizard, Ray Whitney, for the most points by a skater through their first 10 games with the Hurricanes. Wit, does he end back end up back in Pittsburgh, Jake? No. No? Okay. I don't I, I know that's been thrown out there. Why, why would he go back to Pittsburgh? He's going to get a bunch of money wherever he goes, and Pittsburgh's going to be horrible. I know playing with Sid is is... Is awesome, but I just I can't see that kid wanting to just go back to what's going to be a pretty bad team for a long time on a huge lengthy deal. Here's where I may disagree: is maybe he does test free agency, and I know that people say, "Oh, the cap's going up," and and maybe there's all these teams that are going to be willing to throw big money at him. But maybe it's like last year where some guys are a little underwhelmed by the market. So maybe in fact, what he was asking for, assuming that Pittsburgh would have handed it over. They don't necessarily have to go there if the market doesn't, where they could say, "Hey, come back at a, I don't know, an eight time." Like, I always we always throw out the eight times eight. Like, what do you think that that he was asking for from Pittsburgh? I he have no idea, asking, but what nine million? The, the, the cap didn't go up last year; it's going up four million bucks. Like, that's not going to be the case this summer. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm he saying just, is maybe he's that free. There's sometimes there's certain individuals who expect they'll be paid on what they think their value is where it doesn't come at them as as much as they expected to where yeah. maybe Dubis didn't like the number that they were coming in back. And listen, I'll say this for the second time in a, in a month here. I'm not a Dubis defender, but maybe they were like, hey, we've, you know, we've won cup, we've won a cup here and Sid likes playing with us, hand over nine and a half for eight years. And he's like, uh, no, he's getting a little bit older and I don't even think he would make that in free agency. Therefore, he has to come back. I don't know. That's just my only. That's my only other pushback on what you're saying. Like he's not. He's how old is he? Is he thirty, 30 years old? Thirty two no. years old. Twenty nine. He'll be thirty in okay. October. Okay. I mean, it's. I mean, I think even Reinhardt's a year or two younger, maybe. So it's just it's hard to throw. It's hard to throw a, a lot of money at guys where where we know it's it's a young man's league now. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's all I got to say about that. So maybe right, back well. in Pittsburgh. Yeah, we'll see what happens. 
Uh, all right, gang. You know, we love to have fun and, and joke around. And uh, we know you guys come here. Guys and gals come here for an escape. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the real world is what it is. And sometimes it, it touches us. And, you know, we just uh, want to share. It's terrible news since we last met up. Uh, NYPD officer Jonathan Dilla. Uh, he was killed on the line of duty last Monday. And, uh, you know, come to find out, it's it's a weird thing to find out that uh, a guy who passed away is was a fan of what you do. And we found he was, he was a Chicklets fan. And, and it just. You already said that a cop died. Then you find out you have this sort of weird cosmic connection. It just it, it makes it so much sadder. He was a, a 31 year old conducting a traffic stop. Uh, he was shot by this fucking scumbag, convicted felon. He's been in and out of jail, arrested dozens of times. Just to dirtbag. You wonder why he's on the streets. And, and the the cruelest thing he wasn't even driving the car. He was in the passenger seat, and he and he still shot this cop for no fucking reason. Uh, it, it's just a horrible tragedy. Uh, he has a wife, uh, Stephanie, a young son, Ryan. Uh, we want to send out deepest condolences to his family, his friends, all his brother and sister officers on the job, who risked their asses day in and day out. Uh, you know, being a cop, With not man, much like, credit, man. No, and, and, and you know it's it's a job that you know as I got older in Boston, it was, it, you know they were they were looking for recruits, and I, and I could have gone on. I says no, it, I commend every guy who does the job. I have cousins, so many friends who work the job. I I wasn't willing to do it, man, because you have to be willing to die for fucking strangers, and it, it's such a commendable and honorable uh, profession that these guys do. And and also, what I want to shout out Wayne Jetsky, uh, uh, uh buddy at Boston, his dad was killed by, uh, in a very similar fashion 20 years ago. And he wrote a blog on Boston. I thought it was such a courageous thing for him to do to, to be vulnerable and share what happened to him. And it was the, the circumstances were so remarkably similar, similar, and he wanted to bring attention to it. And, you know, long story short, that Dave Portnoy at Boston, our, our boss, he's always uh, been great to the firefighters and cops. And we put T-shirts on sale. We raised uh, $750,000 in, I want to say, three days. And Dave matched it. So uh, we were able to give his widow and son uh, $1.5 million. I, and I know everyone complains about fucking everything nowadays. And yes, they, they get widow funds and, and bereavement funds. People don't understand what, what this does to a fucking family, to a life. Like, this just, you know, helps them uh, pay this bill or pay that bill. Or just kind of like try to live their lives a little bit. So it's an awful fucking tragedy. I feel like I'm rambling a bit because it's so frustrating that this shit happens, that, that cops are killed by scumbags like this in and out of the jail. Uh, if you want to buy a shirt, I believe they are still on sale. All the proceeds do go to his family. So, uh, again, our condolences to, to the family, friends, uh, his brother and sister offices, uh, NYPD, Jonathan Dill. It's just an awful tragedy. And wait, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add or I or, or not. I know no, it's, you, it's uh, a hard thing uh, to say, all right. Yeah, yeah, it is. You did an I'm sorry. Job. I'm rambling. No, it's, it's, okay. it's, no, you didn't ramble at all. It, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And just to, think that his son will never know his dad makes me sick to my stomach and all, all i could say is that um it's going to be it's going to be hard at the nypd fdny game because hopefully we're able to do something special for his family and his friends and i think there was like seventy thousand police officers from around the country around north america that showed up to his funeral procession and and the wake and just like yeah, there, there's no way to describe it beyond heartbreaking and, and, and the fact that this fucking scumbag was, was, wasn't was behind bars. It makes me sick to my stomach. So um, hopefully we're able to honor his family and his friends the best way we can April 20th at the, at the very special game. And before those games, they, each year they honor guys they've lost and, and Ari is showing the shirt right now. So we're going to do our best to to honor Jonathan and... and um, you know, hug hug your loved ones. It's it's tough ending the show on something like this, but the the fact that we ended up finding out that he was a huge Chicklets fan, it it almost hits you a little bit harder. Like, oh my god, the fact you know maybe some shifts he was able to kill some time listening to us. It it just just hits you in a, in in a tough way. So, um, thank you guys for listening. And and as I said, you you hug your family and 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 if there's a police officer, a firefighter in, in your life or you run into one, you say thanks. They don't get enough of the thanks they deserve. Right. They deserve a lot more. You see people at their absolute worst being a police officer. And that's probably a really hard way to make a living. And those guys, they, they risk it all. So shout out to him. And um, we'll, we'll see you guys next week. Yeah. And sorry, but just a, a couple more uh, notes here. Uh, Thursday at 6 o'clock, Chicklets TV is going to have you guys uh, IceCon Chicago video. So 
At least we can bring a, a little levy there, some laughs there as well. Game notes, uh, 10 o'clock Thursday. And, G, we have a collaboration with the uh, incredible company here in Boston, 47 brand. They yeah. used to be known as Twins. So, uh, yeah, a lot I of people have been asking up. about these hats the past few weeks in the Instagram comments, YouTube comments, uh, 47 brand hats. They're going to be available oh, Thursday. Oh, come, uh, buy them in the Barstool Sports Store. They're awesome. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, what do you got, legit, Ari? Legit, legit. Just uh, Yo, I just got two like, packs. That's, that's why those 47 dude, brands are coming dude. to my house. I'm like, who's sending all these hats? Um, oh, thanks, yeah. yeah. My 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 future ex wife just came in hot with a couple of boxes. Oh, for crying yeah. out loud! What a way to end. Oh, the I, it is what it is, buddy. We're all fucking, <laughs> we're all adults here. I mean, oh, look at there that. it is. Right. The one G's there's, rocking. Here's one of them. There it's it is. Check right there. And uh, let's see here. We got the other one here. I look like a brand nerd with the glasses. And actually, the Baltimore Orioles hat I had on biz that was an old forty seven hat as well. And this one, this is like just, watching Mincy that time. He opened that box at the at the basketball game. No, I never saw that video. I thought I right, open the box and it was going to be a bill of what he owes his future ex-wife. Yeah, right, or, 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 or a big, huge dildo. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, guys. Time to wrap it. All right. Um, see you guys. Great chat with you guys. See you next week.